The outer gate of the port of Punas is rather crude. Neat rows of doorways have been carved into the outer wall, allowing multiple carriages to be inspected as they enter the city. The soldiers in charge of the inspections are not wearing armor. They are all dressed in matching deep blue uniforms with double-breasted buttons, wearing bicorn hats on their heads, and white tight-fitting trousers on their lower bodies, tucked into shiny black military boots. Zack noticed that some of the soldiers were holding a strange and familiar weapon. It was long and had a shiny bayonet at the front, somewhat similar to the gun he had previously invented. Senior, these people are. The garrison. Officially under the jurisdiction of the government of Puna's port, but actually completely controlled by the church. The pink insect quietly poked half of its head out of the pocket to observe, looking somewhat strange. But I have never seen this weapon before. Could it be a new weapon developed by the church in the past year or two? Zack seemed to understand where this gun came from. The pink insect did not notice Zack's expression, since it can appear in the hands of the elite garrison guarding Puna's port, it is definitely not an ordinary weapon. Young man, it's better to be careful. The more illogical the weapon, the more cautious we should be. Zack nodded silently. He could hear the people around him also quite curious, discussing the guns in the hands of the garrison. However, when they reached the city gate, everyone tacitly fell silent. When it was Zack's turn for the carriage, the soldiers on both sides raised their bayonets, crossing them in front of the carriage. Respected elven traveler, please have you and your companions, as well as your luggage, undergo inspection. The leading officer politely saluted Zack, we apologize for the inconvenience, but this is the regulation of Puna's port. Zack nodded calmly, please go ahead. Several soldiers carefully boarded the carriage, carefully inspecting the goods and piles of coins with a stick-like object, and then voluntarily reset it after moving and searching. Zack guessed that the stick should be a magically powered detector. These soldiers did not find anything unusual. The officer also used a stick to inspect Zack and read his bodies. When the stick reached Zack's chest pocket, it suddenly emitted a faint glow. The officer saluted again, clapping his legs together, he said firmly, please show the item in your pocket. Zack casually raised his eyebrows and took it out. It was a rough-looking pebble. The officer squinted, this is. Skywatch Stone, Zack said lightly, haven't you heard of it? The officer said somewhat puzzled, I'm sorry, please allow me to verify for a moment. He hurried up a staircase on one side, and soon came back down quickly. The officer's breathing did not even show the slightest disorder. I'm very sorry to have kept you waiting. It is indeed a magical item that complies with the regulations. He then asked Zack and Rita about their identities and the purpose of entering the city, and upon learning that they were merchants and that Zack intended to take the entrance exam for the Noble Magic Academy this year, he saluted again and let them pass. It's really scary, Rita whispered to Zack, looking a little frightened, but luckily we came prepared. She then realized that there were many people on the street and quickly covered her mouth. Zack slowly drove the carriage, listening attentively to the discussion of the officer and soldiers more than a hundred meters behind him. That elf should be an important figure in some elven settlement. I've been guarding here for so many years, and it's the first time I've seen something of that level. But if the identity is noble, why disguise as a merchant, bring only one maid, and choose to enter the city through the commoner's passage? There may be some difficult to speak of secrets? I guess there are enemies that cannot be dealt with openly for the time being, so they are acting low-key. He said he wanted to go to the Noble Magic Academy, isn't it to become stronger as soon as possible? Your analysis is indeed very reasonable. Zack withdrew his perception and smiled at Rita, it's okay, no need to worry. Just when he entered the city, he also keenly noticed that there was a concealed line of sight above the stairs, peering through the wall at him. The officer had just run up to verify the safety of the Skywatch Stone with the owner of the line of sight. It's obviously a silver level adventurer or a higher race, Zack thought. Now, the line of sight has shifted to the next carriage. The pink insect said lightly in his mind, young man, I emphasize again, be careful when you enter the city. There are many strong people in the port of Punas, and there are several gold level adventurers. Of course, even they cannot see through your illusion technique, as long as you don't act ostentatiously and attract unnecessary attention. Zack asked with interest, I remember the senior said that there seemed to be no monsters at the demigod level in the port of Punas? Actually, there is one, the pink insect hesitated for a moment and said, the old lord of the port of Punas, according to my evaluation, has the strength of a platinum level adventurer, but he is not interested in these honors himself. He usually does not operate in the outside world, only appearing to turn the tide when the port of Punas faces a major threat. And now, the port of Punas has been stable for nearly a hundred years. The vast majority of citizens have never seen him, and many people don't even know that there is a demigod-level strongman in the port of Punas. That's why I helped you settle in the port of Punas before. 
Zack kept this important information in mind and turned to Rita, saying, The entrance exam for the academy will be held in early autumn. There are still two months left. Let's go buy a house of our own, mom? Rita smiled lightly and nodded solemnly, yes. This is their common wish. After careful selection and considering the advice of the pink insect and Rita's preferences, Zack finally bought a small villa with a garden in the transitional district. In one corner of the garden, several clusters of light blue forget-me-nots were in full bloom. The pink insect chattered on, young man, although your savings are enough to buy a house in the more aristocratic district closer to the academy, settling there would involve playing the social game among the nobles, which could easily lead to problems. And after you enroll, you can only bring one marked slave, not your mother. It's really a difficult choice. Zack said lightly, even if the residence is as close to the academy as possible, I can't take care of my mother in the heavily guarded academy. Senior, can you find a way for her to enroll with me? The pink insect shook its head with a difficult expression, that's even more impractical. You may be able to make a way through tens of thousands of candidates, but does your mother have that ability? Zack, don't worry too much about me. Just as the two were pondering, Rita, who had been listening attentively, suddenly spoke. She looked at Zack and said firmly, I know it has always been you protecting me. But this time, please believe that your mother will handle this issue well. I will ensure my own safety. The pink insect was both angry and amused. Don't show off at this time, you really can't handle the danger. I can open a shop. Both Zack and the pink insect were stunned. There should be shops in the academy, right? I also have some experience in business, I can go. The pink insect impatiently flicked its tail, there are indeed shops in the noble academy, but they are all related to magic learning, and the shop assistants and owners all have connections. How could you possibly apply without anything? Rita looked somewhat dejected, while Zack became interested, isn't there a snack shop in the academy? The pink insect glanced at him, no, but I don't think it's necessary, after all, the noble magic academy has quite a few restaurants, and even has high-end member-only restaurants for nobles. There's no need to set up a snack shop. That's indeed feasible, Zack said decisively. The pink insect pouted, young man, isn't your mind always very clever? Why are you starting to act foolishly? If students need something, they can always ask their families to send it over at any time. It's not necessary at all. Zack interrupted her, senior, it's not your fault. This is a business model you haven't seen before, so it's normal not to believe in it. This came from Zack's experience in college in his previous life. Even though the university was completely open to the outside world, the cafeteria was delicious, and everything needed could be conveniently purchased online, the small shop downstairs in the dormitory building would still be crowded during peak hours. After explaining in detail from the perspectives of psychology, supply and demand, and other angles, Pinkbug still held a skeptical attitude, you don't think it's easy to open a shop at this level of college, do you? Zack said without changing his expression, I will persuade and convince the college management. This was really his strong point. Even if you can persuade the college, your mother doesn't have a strong background or connections like other store employees. If she achieves results, she might be pushed out by others. Zack stared coldly at Pinkbug. I am her background. As long as I am in college, I can protect Rita and ensure her smooth operation. During the holidays, I will also go home with her for vacation. This is the best solution. Pinkbug was momentarily overwhelmed by his presence. After a while, she lowered her head, let's go with the younger generation's plan. I really didn't find any obvious loopholes. Your new idea might really work. You always bring me unexpected things. But for now, the task is to first tidy up the house, then buy slaves, train them well, and finally deal with the matter of opening a shop at the college. Zack and Rita agreed with her arrangement. Rita looked at the spacious room with nothing in it and nodded in satisfaction. Well, let's start decorating our home then. After being carefully selected by Pinkbug's experienced eyes, Zack and Rita did not act foolishly and spend money in unworthy places, but followed the best value for money to purchase furniture and daily necessities. They also did not hire decorators. Drawing from his experience of decorating his own nest in his previous life, Zack did it himself, with some reference to the advice of his seniors, and decorated the villa very delicately and uniquely. Rita liked greenery and animals, so Zack decorated her bedroom in a natural style, adorned with potted vines. In addition to the necessary soft bed, he also designed a hanging vine hammock for her to lazily sway in. Zack's own bedroom followed a minimalist style. He had wanted to buy a newly born kitten, but considering that he was about to start school, he gave up on the idea. He also thoughtfully placed a small red-roofed European-style house for Pinkbug to sleep in on her desk in her room. Great! Pinkbug was very satisfied, younger generation, you have a talent for design. Where did you get the inspiration from? 
Zack had a mysterious expression, I thought of it myself. Of course, he wouldn't say that he had replicated the doghouse from the cartoon he had seen in his previous life. In the living room, Rita insisted on displaying the pair of same fate rings in a glass cabinet. This saved Zack's life and is my precious treasure, she said confidently, it's worth passing down for a lifetime. Rita had made the biggest compromise. Under Zack's firm attitude, she didn't place the same fate rings as the first offering in the living room. After everything was done, the exhausted couple and bug sank into the sofa, gazing at the distant towering buildings, watching the sunset gradually descend, casting a yellowish glow on the facades of all the buildings. Zack seemed to be immersed in this scenery, and only slowly spoke after the sun had completely set behind the tall buildings, after dinner, let's go buy slaves. Okay, Rita nodded gently. After dinner, the two set off for the inner city of Puni's port, located on the sea level suspended street. They boarded a steam and magic powered train, passed over a viaduct, and gradually entered the forest of steel and gears from the transitional district dominated by villas. There are people around them talking about, I heard that the railway will soon reach the capital. Once the railway is connected between the capital and the port of Punas, I can't imagine how the kingdom will change. Another person nodded, feeling deeply, yes, the times are changing faster and faster. The soldiers are all equipped with rifles, and many things are changing. I feel like we are witnessing the arrival of a new era. According to the kingdom's plan, will the railway eventually cover the entire country? I really can't imagine it by then. The first person's voice suddenly became mysterious, do you know about armored trains? What's that? Armored trains, trains equipped with cannons, armed to the teeth. It's hard to imagine, right? I can't imagine it either, but the internal information has never been wrong. Zack became alert, perking up his ears to listen carefully. Do they really have such things? This. The second person fell into contemplation. Obviously, he couldn't imagine what a train equipped with cannons would be like. Compared to these two, the pink insect's expression was even more shocked. How come there are so many new things in the port of Punas? Forget about the train, how can there be armored trains? It was also her first time seeing and boarding a train. Zack calmly said, Elder, when we bought the tickets and boarded the train, there were already notices. Currently, the train is only running trials within the city area of Punas. I know, but. She first looked worried, then said somewhat happily, perhaps, this stagnant world is finally going to change completely and enter a new era, right? My knowledge is finally going to be useless. Industry is the backbone of the port of Punas, and slavery is the blood of the port of Punas. Praise the gods, let the citizens of the port of Punas be spared from the torment of the dark days. Those without faith should burn in hell forever, until the last drop of impure blood is drained. Zack leaned back on the new wooden chair, silently reading the various slogans painted on the walls of the carriage. I thought that entering the industrial age would be accompanied by the liberation of thought, but I didn't expect the citizens of the port of Punas to become even more ignorant. The pink insect had been fascinatedly examining the various details inside the carriage, and when she heard this, she said nonchalantly, wrong. Young man, the progress of technology always accompanies the further strengthening of the authority and faith of the church. This is the inevitable result of the church firmly grasping all the latest things. Zack's eyes became even more chilling. The gods of this world are very clever. They do not view technology as the cornerstone of shaking the rule of the gods, but instead use it as a tool, controlled in the hands of the church. While technology advances, it can continue to strengthen the authority of the gods. Even if the absolute gap in power is excluded, they are still a group of formidable enemies. He casually glanced at Rita beside him. She had been trying to suppress her discomfort, her face barely maintaining calm, and her hand holding Zack's was trembling slightly. She didn't like being in the belly of this massive mechanical creation, didn't like the sharp and piercing whistle of the train, and didn't like the gray forest outside the window without a hint of greenery. Mom, we're almost there, Zack comforted in a low voice. Zack, can I lean on you for a bit? I feel a bit dizzy. Hmm. Rita leaned over completely, burying her head in Zack's arms. Only when he hugged her did her condition gradually stabilize. The pink insect was forced to crawl from the pocket of her clothes to Zack's neck and snorted, who exactly is the elder here? After getting off the train, Zack realized that he had underestimated the level of industrialization in the port of Punas. The tall buildings made of steel and gears were uneven, but there were no well-connected streets. Instead of streets, there were huge steel pipelines, twisted into a tangle, chaotic and disorderly. On top of them, a layer of iron plates was laid, with added guardrails, serving as the pathways for the citizens and carriages to walk on. If one wanted to move from one pipe to another parallel pipe, they could only walk on the iron bridges between the two pipes. Zack walked to the railing of the bridge and looked down. He saw countless bridges, pipes, and platforms below, all the way to the abyss. 
I remember this part of Pune's port was built on the sea, but now I can only see darkness. Elder, how high are we from the sea level? The pink insect stood upright, sensing the information in the breeze. Just over half a kilometer. So it seems there's no sunlight because of that. Zack tilted his head back and could barely see the top of the city forest, they were now at half the altitude. Accustomed to the vast sky, the oppressive feeling of being in this dark metal cage was uncomfortable. A thousand meters high skyscrapers. Zack squinted, feeling even smaller than he did in the tallest building he knew from his previous life. Is this also done with magic? To be precise, it may not be achievable with just magic. This is called a miracle. The work of those existences? Yes, the church prayed for the power of those existences to build it. The inner city area was originally composed of numerous giant factories without obvious boundaries, and gradually turned into a city of over a million residents while maintaining the functions of the factories. Zack frowned slightly, the industrial area and residential area completely overlap. Only in a world of magic would they dare to do this. He had noticed that in such a closed environment, the air miraculously remained fresh. This was probably due to the operation of a vast system of wind magic. The two, along with the insect, mingled with pedestrians as they walked on the suspended iron bridge. After nightfall, the white magic stone lamps on the railing illuminated their path. They boarded a suspended cable car, creaking and swaying slightly, heading towards the slave trading market. Looking through the floor-to-ceiling windows, the world was a colorful rainbow. The colorful magic stone lamps, large and small, filled the entire city, yet did not reach the level of light pollution. It was like lighting countless stars in a dark forest. The cable car's destination was one of the floors of the metal skyscraper. Before Zack and Rita could get off, they heard the noisy calls of slave traders. Freshly released batch of orcs. Male orcs with extremely high muscle density, top-notch in both work and other aspects. No need to worry about not being satisfied, just worry if you can endure it. Slave owner bankrupt, tearfully selling. Female slaves at half price. Male slaves at 20% off. Buy one, get one free, buy a daughter and get a mother. It's hard to come by this opportunity next time. Not only did Rita feel uncomfortable, but Zack, who was essentially a goblin, also frowned at the calls. The slave market was crowded. The slaves all wore collars, with chains held by the merchants, their skin oiled, enticing the desires of the citizens under the light of the pale yellow magic stone lamps. Most of the slaves were scantily clad, the men displaying muscles and grandeur, the women showing off their figures and curves. Some slaves were obviously more advanced, wearing carefully designed and customized clothes from slave merchants, barely covering themselves, often attracting a circle of onlookers. Hearing the vulgar laughter from customers and merchants, Rita, with an embarrassed expression, tightly held Zack's hand. Oh, rare to see, even elves come to the slave market? A female slave merchant, wearing only a vest on her upper body, tried to strike up a conversation with Zack. Handsome elf, do you want to buy from me? I'll give you a discount, and after the deal, I can provide you with free extra services. A bearded slave merchant beside her laughed, Molly, I think you just want to take advantage of the elf, don't you? Ha ha ha. Zack politely waved his hand, thank you, I'll take a look around first. When he led Rita away, he activated his perception and heard the whispers of the bearded man to Morley, stupid, don't provoke the Longear clan. They usually don't come to the slave market, and if they do, it's not for a good reason. Morley replied nonchalantly, I'm not stopping him from doing business, just trying my luck. Maybe I'll lure him into bed. You're foolish. The elves have been claiming that a princess was abducted, and they've been causing trouble in slave markets around the world. Even if you're promiscuous, you can't afford to lose your head. Morley sarcastically remarked, I don't think you understand. If it were a princess of that caliber who was lost, the elves wouldn't react this way. It's obviously just an excuse. They suddenly stopped their conversation with a knowing look and continued to focus on selling to the next customer. The elves lost a princess? Zack whispered, Mom, is this related to you? Rita's eyes filled with confusion. She seemed to struggle to remember, then reluctantly shook her head, No. Your grandparents were expelled from the elves, non-magical elves, they've already. She didn't say anything more, biting her lip. Rita's reaction was not quite normal. After leaving the cave, it seemed like the first time she had thought about having had a family. Zack looked around and realized this wasn't the place for heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Since we're here, let's buy a slave first. Zack led Rita, disappearing into the depths of the market. Morley and the bearded man's attempt to sell to the next customer also failed. They looked at each other helplessly, then glanced at Zack's blurry figure. The warm smiles they had for customers disappeared without a trace. He's out of range of his hearing perception. Good. The task assigned by Yar has been completed. Return immediately. Their eyes momentarily became confused, then returned to normal. 
They seemed to have noticed nothing and continued to sell slaves. At the same time, a small creature emerged from the shadow beneath Zack's feet, formed from a viscous black liquid, and slithered into his pants. Zack's eyes flickered for a moment, then he continued forward expressionless. He had left a small clone inside himself to eavesdrop on their conversation, but unfortunately, apart from knowing it was Yar's arrangement, he didn't gain any useful information. Zack wasn't surprised by this result. Yar knew the abilities of the goblin shadow assassin, so she must have taken precautions. She even deliberately left her name, making him pay more attention to their conversation. It seems this is indeed related to my mother. Zack muttered to himself, why didn't she tell me important information about the elves earlier? Why wait until now? The key point is probably after the successful use of the illusion technique, I gained the appearance of an elf. Although the predecessors never told Yar about the illusion technique and the end of the journey, she should have found out through other means. So why indirectly hint at me about the issue of the elves? Rita's condition is naturally not right. Come to think of it, I'm not right either. After leaving the cave, I never thought to ask her about her background. Zack became increasingly puzzled. If it weren't for Yar's intervention, he might never have realized Rita's problem. After leaving the cave, they both subconsciously assumed that they were each other's only family, never considering that Rita might also have family. This is very abnormal. According to common sense, it's impossible to forget such a big thing. Could it be a hidden authority? Zack shivered. Everything became even more mysterious. He looked down, and the pink creature lying in his pocket had been silent since just now. She probably had a lot on her mind too. As they approached the end of the market, Zack, lost in thought, glanced at the slave cages on the shelves and suddenly froze. His eyes caught a line of inconspicuous small words carved on the shelf, for sale, half-elf. Interested parties can first follow the gap between the shelves. Half-elf? Selling this kind of creature? Isn't this an extremely evil deity? Zack clicked his tongue. He remembered the elusive, goblin king-praised, exquisite half-elf princess who never appeared. Oh well, let's go take a look. Sold. The slave trader said somewhat hesitantly, just earlier tonight, I hadn't had a chance to remove the words. I'll go wipe them off later. Zack stared expressionlessly at the slave trader in front of him. She was petite, with a messy head of blonde hair, and some freckles remaining on her face, a somewhat nervous flat lowly. She was a dwarf. Miss, you don't want me to report the sale of a half-elf, do you? Um, reporting me won't do any good, I'm just a slave, selling on behalf of my master's master's master, and the payment has just been transferred. The lowly blinked her eyes, looking slightly innocent. Ha, huh? are you playing a game here? Do you know what the buyers look like? The lowly trader shook her head, I don't know. I close my eyes and the half-elf disappears, and a sealed magical item appears on the table as payment, then I close my eyes again, and the magical item is gone too. Zack was amused. Are you sure you've successfully sold it? I'm sure. Otherwise, I wouldn't be alive now. The lowly trader said confidently. But if you report it, I'll still have a hard time. She suddenly leaned in. So, do you want to come see another good deal? I'll sell it to you cheaper, okay? Is it also a half-elf? No. Then I'm not buying. Zack took Rita's arm, who was still in a daze, and walked away. Oh, this handsome elf. Please don't report me. I'm willing to do anything. The lowly trader said coquettishly, you know, I'm not wearing anything inside. She suddenly realized that Rita was much prettier than her, and the other party might not fall for her charm, so she quickly changed her tune, you should take a look at the goods before making a decision. The goods in the slave market can't compare. Zack stopped, turned around with a mocking expression. All right, let me take a look first. Zack followed the lowly trader through twists and turns into an extremely secluded room, and sat on a tattered sofa waiting. Sorry to keep you waiting, sir. She threw a flirtatious glance at Zack, then called out, Fuhrer, here. The hidden door beside the sofa opened, and the sound of chains clinking came from inside. A girl wearing ankle shackles slowly walked out. She was wearing a pure white long dress, barefoot, stepping on the fiery red carpet, her blood-like colored silky long hair tied into a high ponytail behind her head, gently swaying with her movements. Her skin was very fair, like a real doll. How about it, are you stunned? The lowly trader saw Zack's gaze focused on the girl's face, and said somewhat smugly. So beautiful. Rita, beside her, was captivated by the girl's beauty, and couldn't help but murmur. The lowly trader slyly said, how about it, truly a top quality item, right? Zack did not respond, focusing on the red-haired girl with closed eyes. Her eyelashes trembled slightly, her straight nose, crimson lips, and her face seemed to be finely carved by a divine being, almost perfect in proportion, making it difficult for him to find any flaws. Coupled with her slender figure and pale skin, the red-haired girl seemed not like a creature of the mortal world, but had a feeling of an angel descending to earth. 
Fuhrer, open your eyes. The lowly merchant looked at the reactions of the two and immediately gained confidence, saying with assurance. As the red-haired girl gradually opened her eyes, Zack's breath seemed to stop for a moment. He now truly understood the idiom adding the finishing touch. If the girl before had only a touch of angelic beauty, now her entire body, from the inside out, was completely fused with the soul of an angel, emitting a hint of sacred aura that made one feel it sacrilegious to even think of touching her. The girl's pupils were a sky like deep blue. Her expression was calm, and she gazed at Zack's face with a hint of curiosity, seemingly unaware of her own intoxicating charm. Zack averted his gaze and said calmly, Is her name Floor? Ah, that's just a name I came up with for convenience. You should know, slaves are not entitled to real names. The lowly merchant explained, Before this, she only had a number. Number 86. When filling out the slave trade contract later, we will use the number 86. Zack said lightly, It seems you are confident in this deal. I can't see through your thoughts, but your companion's infatuation is quite obvious. The lowly merchant raised an eyebrow. Rita suddenly woke up, quickly closing her legs and sitting up straight, feeling a bit embarrassed as she lowered her head. During this time, the red-haired girl's gaze never left Zack's face. The lowly merchant cleared her throat, realizing she had been somewhat impolite, and appropriately turned her head slightly. Floor has never been deflowered, she has learned everything a slave should, and I personally trained her in that area. I guarantee she can make you feel ecstatic, at least for the next few decades you won't think of any other woman. The lowly merchant held up five fingers, so, you understand, right? This is already a loss for me. Zack pointed out calmly, even if she's not a half-elf, Floor shouldn't be the kind of merchandise that appears in a slave market. He knew very well that this level of slave should appear in special trading channels of the upper society, not left to chance in a slave market. This is not something that commoners can afford. The lowly merchant smiled wryly, I didn't expect there to be a veteran in the high and mighty elf tribe. To be honest, because the smuggling of half-elves was noticed by the higher-ups, all the channels controlled by the master's master's master have been compromised. We had no choice but to come up with this temporary and impractical solution. She explained, now we have a big problem with cash flow. If Floor didn't have a liking for you, I wouldn't want to part with her. Rest assured, if you really want to, I allow you to thoroughly examine Floor in your own way. Of course, if you don't find any issues, you must buy her. The lowly merchant threw a flirtatious look, after all, I don't know what kind of examination you will conduct, if it's irreversible, and I don't buy her, I'll be at a loss. Zack pondered slightly. All right, give me and Floor a private room. Floor obeyed Zack's command and turned to stand obediently. She even took the initiative to undo the straps of her dress, letting it naturally slip off. As it passed her chest, the white dress paused for a moment, then smoothly flowed to the ground, revealing a perfect and alluring body. Apart from her pure white complexion, there was nothing unusual. Zack turned away and silently cast several shielding and soundproofing spells, shielding Floor from the outside world, and said calmly, Senior, it's up to you now. It's best not to let her notice. Hmm. The pink little bug turned into a cloud of pink mist, first floating around behind her, checking for any issues on the surface, then silently merging into her skin. After about a quarter of an hour, the pink mist drifted out again and returned to Zack's body. Apart from the bloodline mark of a slave, there are no problems, including any hidden curse marks, her voice appeared in Zack's mind. By the way, are you planning to solve the goblin tribe's problem by having children with her? Senior, mind your image, Zack reminded. I didn't buy a regular slave, but chose this one, hee <laughs> hee. The pink insect had an I know attitude. Is this the lifelong partner you want to choose? Zack did not answer her question. Finished checking. 4. Let's go. After bargaining, Zack used his experience from his past life and almost spent all the money and jewelry he had on him to finally buy 4. The lowly merchant's face was very ugly, her features twisted together as if she had swallowed a whole lemon. This elf looked like a talented and elegant person, but when it came to bargaining, she was like a sly old hand, guiding the conversation and accurately poking at her bottom line without exceeding it. She only realized after coming to her senses that she hadn't made the profit she had expected. This person's inner and outer selves were completely different. I'm really unlucky to meet a customer like you. She said resentfully, Remember, you owe me a favor. How do you want me to repay it? Zack looked interestedly at the lowly merchant with a black line on her face. Maybe there won't be a chance to meet again in the future. The lowly merchant's domineering demeanor suddenly changed, and her face became calm. In an instant, she seemed to have become another person. She stared at Zack's eyes seriously. I know the elves will not break their vows. Yes, Zack nodded. After all, his current nature was a goblin. The lowly merchant sighed almost imperceptibly. I want you to swear to treat Fuhr well in the future, not to abuse her, not to hurt her, 
and to be as good to her as possible. She is really a good child and won't let you down. If you are willing to make her happy, I will be very satisfied. This is the favor you can repay me. Zack was slightly stunned, once again looking at the lowly merchant in front of him. She had completely shed her merchant's demeanor, and her clear eyes were looking at him, waiting for his answer. Fuer turned to the lowly merchant and said, Number one, don't worry about me, I will take care of myself. I know, the lowly merchant wiped her eyes. When it really comes time to say goodbye, I will indeed be a little reluctant. How about it? Elf, is my condition unreasonable? Zack shook his head gently. Not at all. I will swear as you wish. When the contract was signed and Fuer's unknown mark was completely transferred to Zack through the ceremony, the transaction ended. The usually active lowly merchant remained silent throughout, only guiding the necessary procedures. Fuer rubbed her eyes and asked softly, Number one, can you tell me your name? The lowly merchant, with some freckles on her face, smiled. You should have understood long ago, slaves don't have names. She stepped forward and lightly embraced Fuer, then cleanly separated. Goodbye. I wish you happiness. This was the final farewell. When Zack and Rita led Fuer away, the lowly merchant approached Zack and pulled him aside. As a parting gift, I'll give you one last piece of advice, she said softly. It's best to leave Pernisport within two years, and don't ask me why. And be careful of the cultists. Noticing Zack's gaze, she threw him a flirtatious look. Don't worry, you will see me in the future. No contact information? No need. Zack nodded. Okay, thank you for your advice. I won't mistreat Fuer. After they left, the lowly merchant collapsed to the ground and gathered her messy blonde hair. I've done my best, she muttered to herself, I hope Floor will have the best outcome. As Zack, Rita, and Floor left the slave market, the bustling market had become deserted, with only a few people lingering unwillingly. The night had grown late. Many merchants had already left with their goods. As Zack looked down from the cable car, he saw several pipelines lighting up. The slaves formed orderly lines, dragging their weary bodies, barely clothed, and holding oil lamps as they walked at a steady pace. Thick iron chains bound their ankles and necks. If anyone slowed down, a whip would lash out at them. They're off from the factories, the voice of the pink insect echoed in Zack's mind again, tomorrow before dawn, they'll have to return to the factories again. All the factories in the port of Puna's employed slaves. After all, slaves had no rights, and even if they were worked to death, the slave owners only had to pay compensation, which was much more cost-effective than hiring regular workers. Once the slaves enter the factory, half of them basically won't survive five years. Zack didn't respond, continuing to watch the emaciated slaves struggling on the pipelines. He remembered the slogan he had seen on the train before, industry is the backbone of the port of Punas, and slaves are the lifeblood of the port of Punas. When the three of them silently boarded the train again and returned to their home in the transition district, it was already late at night. After a long journey, no one had the energy to say anything extra. Rita just roughly took a bath and then went to bed. She was very tired today, and it was not the right time to ask her about her background. Zack took off his clothes, stretched out his body, and almost completely sank into the water. Bubbles escaped from his mouth underwater. When Floor had previously asked him what he should do, Zack couldn't be bothered to think too much and casually said, just do what you should do. Okay, Floor picked up the dirty clothes that Rita and Zack had changed out of and went to the bathroom to wash them. Later, she would also have to discuss with Rita how to divide the household chores among the three of them. Although they were slaves, they couldn't just dump all the work on her, or she would be exhausted. While Zack was comfortably soaking in the water, a gentle voice floated out from behind the bathroom door, Master, the clothes have been hung up, do you need me to help you wash your body? Zack instinctively replied, okay. Ha! Huh? The doorknob turned, and the voice sounded a bit embarrassed, um, the door is locked. Please wait a moment, I'll go find the key. I'm almost done washing. It's okay, Zack stood up and wrapped himself in a towel. I'm very sorry, I took a bit long to find a place to hang the clothes. Please forgive me, master. I'll pay more attention to details next time and not keep the master waiting too long. The voice outside apologized earnestly. Zack couldn't help but smile wryly. It's okay, I forgot to tell you where the balcony is. I'll change, and you can come in to wash later. The voice returned to a calm tone, okay. Thank you for your generosity, master. Zack put on his pajamas, maintaining the appearance of a male elf, and lay on the bed, pondering the day's events. There were many noteworthy things that happened when they went to buy slaves today. The two people exchanging information about the elf tribe were indeed arranged by Yar, not by any other organization or individual pretending to be. After all, he had the pink insect as a channel, and he could confirm the news with Yar at any time. Yar deliberately left a signature for the obvious purpose of making him take this matter seriously. 
In the future, if I come into contact with other elf tribes, I'll try to see if there are any new clues. Since Yar had now reminded him of this, it meant that the true purpose of the elf tribe was very important to him. It was very likely related to his own growing strength. After all, Yar's ultimate goal, along with her belief in the divine, is to become a god herself. Naturally, Zack is also very concerned about Rita's background. It seems that both Rita and Zack have been unconsciously manipulated, and even the pink insect that not even the gold level adventurers have noticed has never considered Rita's relatives. This level of information shielding is likely to originate from the secrecy of divine level. From Yar's attitude, there is a certain contradiction between the god who imposes secrecy and the god she believes in. Interesting, Zack murmured. It seems that you have also figured it out, young one, the pink insect said with a worried look, poking its head out of the doghouse. It is probably related to your elf part, the enhancement of the source of light, otherwise Yar would not have mentioned it deliberately. She should already know that I have the source of light and can perform illusion magic, Zack said coldly. Hmm, the pink insect poked its head out. Now that things have come to this, I also understand. The one who supports you in becoming a god is probably always watching you. I'll just say it directly. Yar is the guardian of that existence. As long as that existence knows something, it's as if she knows it too. They do have high hopes for you and hope that you can become a god, but I don't know the specifics. When you truly break through to the superior race and truly qualify to enter the game, Yar will meet with you and tell you more detailed information. By the way, the recent contact has indicated that Yar is no longer in a hurry to let you breed goblins. They must have found another way. Zack frowned, another way? Since there are no hints, it means that as long as you go with the flow, you will encounter. The pink insect suddenly shrank its body and hid in the doghouse. After a while, there was a knock on the door outside, Master, may I come in? What else does Floor want to do? Zack thought for a moment and said, come in. Okay. The door opened gently. Floor stood at the door with a blush on her face. She was only wearing a thin short skirt, and her lower body was wearing almost transparent white stockings. Her red hair was completely loose, flowing softly behind her. Floor said softly, please let me sleep with you. Is this also a slave's duty? Zack was not surprised by this. Yes, Floor lowered her head, seeming a little shy to meet his gaze directly, if the master is willing. Is this what number one taught you? Floor was stunned. She looked at Zack, who had a calm expression. Yes. Yes. She said that as long as I take the initiative, I can leave a good first impression on the master. Zack sighed softly as he lay on the bed. Come and sit on the edge of the bed. Let's chat before we sleep. I want to know more about you. Floor hesitated for a moment and sat cautiously next to Zack. She was so close that Zack could reach out and hold her in his arms. Zack rested his head on his arms, can you tell me a story? Your own story, or number one story? I'm sorry, master, I'm not very good at telling stories. Please forgive me if it doesn't suit your taste. She looked a little flustered. It's okay. I don't have any other hobbies. I just like to listen to stories. Floor lowered her eyelids, as if considering her words. She cleared her throat and began to narrate her own experiences. She did not know who her parents were. From the time Floor could remember, she had been sold multiple times, from the capital to the port of Punas. Absolutely a beauty. This is a genuine top quality product. The slave owners were delighted with her potential and sold her at higher prices. Young Floor became a popular slave, with her price being hyped up, and she traveled to various well-known slave markets and banquets, where countless nobles and dignitaries commented on her. Sitting on a high value, she had already escaped the identity of a slave and became a collectible similar to an antique. Even among the slave owners of all generations, even those who truly coveted her body, did not dare to act rashly towards her. Once they did, she would no longer possess the so-called nature of a collectible. Like a broken antique, she would be worthless. Therefore, for most of her childhood, Ziofewer spent her time being chained and taken by various slave owners to various private or formal occasions to show off an exhibit. She was taught many skills by the slave owners. Dance, modeling, performance, acrobatics. What's even more amazing is that Ziofewer indeed had the corresponding talent and never disappointed her owners. She became famous for it. Ziofewer once thought that this was her life, spending most of her life on different stages, performing for seemingly different but essentially no different nobles and dignitaries. But the bubble was eventually burst. Her price was too high, far exceeding her true value. When the church, in accordance with the will of the gods, ordered a comprehensive ban on the speculation of slaves, rectified the chaos, and set a unified price for the slaves, Ziofewer's second to last owner went crazy. You wretched whore's bastard, because of you, I've lost all my possessions. It's all because of you, you greedy beast. Spit out the money you owe me. 
He showed a fierce expression as he approached the bewildered Ziofuer. Yes, I'm sorry, master, it's all my fault. She didn't know what mistake she had made and quickly and obediently apologized, begging the slave owner to calm down. But what she got in response was a resounding slap. Ziofuer flew backwards, almost deafened by the blow. Her head was buzzing, and blood was flowing from her nose, staining her clothes red. Ziofuer quickly got up, trembling all over, and crawled on the ground, I'm sorry, please calm down, I won't make the same mistake again, I'm sorry. She had encountered slave owners with a violent temper who liked to beat her. As long as she sincerely apologized, the owner would gradually calm down. The owner kicked her in the chest. Ziofuer, like a puppet with cut strings, flew into the air, and because of the chain around her neck, her body suddenly stopped, and she crashed to the ground. Ah! She cried out in pain, her chest almost falling apart, feeling a tearing pain. Several of her ribs were broken. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. She was bleeding from her nose, and she knelt on the ground again, begging for mercy from the mad owner. Forgive? The owner repeated the word, with a warm smile on his face. Of course, I can forgive. Money, I want money. If you return my losses, return my money, I will spare you. Ziofuer cowed out, I will find a way as soon as possible, I will help you make money, I will definitely satisfy you. You worthless piece of trash, what the hell can you earn? A hysterical roar echoed through the room, frightening Ziofuer into a ball. You're just a dog that knows how to please the master, and other than that, you're worthless. The owner panted, his forehead veins bulging, his eyes already red. Isn't your highest price almost close to the weight of your body in gold? Everyone says so, the blood flowing in your veins isn't blood, it's gold. I ask you, where's the gold? The owner panted heavily, his mouth wide open, drooling. He barely maintained a smile, his facial muscles trembling uncontrollably. He nervously looked around and grabbed the dagger on the table. Why didn't I think of that? Since there's gold flowing in your veins, all I have to do is let it out, hee <laughs> hee. The owner smiled, slowly raising the dagger, advancing towards Ziofuer step by step. Watching this scene, Ziofuer's pupils suddenly dilated. She had seen a sadistic slave owner, smiling to herself and saying, this is what happens when you don't obey, as she used a small knife to slowly kill a poor slave. She had no idea what she had done wrong, but she knew she would definitely be killed by the master. She thought of escaping, but the chain around her neck held her back. The master had wrapped the chain around her left hand several times and yanked it violently. Ah! Little Fleur cried out in pain. She was roughly pulled over and fell at the master's feet. You want to run? Hearing the master's seemingly calm tone, she quickly raised her head and said in a rapid voice, I'm sorry, master, please forgive me. The dagger plunged straight into her shoulder. Ah, ah, ah. Little Fleur let out a loud scream, tears blurring her vision. She curled up in pain on the ground. As the dagger was pulled out, bright red blood gushed out, splattering on the master's pants. You want to escape? The master asked nonchalantly, then stabbed her palm to the carpet with another blow. Ah, I'm sorry. Sob. Little Fleur convulsed, her brain completely occupied by the pain, unable to think, only repeating, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Where's the gold? Why is it still the lowly blood of a slave? Where's my gold? The master shook his head from side to side, his red eyes moving to the violently struggling lower half of Little Fleur. Oh, right, I haven't enjoyed it yet. I've been treating you like a priceless treasure for so long, what a fool I am. Isn't a slave's duty to satisfy the master's desires? He placed the knife on the table, then tremblingly undid his belt and began to take off his pants. With so much blood, if I don't hurry. Little Fleur lay on the ground, continuously screaming. The only thing she could perceive was that she was rapidly losing her life. Tisk, so noisy. The master picked up the knife from the table again, pressed down on Little Fleur's head, opened her mouth, and stabbed the dagger straight in, piercing her tongue, chin, and throat. The intense pain that exceeded her pain threshold flooded Little Fleur's brain. She passed out directly. Seems like I went too far. It doesn't matter, this is mine, I can do whatever I want with it. Anyway, everything of mine is already over. The master nonchalantly removed her underwear, spread her legs, and half knelt on the ground. While she's not completely dead yet, quickly. Swish. Suddenly, his eyes widened, and his head fell off, rolling on the ground a few times, staring in horror at his remaining body. Standing behind the still-standing body was a dwarf. It was a blonde lowly wearing a black hood. The lowly held a dagger and kicked the headless body, skillfully inserting a sharp inverted cross into the body's buttocks. Target assassinated, sacrifice completed, she said softly, may the great dark god enjoy this blood sacrifice feast. Ah, uh, she looked somewhat embarrassed as she gazed at the unconscious and dying little Fleur, who had lost too much blood. Such a pitiful child, tortured by the followers of the false god, it's too unfair to die like this. Oh, you're awake. 
Little Fleur opened her eyes drowsily and saw a stranger's face with a few freckles. She had a messy head of blonde hair. Little Fleur struggled to speak, but felt a sharp pain in her throat and tongue. You still can't speak, the divine magic only healed the surface wounds, it hasn't completely healed you, you'll have to lie down for a few more days. The blonde lowly smiled, because it's a false god, his spells have so many limitations. If you believed in the great dark god, you could be quickly healed through a blood sacrifice ritual. Of course, we're not like the authoritarian church of the false god, we won't force you to change your faith. Ah, I've said so much and forgot to introduce myself. You can call me number one. The blonde lowly carefully examined her face, hmm, as for you, you are now number 86. The 86th child. Little Fu Luor silently looked at her and muttered to herself. Number 86 is a bit troublesome. I need to give you a temporary name for convenience. The blonde lowly happened to see a small bottle of flowers on the bedside table and her eyes lit up. Then I'll call you Fu Luor. After resting for a few days, little Fu Luor finally could get out of bed and walk around. After chatting with the blonde lowly, she learned about the lowly's identity. On the surface, the blonde lowly was a slave and also a slave trader. In reality, she believed in the dark god and belonged to a large organization of dark god worshippers. But she never forced little Fu Luor to believe in the dark god. It's good to have no faith, the lowly trader explained. Although everyone in the organization is united and loving, we all know in our hearts that those who believe in the dark god are not good people. My master always emphasizes to me that we serve the great dark god and gain his power in order to eliminate the hypocritical believers of the false gods and restore balance to the world. This is just a grand excuse. We are just using a more violent and extreme way to deal with violence, without considering the harm to civilians. Little Fu Luor blinked her eyes and asked in confusion, Number 1, why do you believe in the dark god? The lowly trader fell into rare silence. She paced back and forth in front of the bed. She finally asked, Fu Luor, do you think slaves are born to be slaves? Little Fu Luor thought for a moment and obediently said, yes. This is just what your previous master taught you, the lowly trader said seriously, you have been brainwashed very seriously. Um, little Fu Luor lowered her head in shame. Forget it, it's not your fault after all, the lowly trader sighed, perhaps, the best ending for you is to go to a master who is willing to treat you well for the rest of your life. Little Fu Luor tentatively asked, number one, what about your ending? Me? The lowly trader was taken aback, then smiled. I am just a slave, unfortunately, I hate this twisted world to the bone. Since I chose this path, chose to believe in the dark god, I naturally know my ending. My ending is complete destruction. Until I become the fuel for the old world, burning in hell. A hint of madness flashed in the lowly trader's eyes. Little Fu Luor lowered her head, trembling, and dared not look at her. The lowly trader sighed, do you know why I saved you? Not because you are beautiful, but because you are my compatriot, tortured by the scum who claim to be just. In our blood, flows the same damn slave mark, being trampled underfoot by false gods and even gods for generations. You and I are not the same kind of people. I will help you find a good master. Little Fu Luor asked softly, I don't want a master, can I stay by your side? The lowly trader looked at her and smiled, so you like me that much. I'm glad, but it's impossible. I'm fine. But if you are not favorable to the master's plan, he will mercilessly kill you, and I won't be able to protect you. Even if we exclude the master factor, you shouldn't stay on the side of the dark god's believers. Sooner or later, you will be involved in the game. Little Fu Luor's expression became confused again, game? The lowly trader smiled and reached out to pat her head. This is not something you should know. If you know too much, you won't be able to escape. But I don't want to leave. I can help you with the housework, I can do many things. Little Fu Luor said in a dilemma. Surprisingly, the lowly trader agreed. Some people volunteer to do housework, which is not impossible. All right, you can stay for now. From then on, Fuor followed the lowly merchant and traveled to various parts of the kingdom. The lowly merchant's master often came to their temporary base, but she had never seen his true appearance. In front of Fuor, his whole body was always shrouded in a layer of black mist, and she could only vaguely see that he was a tall man. Master, this is number 86, the child I rescued from the cultists. Upon meeting, the lowly merchant hugged his waist and said with a pleasing smile. The black mist man stroked her messy hair, hmm, indeed a very cute child. But from the look of it, you probably don't want her to join the organization, right? His voice leaned towards neutrality. She's not suitable. Then it's useless. The black mist man said lightly, find an opportunity to send her away. If she follows you, this kind of weakling will die sooner or later. We live in a world of blood and blades, not flowers and plants. Fuor sat uneasily in the chair, and said with some hesitation but determination, I, I can learn. I have a strong ability to learn. 
Please believe me once, I'm not a dog who only knows how to please the master. The black mist man smiled and said, you misunderstood, I'm not looking down on you, but thinking for your life. All right then. Number one, I will postpone your task. You teach her the necessary combat skills, basic sacrificial magic, and see how she performs after a period of time. Even if she doesn't meet the minimum standards to join the organization, she will be able to protect herself. The lowly merchant's smile remained unchanged, of course. Very well, it's settled. In addition, I came here after a long time to enjoy, you understand what I mean, right? The lowly merchant's eyes suddenly became charming. As you wish, master. Late at night, Thor couldn't sleep. Not because of the opportunity to join the organization, or the excitement of truly becoming a companion to the lowly merchant, but because the fighting noises from the next room were too loud and disturbed her sleep. The master and the lowly merchant were entangled, reluctant to part. Master. Ah, thank you. I like you the most. Number one, you drive me crazy. The master gasped, exchanging passionate words with the lowly merchant, and the intense commotion reached Fu's ears. They seemed to be completely indifferent to Fu hearing them, or perhaps deliberately letting her hear. What's wrong with these two? Fu's face turned crimson, and she couldn't help but cover her face, murmuring softly. Soon she realized that this was just the beginning. Fu, why are you so shy? The lowly merchant, with a dazed look, leaned on the table, with the black mist man behind her. Your previous master should have done this kind of thing to you, right? Four felt helpless, no. And is it too much for you to do this openly in front of me? It's still daytime. Not openly. The black mist man said quite humorously, when I'm in front of you, I will shroud my face in black mist. The lowly merchant giggled, Four, if you're not used to it, how will you serve your future master? I don't want to serve any master. Four suddenly slammed her fist on the table and exclaimed angrily. The two stopped and looked at her with surprise. She quickly realized her outburst, curled up her legs and apologized meekly, I'm sorry. No need to apologize. The black mist man said kindly, I'm glad you have this kind of thinking. When you have this kind of thinking, you have surpassed most of your compatriots. Number 86 is a talent to be molded. What do you think? Number 1. The lowly merchant hesitated for a moment, put on a skirt, and patiently helped the black mist man put on his pants. Master, I still think she's not suitable. She is too weak and she has no corresponding awareness at all. It's just stress caused by psychological trauma. If Froll's previous owner hadn't abused her, she would have continued to indulge. Froll buried her head in her legs. She was unwilling to be evaluated like this, but sadly found herself being accurately described by the Lolita merchant. Aren't you also a slave to your master, number one? Froll almost squeezed out these words from between her teeth. Well, it's not surprising that you think so. The Lolita merchant showed a charming smile, I am a slave but I am also my master's companion. I wholeheartedly identify with my relationship with my master because he is worthy. If you also encounter a master who is truly good to you and shares your thoughts in the future, then you will understand me. Unfortunately, such masters are few and far between. The vast majority of our compatriots live under the endless control and oppression of the false god and his believers. That's why the master approves of your thoughts. The black mist person did not speak, and the blurry face seemed to be constantly assessing Froll's reaction. If I encounter a master who is willing to be truly good to me, can I also find true happiness? Froll was completely lost. She was like walking into a crossroads in life, with no idea which path to take next. Should she desperately join the Lolita Merchants Organization, become a faithful follower of the Dark God, and seek revenge on the tormentors of slaves? Or should she leave the Lolita Merchant, find a master worthy of entrusting herself to, and live a simple and beautiful life? The black mist person seemed to see through her thoughts and said lightly, Number 1, you are right, number 86 is indeed not suitable to join. Froll exclaimed, Why? You are too kind, too normal, and do not possess the qualities that the dark god requires. What qualities are needed? The Lolita merchant answered for the black mist person, Madness, world weariness, cruelty, deceit. The more extreme, the better. Froll, normal and kind people cannot survive in the organization. It's okay, this is a good thing. You don't need to cry. She looked at Froll, who was shedding two clear tears, with some difficulty. Froll wiped her tears and said, I know I am too weak, I know I am useless, but I can learn from you, I can become extreme, I will learn to go mad, and make the organization accept me. Shut up. The Lolita merchant suddenly became angry, pointing at her nose and scolding. What nonsense are you talking about? Like an ignorant little brat, as soon as things are slightly unsatisfactory, you want to turn dark without knowing anything. Do you think this is cool? Do you think we are heroes? Do you think we are a secret organization that bears a bad name on the surface but actually does good deeds? We are a group of devils, a damn mess. 
do you know what we have done? My hands are stained with the blood of the innocent, I have even killed babies in their cradles. More than one. People like me should be burned in hell. She gasped heavily, then gradually calmed down, looking at the black mist person. I'm sorry, I lost control. It's okay. You being able to vent like that also reassures me a lot. The black mist person stared at the dazed troll. You also heard what number one said. We are just demons who fight fire with fire. Give up, before you have not yet set foot on this bloody path. Once you are deeply trapped, you will never be able to leave. They no longer paid attention to Froll. The black mist person picked up the Lolita merchant, walked into the room, and closed the door, continuing the unfinished business from earlier. Froll slumped on the sofa, looking at her fair and slightly trembling hands. I have no choice, I can only find a master. Right, she murmured. In the following years, the Lolita merchant did not carry out the organization's tasks, but continued to buy and sell slaves, and also taught Froll various combat skills. You must learn how to protect yourself. She gazed at Four proficiently using the sacrificial magic, sacrificing a pile of gold coins to create a huge fleshy tentacle, nodded in satisfaction, very good. You have a talent for mastering the dark magic of the dark god. Also, I remind you that you are not a believer, so don't call the dark god directly, use the term dark existence instead. Fuwa raised her head and wiped her sweat, even if I'm not a believer, I can still use sacrificial magic. You don't need to be a believer, as long as you have the corresponding talent and an excellent teacher, the lowly merchant said, crossing her legs. Even the demon king would use holy magic, even the pope would use dark magic. The fleshy tentacle obediently hung in front of Fuwa, making it convenient for her to touch it at any time. You see, it suits your personality. The lowly merchant laughed, so, magic is not good or bad, it depends on how the person using it is. Why don't you give it a hug? Four hesitantly gave the tentacle a hug. The huge tentacle seemed to like it. It gently wrapped around Four's body and helped her scratch an itch. Ha ha. Don't be naughty, ha ha. She laughed and cried, not knowing what to do. This is its way of expressing friendliness to you, the lowly merchant said cunningly. If I use sacrificial magic to summon a tentacle, from my inner darkness, once I relax control, it will overpower me, right? Four was stunned. The tentacle sent her back to her seat. Number one, please don't belittle yourself, the lowly merchant waved her hand. It's not belittling, it's an already proven fact. By the way, about your future master, I can make a suggestion. What suggestion? If possible, it's best to choose an elf. Although there are many hypocrites among the elves, most of them will maintain a surface of elegance, even towards their own slaves. As long as you learn to express your sincerity and love actively, even the most unyielding elf will eventually fall under your charm. Most male creatures won't refuse such a beauty like you. Fuwa pouted, it's hard for me to take this as a compliment, but thank you for your advice. Several years later, Fuwa learned all the combat skills taught by the lowly merchant. At the same time, the dark mist person urged the lowly merchant to prepare to send Fuwa away. According to the will of the dark god, the organization is preparing in the port of Punis. The grand performance is about to begin, he said to the lowly merchant. You can't keep number 86 by your side anymore, is it? A game of the gods? That's right. And we are only responsible for the opening scene. The dark mist person gently stroked her head, the game of the gods, ten deaths without life. The lowly merchant's body trembled. Master, aren't you a superior race? You should be fine. I'm just a stepping stone for the chosen one. The dark mist person said with pleasure, I am just a high-ranking demon who has infiltrated the organization, a traitor who has long betrayed the demon king. Although betraying the demon king is the greatest fun, I have gained enough pleasure from you. Now, I want you, an interesting person, to live on. The lowly merchant hugged the dark mist person tightly. Are we going to be separated? Four was reluctant. Don't worry. Before we part, I will help you find a good master, like a reliable handsome elf, the lowly merchant pondered. Hmm. How to seduce an elf? You don't have to be in such a hurry. No, an ownerless slave is very dangerous. Without our protection, if you are discovered, I don't need to emphasize what will happen to you. The two girls bid farewell in the room, while the dark mist person stood on the balcony, looking at the lights of Puni's port. He silently recited, all destinies, even if they want to escape midway, will eventually return to their trajectory. Floral sat on the edge of the bed, pulling her legs together, and anxiously watched Zack lost in thought. You really trust me, Zack said lightly. Including the message about the dark existence that number one believes in, is that also something number one allowed me to know? Number one told me to tell you everything about my experiences without reservation, Floral said, lowering her head. She said you are trustworthy. Just from this brief encounter, you can determine that I am trustworthy? 
Zack keenly felt the trace of manipulation. It seemed that an invisible hand was weaving his fate, Rita's fate, the fate of the pink insect, and Floral's fate together, moving towards a destined path. He covered his face with one hand and let out a heavy sigh. Master, do you need me to do something? Did I do something wrong? Floral raised her head and gazed at him with her deep blue eyes. No, you did well. I'm just thinking about something. He just felt that even if he killed Floral now, he couldn't change the increasingly entangled thread of fate. The deep suffocating feeling returned. Floral. Yes. I haven't had a chance to prepare your bed. If you don't mind, just lie next to me. Okay. Floral quietly climbed onto the bed, slipped under the covers, and her blood-red, silky long hair lightly brushed against Zack's skin. He smelled the faint, elegant fragrance on her. Floral lay down, anxiously and expectantly waiting for Zack's next command. But Zack asked, Do you know more information about number one? Like what they are planning to do? I'm very sorry, I don't know, she replied. This answer was within his expectations. He remembered number one's final advice. Leave the port of Puna's within two years. It's like they've timed it perfectly. His time at the Puna's Noble Magic Academy for Advanced Studies was exactly two years. Initially, buying a slave was just to deal with the academy's assessment, without carefully considering how to interact with her on a daily basis. Of course, there were also benefits. Floral's etiquette and skills as a maid far exceeded the assessment requirements, saving Zack a lot of teaching trouble. The corner of Zack's eye caught Floral curling up, secretly scrutinizing himself. After talking for so long, you must be tired. Let's call it a night. Yes. Thank you, master, Floral responded softly. The single-person dormitory at the academy only had one bed, so he had to get used to sleeping with her at night. He couldn't bring himself to do something foolish like letting Floral sleep on the bed while he slept on the floor, and he wouldn't mistreat Floral by ordering her to sleep on the floor. After the slave imprinting ceremony, her body already belonged to him completely. He needed to win over her heart completely. Closing his eyes to think, he heard Floral's faint and even breathing, and a plan gradually formed in Zack's mind. The next morning, as soon as Floral opened her eyes, she was surprised to find that Zack had already left. She hurriedly changed into the maid's outfit hanging nearby and rushed into the kitchen, only to find Zack already preparing breakfast. Floral hurriedly saluted, Please forgive me, master, I overslept and couldn't prepare for you. It's okay, you woke up very early. My mother is still sound asleep in bed. Mother? Floral asked hesitantly, I'm sorry, master, where is she sleeping? It's the one you saw last night, the light gray-haired elf who was with me. Floral's brain went into overload. That elf girl wasn't the master's daughter? She was the mother? Zack smiled, so, could you please go and call her? When the three of them finally gathered at the dining table, Floral found it hard to believe that the petite Rita was Zack's mother. Rita enjoyed the process of Zack helping her with her hair, and said to Floor standing aside, Floor, come sit at the table and eat with us. Why are you standing? I'm sorry, madam, slaves cannot eat at the same table as their masters. If you need anything during your meal, I can serve you at any time. Once you're in our home, you are a part of our family, just like me and Zach. There's no distinction between family members. You can pay attention to etiquette details once you're in school. Floor looked at Zach with difficulty, and he just gave her an encouraging smile. So, she sat uneasily at the table and enjoyed this strange breakfast with them. Ordinary days passed by. After spending time with this pair of elf mother and son day and night, Floor felt more and more that they were extraordinary. They didn't leave all the housework to her as a servant, but instead made an agreement to take turns. She seemed not like a slave, nor a maid, but as Rita said, truly became a part of their family. Floor began to live a happy life that she had never dared to imagine before. Sometimes, she would ask Zack with a guilty conscience if she was being disrespectful by being lazy, and he would directly reply, Lazy? You are the most hardworking person in our home always taking the initiative to take on extra housework and relieve the pressure on me and my mother. This home wouldn't be the same without you. On the other hand, Rita always linked arms with her to stroll through the bustling commercial street, sharing food with her and even buying her gifts. Floor, having been to various noble places since she was young, had a broad perspective, and the various trinkets she picked out made Rita unable to put them down. Dear Floor, Zack isn't interested in shopping, and I can't bother him frequently. It's great to have you. This made Floor dizzy, madam, it's my honor to accompany you. Then, she was tightly embraced by Rita, you don't need to be so formal, you're really amazing. After a month, Floor had gradually integrated into the family. After getting used to this kind of life, she was shocked by a new scene. Rita gave her a month's salary. Slaves don't need a salary. Floor lowered her head, not daring to accept the golden coins, I already belong to the master. There's only one situation where I won't pay you a salary. 
Rita smiled at her. Floor nervously raised her head. If you marry Zack, of course, you won't need it, because you can just ask Zack for money directly. Floor instantly buried her face, as red as a ripe apple, in her hands, I'm not qualified to marry the master, he can have me at any time. Phew, that's good. I was worried you wouldn't like Zack. Rita's thought process was still not something ordinary people could understand, and she said with a smile, if Zack can marry a cute and reliable girl like you, as a mother, I would be satisfied Zack and the pink bug were pretending to read the newspaper, listening to Rita and Floor's conversation that was on a different wavelength, and couldn't help but laugh. Young man, this slave's performance is perfect, she's outstanding, and likes you, I have high hopes for her. She leaned on Zack's shoulder, shaking her head. Although Zack told Floor that the pink bug was just his pet, she still treated it with great respect, using the term senior in her daily life, which made her feel very comfortable. Zack, however, shook his head lightly, it's a pity that the traces of fate are too obvious. Since you can't escape it, just accept fate with peace of mind. The bug crawled onto his arm in a U-shape, reading the newspaper, young man, while emphasizing tactics, you also need to learn to enjoy life. Don't let your inner self be crushed by pressure before you've truly encountered anything. Thank you for the advice, senior. Zack's pressure was indeed not small. He had talked to Rita alone about her background, but hadn't gained any useful information. Rita has been living in a simple and warm family in a human village on the border since she was a child, with ordinary elf parents. But later, everything changed because of the war. Her parents were cruelly killed by the invading demon army, and she was taken away by the demons, ready to be offered to the higher demons. On the way to transport Rita, the demon lackey who killed her parents, the culprit, fell asleep on duty and she found the opportunity to kill him, avenging her parents and successfully escaping into the Black Fire Mountains. But she doesn't remember anything that happened after that. When she regained consciousness, it was after Zack was born. Zack listened to Rita's recounting of her past with complex emotions. Mom, you suffered. It's okay. To have such a cute child like Zack is the greatest luck of my life. Rita hugged Zack tightly. Zack, immersed in his mother's warm embrace, let out a barely audible sigh. Everything seems to be related to the arrangement of the gods. He must go to the elf tribe to find clues in the future. Time passed quickly. In the blink of an eye, it was time for the entrance exam. As the most prestigious institution in the port of Punas, the Punas Noble Magic Academy is located near the mountaintop in an excellent noble area, with a vast area and several ancient castles and modern buildings. Zack, Rita, and Floor sat in a brand new carriage, blending into the flow of carriages heading towards the academy. Through the window, Zack saw the giant gate of the academy with exquisite reliefs. Triumphal arch. The word came to his mind inexplicably. On the other side, the pink insect behind the curtain explained necessary matters to Floor, who was driving the carriage, do not expose my existence to outsiders, and do not reveal that Rita is Zack's mother. It's better to be cautious. Okay. I will remember the instructions of the predecessors. Floor listened particularly seriously. Inside the carriage, Rita looked at the luxurious and well-built magic academy with some worry and asked Zack, Zack, about opening a shop. I will take the entrance exam first, Zack said with a serious expression, and then implement the plan to open a shop. Okay, Rita nodded. Tens of thousands of students participated in the enrollment exam this year, and the number of students admitted from the civilian population was less than a thousand. The competition was extremely fierce. But this could be said to be the greatest opportunity for civilian examinees in Punas to change their own and even their entire family's destiny, similar to the college entrance examination. Due to the large number of examinees, Zach and other examinees were randomly assigned to thousands of examination rooms to participate in the written test first. Naturally, examinees were not allowed to bring any tools, but the pink insect integrated into Zach's body was not discovered by the official silver level adventurers who checked. If the gold-level adventurers don't pay special attention and use their means to dig into your memory, they won't be able to find my existence, the pink insect hummed in his mind, this is my only advantage. Wrong. Predecessor, you are about to use your other advantage. Zack watched as the examiner on the stage opened the sealed test paper. According to common sense, he should have first studied in the six-year basic school, then in the six-year secondary school, and after endless days and nights of studying, finally take the entrance exam for the Noble Magic Academy. But with the pink insect as an external brain, all of this could be easily solved. Oomph, leave it to your reliable predecessor. The pink insect was smug. After the papers were distributed, Zack looked at the test paper in his hand and fell into contemplation. Mathematics. It was full of complex mathematical problems, covering algebra, geometry, practical applications, and more. The pink insect also fell into contemplation as it looked at the paper. 
Young man, this is a bit challenging. Please connect the source where I am to your brain. I want to use the corresponding functions in your brain for calculations. Fine, Zack sighed. He had completely forgotten about these things. After the two of them finished, there was still half an hour left until the end of the exam. When Zack stood up to hand in his exam, the invigilator's eyes widened. He incredulously flipped through his filled test paper, glancing at the other students in the exam room who were struggling to write even half of their papers. Is he really a genius? He wondered as he watched Zack leave confidently. This will easily attract attention, Zack thought as he walked out and noticed the empty corridor, realizing something was amiss. There's no problem if I don't hand in the next few papers, the pink insect hummed. She was quite satisfied with the fact that she was far ahead of the other students. In the following exams, general language, ancient language, world history, world geography, integrated science, magic spell application, advanced magic theory, noble etiquette, and even religious history, the pink insect handled them all with ease. As for Zack, his hand was numb by the time he reached the later papers. The difficulty and volume of questions were more terrifying than any exam he had taken in his past life. After all, they only select less than a thousand commoners from a hundred thousand people. The pink insect was very satisfied with her performance. The magic academy only wants the top few, so the difficulty is naturally high. Oh my, Zack looked at the exhausted students around him, there are even multiple practical exams ahead. Some people are already on the verge of collapse. The practical exams are your strong suit, the pink insect said lightly. No upper class race or silver level adventurer would go to the academy for further studies, so it's not significant for them. Therefore, this will be your domain. During the exams, Rita and Froll took on all the household chores, taking turns to look after Zack, who seemed to be working hard but actually had nothing to do. After the written exams were over, a few days later, the students began the practical exams in batches. The score for divine magic had the greatest weight, which happened to be Zack's strong suit. When he quickly recited the spell and applied a perfect purification spell to the target, the surrounding students were in an uproar. To master divine magic to this extent? Even some upper-class races can't do that, right? This elf is definitely the most devout follower of the light god. Why does this seem like a cliché from a trashy novel? Zack looked at the noisy students and walked up to the judging teacher. The judging teacher was a silver-level adventurer. She had a hot figure, pink curly hair tied up at the back of her head, and a slightly chubby face with silver-framed glasses. I'm Loner, she lazily looked at Zack and said, You scored full marks. You have a lot of practical experience. And this level of mastery, it's not just talent, you must have been training in divine magic in your spare time, basically never relaxing. Zack nodded earnestly, Teacher Loner is right. Ha, huh, you don't have to call me teacher now, it's not too late to call me that when you really become my student. Loner was amused, even so, don't slack off in other subjects. Keep up the good work. Thank you for your guidance, teacher. Zack bowed and left the stage. When he came out, he heard the students whispering, that's the master Loner who touches the realm of transcendent magic. It's said that her actual strength has reached the level of a gold level adventurer, she just hasn't been certified. This magic master has a high opinion of this handsome elf. Zack didn't want too many changes to happen, so he quickly left. In the following practical exams, although Zack didn't perform as exaggeratedly as he did in Divine Magic, he still outperformed his peers. There's no one who can compete, the pink insect concluded. I think you should be prepared. Prepared for what? There should be no suspense in you being the first in the rankings. With such outstanding performance, it will undoubtedly attract the attention of the school management and the outside world. Zack smiled, perfect. After all the exams were over, the Prince Noble Magic Academy began a three-day-long process of compiling the results. All the examinees returned home, anxiously awaiting the academy's notification. If they failed the exam, the academy would send a receipt politely informing the examinee of the result. If they passed, the academy would send a gilded admission notice. Whether it was a receipt or an admission notice, they were both packed in identical, elegantly styled envelopes, giving no hint of their contents. Opening the envelope was like opening a blind box, and it was the most nerve-wracking moment for the examinees from Prince Port. Every year, those who opened the gilded envelopes would exclaim, Oh, great! I made it! Many commoner examinees would then cry, laugh, or even faint. This was not surprising, as it meant that after years of perseverance and effort, and after several rounds of rigorous exams, they had finally completely changed their own and their family's destiny. On the evening of the third day, Zack and the pink little bug were sitting on the sofa, discussing matters related to the academy. Youngsters, any student who successfully graduates can at least go directly to the military academy and enjoy the national meal. And the graduation rate for commoner students is almost 100% every year. 
Zach said with interest, they all work so hard? The exams are so difficult, shouldn't the graduation standards be high? The pink little bug flicked its tail and said, although the academy's courses are very difficult, the graduation standards are designed to be very lenient because they have to consider those noble children who are exempt from entrance exams. However, even so, nearly one-third of the dandies cannot meet the graduation standards and have to repeat a year. Zach laughed. How many years can they repeat? I don't know, the pink little bug stretched lazily, but after a certain number of years, the academy has to graduate the repeat students. If they rashly expelled the noble children, the academy might get into trouble, even making enemies with the noble families. The academy, which has always maintained a neutral stance in the power struggles of the upper class, has been able to maintain a good reputation because of this. The path of social mobility that common people dream of and strive for is easily accessible to the nobles, and they even look down on it. Some people spend their whole lives pursuing Rome, some are born in Rome, and some are born destined to be mules. Zack couldn't help but think of the saying from his past life, and he smiled helplessly. One could roughly imagine the state of the kingdom's upper class. This world has been decadent for a long time, the pink little bug seemed to see through his thoughts and said lightly, I was briefly excited about the emergence of new things in Princeport before, but now I understand that it doesn't change the essence. While the two were chatting, Flora, dressed in a maid outfit, suddenly rushed into the living room. Master, your letter. Rita, who had been dozing off on Zack's lap, immediately woke up, is it a letter from the academy? Yes, Zack took the envelope, admiring the exquisite black and white pencil drawing of the academy's main gate and the gilded emblem on the cover. The design is very nice. The pink little bug peeked out from his shoulder, the design is different every year. The last time I saw the academy's receipt envelope was decades ago, and it was an oil painting at that time. Zack felt the envelope. It was bulging, as if there was more than one admission notice inside. He hardened his nails, making them thin and sharp, and opened the envelope without any emotion. In addition to a prominent gilded admission notice, there was also a bag of exquisitely packaged candies, a miniature model of the Academy's main gate, and several extra letters. The pink little bug shook its head, ah, whether it's an admission notice or a receipt, they also like to put in some snacks and toys. It should be different every year. It's quite thoughtful. Zack handed the candies, model, and admission notice to the eagerly waiting Rita, and then began to read the letters. I'm the first. First place, wow. Rita waved the acceptance letter excitedly, bouncing around the living room. I knew dear Zack was excellent, but I didn't expect him to be this amazing. Madam, please be careful not to fall, Fleur quickly embraced the petite Rita. Mom, pay attention to your image, don't let Fleur worry too much, Zack said casually, reading the letter with a smile on his face. Very good. These letters were an extra notice, a notification for receiving a bonus, and an invitation from the academy's management. The notice stated that the top 100 students would be assigned to the noble class with better teacher resources and student treatment, studying alongside those noble children. The bonus notification informed him that with his first place performance, he could receive a scholarship of a total of 3,000 gold coins upon formal enrollment. The most important was the invitation letter. The day before the enrollment procedures, the academy's management invited Zach for a face-to-face -face meeting. Everything is going according to plan, the pink little bug said lightly. The day before enrollment, at the administrative castle of the prince's noble magic academy, Zack sat in a comfortable chair, with a harmless expression, watching the diverse board members deep in thought. They were all renowned nobles. There were also two superior races and three silver-level adventurers among them. The lizard chieftain, whose appearance was close to that of a wyvern, spoke up, Are you saying that you plan to arrange for your relatives to open a snack shop in this academy? Yes, with a 30 to 70 profit split, Zack added, the academy takes 70%, and my relatives take 30%. The board members looked at each other with some confusion. A human dressed as a swordsman pointed out, directly opening a snack shop on campus will distract the students from their studies. Zack smiled calmly and confidently, what you said does make sense to a certain extent, but the absence of a snack shop does not necessarily mean that the students will study more diligently. Here is a report I prepared, including data on how students bring snacks into the campus through various means, as well as a petition from students for an on-campus snack shop. Please take a look. During the summer vacation, Zach did not accompany Rita for shopping for this reason. He talked to the locals by walking the streets and alleys, supplemented by the information perception ability of the pink little bug, and personally visited a large number of students' homes. Thanks to Zach's good looks, many students did not directly refuse him but were willing to communicate with him. An on-campus snack shop? Elf Jr., if you can really open one, I'll call you brother. Just need to sign the petition, no need for a parade? Can I give some suggestions on the types of snacks? 
Zach obtained a lot of data through this and also got to know many senior students and even exchanged contact information with some of them, mainly senior female students. On the other hand, with the assistance of the pink little bug, Zach also found multiple stable channels for snack supply, killing two birds with one stone. The board members took the thick report and began to read through it. Why don't these brats put their efforts into studying instead of sneaking snacks into the classroom? TSK, they even wrote letters to their parents in the capital to airship snacks. So many people signed the petition? They looked at Zach, who waited for their response without changing his expression, as if victory was already in his grasp. Instead of letting the students waste more energy by bringing snacks into the campus through various means, it's better to directly open a snack shop in the academy to more conveniently meet their needs. Prevention is better than cure. If we really want to open a snack shop, we definitely cannot stock unverified food. If there's a shop on campus, the phenomenon of eating snacks during class should increase. So I object. We can stock products from the academy's subordinate food factories. The board members discussed cautiously, weighing the pros and cons. The swordsman informed Zach, even if the academy agrees to open the shop, your relatives may not necessarily be able to be the shop owners. Zach, you have not yet informed the academy which elf settlement you belong to. If you are willing to provide the relevant information after verification by the academy, we will consider it at our discretion, Zach responded lightly, Swordsman, I have always relied on my relatives for survival, and there is no family background that could embarrass the academy. During my time at the academy, I want to protect the personal safety of my relatives, so I had the idea of letting her open a shop at the academy. Since the academy's investigation could not be deceived by Zach's and Rita's information, it was better to take the initiative to show goodwill. Zach's strength in the entrance exam was there, and the possibility of achieving a career breakthrough among the upper races was very high. In addition, he truly had no background and no visible enemies, the academy had investigated, and the kingdom's aristocracy had never heard of Zack. Instead of worrying, the best course of action for the academy was to win him over and make him feel a sense of belonging to the academy. This was also the consistent approach of the Pune's Noble Magic Academy towards talented individuals without a background. Among the present board of directors, two had been successfully cultivated through this approach, and after making a career for themselves, they had given back to the academy. For them, the academy had become like a family. Indeed, the swordsman no longer argued, appearing thoughtful. The oldest looking among them, a senior wizard with white hair and beard, spoke up, since the principal is not here, let's vote according to the school rules. The result was clear, with the majority of votes passing. Congratulations, Zach, said the kind old wizard as he stood up and shook Zach's hand. I have seen many outstanding and unique commoner students, but most of them do not have your strong social skills or your unique way of thinking. It can be said that if there are no major changes, your future is immeasurable. The lizard clan leader nodded, in fact, face-to-face -face interviews are a tradition of the academy, and every year the top three in the entrance exam are invited for interviews. The other two had introduced their study goals and life ideals, but only you truly exceeded my expectations. Zach stood up and bowed, thank you very much for the understanding and support from the teachers, for being willing to give me an equal opportunity for dialogue, and even patiently listen to my appeals. I am very grateful as a student. The board of directors and Zach discussed the details of the on-campus snack shop and signed several business contracts. It was very late when Zach finally returned to his doorstep and noticed that Floor had hired several transport carriages. She lifted her skirt slightly and elegantly bowed, Master, everything is proceeding according to your arrangements. Floor, you've done a great job, Zach said as he passed by her, patting her head. Floor's face blushed again, as long as you are satisfied. At home, Rita had also packed her luggage and was holding a set of the staff uniform of the Noble Academy. The student uniform is already very nice. I didn't expect the staff uniform to be so exquisite. Zach smiled and nodded in response. The pink little bug jumped onto his palm and said lightly, everything is ready. Rita raised her right fist and said seriously, taking office, Puna's Noble Magic Academy. The next day, Zack, accompanied by Flor and Rita, entered the academy and officially began his magical career. The academy had allocated a storefront for Rita and sent many people to help her with the store, while Zack and Flor headed towards their noble class. The pink little bug hummed in his mind, thanks to the illusion technique, the younger generation can smoothly infiltrate the academy. This time, Zack didn't need her reminder and said, Thank you, senior. Mm, the senior made a slightly strange sound that sounded satisfied. As per Zack's request, Floor also made corresponding changes to her appearance, simply applying makeup to her face to make her appearance less stunning than before. Floral's reputation in the noble social circle was too great, 
and it was difficult to ensure that there were no aristocratic descendants who recognized her original face. Zack's actions were also to protect her. Even so, their combination of looks as they walked together still attracted a lot of attention from the students. Plus, with your previous social activities to gather information, you have already become famous in the academy, the voice of the pink insect echoed in his mind, and you are also the top student. You are probably going to become more popular than ever. That's good. Oof, who can find out that you are actually just a goblin? It's unheard of for a goblin to be so popular in history. Thank you, senior. Oh, what a sweet talker Zach's classroom was on the first floor of a castle. As he and Floral walked in, he suddenly smelled a familiar scent. The pink insect also noticed, wait, this can't be. A girl burst out of the classroom. She shouted loudly, Dad? Everyone in the hallway stopped. Zach stood still, watching the black-haired cat-eared girl run to the other side of him with an excited look on her face. Ha! Huh? Zach could feel everyone's eyes around him. For the first time, he didn't want to have such a wide range of hearing, did I hear that right? An orc noble calling a commoner elf dad? Playing really well. Wait, this elf student looks familiar. Wasn't she the one who came to my house during the summer to petition? At the Pernus Noble Magic Academy, when nobles and commoners wore the same school uniform, they would wear a badge with their family crest as a distinction. The black-haired cat-eared girl in front of him had a silver badge on her chest. Its base image was a hexagram, with a fierce black snake breaking out of the center of the hexagram and opening its bloody mouth forward. The bottom was encrusted with a circle of gold-embossed inscriptions, Red Soros. Zack looked at the joyful cat-eared girl. She was taller than Rita, wearing a pleated skirt, and her tail wagged behind her like a dog's. Over the years, the girl's face had completely shed its childishness and transformed into a lively and youthful teenager, but Zack could still see the shadow of her past in her facial features. Master, excuse me. At this point, Floral, with an annoyed tone, walked up and stood between Zack and the girl. I'm very sorry, Miss Soros, but you must have mistaken the person. No, I haven't, the girl shook her head firmly, since never lie. She looked at Zack again with anticipation, right? Dad. I'm sorry, Miss Soros, Zack's eyes hinted in the direction outside the castle. There must be some misunderstanding among us. I would like to talk to you in a quiet place. This is not a good place for a conversation. The cat-eared girl understood, okay. May I know your name? He said lightly, Zack. At his words, a smile appeared on the girl's face. Here is fine. Zack walked into the woods and said to the black-haired cat-eared girl behind him. The pink insect had just reminded him that there were no eavesdroppers here. Without him reminding her, Floral took the initiative to leave and stood at a distance to block the onlookers. The autumn wind brushed over the yellowing leaves, making a rustling sound. It picked up a few falling leaves and spun them to the two people standing still. Zack took one and gazed at the veins on it. All the branches would eventually return to the main vein of the leaf, until the leaf stem suddenly broke. He said softly, Red Bean, Hoom. The girl tucked a strand of hair behind her ear and said calmly, Sorry, Dad, I was too excited at first and caused you a lot of trouble. It's okay. Let's take this opportunity to tell each other's stories, Zack smiled. I believe you must have some questions about how I transformed from a goblin to an elf. He casually raised his hand, and a stone bench rose from the ground, scattering numerous fallen leaves into the air. They both sat down and began to tell each other their stories. After leaving the goblin nest, the Goblin Slayer Squad did not directly hand the children over to the army or the church. Instead, under Yara's guidance, they secretly sneaked out through other small paths, bypassing the Legion's blockade. The reason for their actions was simple. These children were saved by a goblin and had a deep emotional connection with it, which was not allowed by the church and the gods. After checking their memories, the church will most likely execute them, the Goblin Slayer said in a deep voice, so I have to trouble everyone again. Please help place the children in suitable locations. No one objected, not even the unconventional Yara. Each person took several children and went their separate ways, embarking on a difficult journey. As for me, I will go back to help and explain the situation to the other adventurers. The elven archer waved his arm, see you all at the usual place in two months. See you at the usual place. The young priest smiled and waved his staff in response. Everyone shared a knowing smile. They all understood that the usual place referred to the adventurers association that held numerous memories. Whom? The goblin slayer turned and left with several children. A little girl had been interested in the red tassel on his helmet, so he crouched down and let her touch it. Red Bean and the other orc children followed alongside the lizard priest. The lizard priest took great responsibility for the children. Using his connections, he visited many orc families along the way, and all the children except Red Bean were adopted. Although Red Bean had outstanding looks and various talents, she was not young, and the orc parents hesitated to take her in. Am I unwanted? 
she asked with a hint of disappointment. No, it's just that you haven't encountered your destined opportunity yet, the lizard priest patiently reassured her. What he didn't say was that if she still couldn't find a suitable adoptive family, he would take her as his apprentice. When the lizard priest had lost confidence and was preparing to return, a miracle happened. A noble orc family he had helped before was willing to adopt Red Bean. The foster parents were both from the cat tribe, and their only daughter had recently passed away. When they saw Red Bean, they were overjoyed. Thank you, Mr. Priest. This is truly a gift from the light god to our family. The lizard priest noticed a family portrait on the table, and the appearance and age of the cat-eared girl in the portrait were somewhat similar to Red Bean. It truly is a destined opportunity, he couldn't help but marvel, life is always full of coincidences. After embracing Red Bean goodbye, the lizard priest declined the foster parents' earnest invitation and quickly disappeared into the night. He left behind a few words, my companions are still waiting for me. I need to go to other goblin nests to rescue more people. In the magnificent and unfamiliar environment, Red Bean was initially at a loss, but the selfless love of her foster parents dispelled her concerns. She quickly became familiar with her foster parents and the servants. Although the noble family where her foster parents belonged was on the verge of decline, their collateral branches were spread throughout the country, and they still held a considerable reputation among the aristocracy. They were the Soros family, descendants of the Soros dynasty that almost conquered the entire mainland during the Third Era's heyday. The only empire that could rival the Soros empire during that time was the Great Han Empire in the eastern continent. This ancient and powerful empire still retained many extremely dangerous ancient ruins to this day, claiming the lives of reckless adventurers, but the descendants of the Soros family always miraculously remained unscathed. Whenever they occasionally explored a certain ruin, they had a chance to obtain powerful treasures and wealth, thus rising once again. This is why the Soros family has always been able to maintain a significant influence in the upper echelons of the kingdom's society. Because Hongdo Soros sounded a bit strange, her foster parents decided to change her real name and called her Hong Soros. One day at the dinner table, her foster parents discussed her future with Hongdo. Hong, mom suggests that you should go to the academy to gain some prestige. This way, even if dad and I get old, or something big happens at home, you can take care of yourself. Hongdo nibbled on the grilled fish, mom, which academy should I go to? Although the Sage Academy in the capital is the most famous, its admission requirements are too high, so we have to rule that out. Her foster parents discussed gently, the water capital won't work either. How about the port of Punas? The noble magic academy there is good, and I happen to know some teachers there, her foster father said, I can use my connections to get our child there. By airship, Hong can just make it for this year's enrollment season. Okay, its graduation requirements are quite lenient, her foster mother agreed with the decision. Hongdo hesitantly said, but I haven't been to school before, can I do well? You've been learning at home for a few years already. Her foster father humorously said, your talent is not bad, and you don't need to compare yourself with those outstanding commoner students. Compared to those useless playboys, Hong, you are already very impressive. Hongdo still felt a bit dispirited. Don't worry, although you were initially an adopted child, after the ceremony, the blood of the Soros family flows within you, her foster father comforted her, you are now a pure member of the Soros family, a true noble, be confident. Finally, Hongdo agreed to her foster parents' request, Carrying their introduction letter, she boarded the airship and traveled alone to the port of Punas. Hearing this, Zack asked, Ceremony? Yes, Hongdo recalled, I don't remember the specific details of the ceremony, but since then, I have indeed possessed the bloodline of the Soros family. Not just me, whether it's a woman who marries into the Soros family or a man who marries a female member of the Soros family, they all truly become members of the Soros family through some kind of ceremony, Zack sighed. He seemed to understand why the empire had long been buried in the dust of history while the Soros family had continued to thrive for thousands of years. Upon careful recollection, the ancient city in the goblin's nest was also an ancient relic left by the Soros dynasty. He would have to ask the elders about this mysterious Soros dynasty and family later. Dad, in public from now on, I'll just call you by your name, Hongdo lowered her head. Of course, I will also call you Hong from now on. When we are alone, you can call me Hongdo directly. I have never given up the name Rita mom gave me. She raised her head, her eyes glistening with tears. Finally, I have a childish request. Dad, can you hug me? Zack nodded, sure. Hongdo smiled slightly and gave him a sweet smile. She suddenly leaned close to Zack's body and hugged him tightly. Dad, I'm so worried about you and Rita mom, I miss you so much. Hongdo burst into tears, I'm really happy to see you again, it's so good. Zack gently patted her back, her hair scattered to his nose, letting him smell the fragrance of the young girl. Yes, I'm also very happy to see you. 
he said with deep emotion. The wind swept up the fallen leaves on the ground, swirling in the air, covering the stone bench where the two were sitting. When Zack and the now cheerful Hongdo emerged from the woods after a good cry, the ever-watchful Florio glanced at the two of them, Master, who is she after all? Why do I feel a slight hint of jealousy from her, is it just my imagination? Zack said without changing his expression, Florio, we were old friends. It's been many years, and both of us were a bit excited, so we talked for a bit longer, making you wait for a long time. However, the suspicion on Fuer's face seemed to have not faded. Miss Fuer, Zack once helped me out of the darkness. Hondo realized from Zack's reply that Fuer probably did not know that he was a goblin before, did not know about his experience in the cave, and had some misunderstandings about himself. She respected Zack's choice and did not tell the truth, but joked, Don't worry, I am just a pure good friend with your master, I won't compete with you. Okay, stop teasing her, Zack noticed that Fuer blushed again and laughed. After the class meeting today, do you want to go to the newly opened snack shop? Rita also misses you. Great. Hondo nodded with joy. It turns out that mom, Rita also entered the academy. Following the two, Fuer's face became increasingly strange. Miss Soros had previously referred to the master as father, and just now almost called the lady mother out of habit. But the lady is the master's birth mother. What exactly was their relationship before? Her brain was overloaded again. After they returned to the classroom, all the students were already seated, each with their own slave as a deskmate. On the platform stood a male teacher of the Beastman race with wolf ears. After Zack, Hongdo, and Fuer entered the classroom, the male teacher glanced at Hongdo's family crest. You're late even before the formal class starts. Go to your seat. Yes. The handsome and tall male teacher then glanced at Zack's face, turned around, and casually pointed at the blackboard. A row of elegant italic letters appeared on the blackboard, Yagalum. This is my name, he said casually, I am your homeroom teacher, and I might be with you for two years. As for why it might be, some students really like the academy and want to voluntarily stay for three or four years, then I can't do anything about it. The whole class burst into laughter. Stop, Yagalum raised a hand. Although his voice was not loud, it seemed to have a kind of magic that quickly made the entire classroom quiet, leaving only his voice. However, Zack saw that some students' mouths were still opening and closing. Yagalum continued, I'm sure everyone knows that the homeroom teacher is useless unless you are willing to take my class. Of course, if you encounter any problems, you can also consult me. Don't bother your mentors, they are usually very busy, like going fishing at the beach in groups. This classroom is just for you to get to know each other today and will be the activity venue for our class in the future. But generally speaking, today's freshman orientation meeting is the only time in your few years here that everyone will be present. The remaining necessary matters are on the paper. I'm too lazy to explain. With a wave of his claw, a large stack of papers fluttered like falling flowers, each sheet landing precisely on a student's desk, just the right amount, not too many or too few. Zack began to read. The items listed on it included academy matters such as course selection, credit requirements, school rules, student cafeteria, and dormitories. As long as he touched any of them, the surface of the paper would change, transforming into the detailed content of that item. Magic is really useful, Zack nodded. This paper was equivalent to a universal guidebook given to students by the academy. After everyone finished reading, Yagalum waved his hand again, and a row of letters appeared on the blackboard, end of class. That's it for today, dismissed. Yagalum announced the end of the orientation meeting and left casually, leaving only one last sentence. Oh, please keep that paper safe, any notifications will be displayed on it. As he left, the classroom fell into a brief silence. Ha! Huh? The expected half-hour freshman orientation meeting had only lasted 10 minutes. The carefree noble children were the first to boil over, so free? Ah, I feel like I'm going to be obsessed with werewolves, especially that furry big tail. It keeps wagging. You really fall in love easily. Originally, I was planning to run for class monitor or something, but the loose class system and individual credit system meant that there were no class leaders. Zack stood up, preparing to gather red bean and four at the snack shop in Rita. Then he would take the initiative to contact the student union. Hello, I remember you are. Zack? Zack turned around. A woman with features similar to a classical European beauty, with a pair of emerald eyes, approached. Her golden hair flowed like a waterfall, and a drop-shaped blue ornament hung from her pointed ears. She was an elf. Seeing Zack's gaze, she proudly straightened her chest. Of course, this was not to show off her impressive size, but rather a badge of the elf tribe hanging on her chest. The badge depicted a crown made of thorns and blood. The golden-haired female elf introduced herself generously. I am Hype Cinder of the Thorn Tribe. May I ask where you come from, fellow? I'm sorry, I don't have a tribe, nor do I have a noble surname. As you can see, I am just a common elf. 
Zack elegantly performed the hand salute, it's an honor to meet you, Miss Cinder. Others left the classroom chatting and laughing, leaving only Red Bean and Four waiting silently on the side. Hype's face showed a concerned expression, is the only elf around you yourself? My mother is also an elf. She raised me with great difficulty, and we wandered all the way to the port of Puna's. Hype sympathetically said, your mother must have had a hard time. Zack, have you ever considered becoming my subordinate? In return, I can provide a place for your mother and you to stay, and take care of your daily expenses. Zack slightly furrowed his brows. How could she recruit classmates to be her followers at the first meeting? Miss Cinder, I appreciate your kindness, but at the moment, my mother and I do not lack money. He bowed again, if there is nothing else important, I have to take my leave. He turned and left. Hype did not give up, taking a step forward trying to grab Zack's clothes. Wait, in the future, I can also give you a noble title. I'm sorry. Please mind your manners and do not overstep. Fuwer intercepted her with an unfriendly tone. Hype's lips moved, but she didn't say anything more. Her head drooped in frustration. Another failure. Miss, although Zack is a commoner, he ranked first in the entrance exam and is very strong. The blue-haired lowly slave behind her supported her body. You were too hasty, he didn't turn hostile just now, which was already giving you face. But I can't learn at all, there's no hope for studying. Hype covered her face, I was thinking if I could recruit some strong followers, I could also have something to show to the family when I go back. Miss, you should work on your eloquence again. Zack, who had already reached the corridor, stopped in his tracks. What's wrong? Red Bean asked. Nothing. I was just lost in thought. This elf miss could be used in the future, but it couldn't be ruled out that this was a trap against him. A rough plan quickly formed in Zack's mind. The words of the pink little bug resonated in his origin transmitting to his mind along his bones, young one, that noble just now actually behaved very politely. Ordinary nobles wouldn't treat commoners like that. I know, Zack said softly. Along the way, he had seen several commoner students actively fawning over prominent noble students. He could also hear that some arrogant noble offspring, accompanied by others, were cornering a commoner female student in a corner, enthusiastically inviting her to become part of their harem. The academy could be said to be the only channel for commoners to interact with the lofty nobles. In addition to the intense academic rankings, many people also hope to take this opportunity to make connections with the nobles. Maybe I'll be noticed by some noble, and I'll rise to the top right after graduation. Lost in thought, Zack saw his homeroom teacher lying on a wooden bench, his face completely covered by an open book. His large tail hung down from the gap between the back of the chair and the wooden board, swaying slightly in the wind. Mr. Agalum, Zack approached and said tentatively. Hmm, this sound seemed to be squeezed out from deep in his nostrils. The werewolf took down the book and sat up slowly. It's you latecomers. What's the matter? Zack pointed to the teaching building behind him. There are noble students on the fourth floor staircase harassing female students. Instead of taking action himself, he chose the easier option of reporting. Agalum glanced at him expressionlessly. I thought you would take the initiative to be a hero. You see, I'm not lacking in beauties around me. Zack spread his hands nonchalantly. Agalum laughed heartily. All right, you're an interesting guy, and your perception is not bad. I'll reluctantly take care of it. He bent down, flexed his muscular legs and claws, and jumped straight into an open window on the fourth floor. Wow, Red Bean envied a bit, as fellow beasts, when will I reach that level? Zack walked away. If you want to learn, I can teach you in the future. Then thank you, Dad. Zack. Red Bean happily pounced on him, but was stopped midway by floor who had a face full of black lines. You too, Miss Soros, please don't cross the line. Unlike other shops, Rita's snack shop is located in a remote corner of the academy, a solitary little house that looks like a chubby mushroom from a distance. The first floor is the mushroom's large stock, and it's where students shop. The second floor is the mushroom's cap, divided into several rooms, including Rita's bedroom, bathroom, and warehouse. Zack carefully examined its appearance. There is also a small opening on the second floor bedroom with a wooden platform set up as a balcony, with a rattan lounge chair. The snack shop's door is wide open. It was recently renovated, with vines hanging from the ceiling, still permeated with a strong woody scent. Rita, dressed in a staff uniform, was humming an off-key tune while stocking snacks on the shelves. Mom, Rita! Before Zack could speak, Red Bean couldn't contain her excitement and rushed forward, hugging Rita, who was full of surprise. The two of them hugged tightly in happiness. It's really you, Red Bean, it's really you. Overwhelmed by the huge surprise, Rita couldn't find the words, tears streaming down her face. Mom! Red Bean was already taller than her. From a distance, she looked more like Rita's sister. Zack shrugged and turned to leave with Floor. Let them catch up. 
Let's not disturb them for now. They walked a few dozen meters away, watching Red Bean grab Rita's hands and excitedly talk about something. Floor cautiously asked, Master, may I ask, what is the relationship between Miss Soros and Mrs? Zack's mouth curled up slightly. Well, it's a long story. He roughly told a story. He and Rita had rescued many children from an evil organization and raised them for a while. In the end, they entrusted these children to a civilian charity organization and asked them to send the children to kind-hearted families who were willing to take them in. Red Bean's habit of calling her mom was left over from that time, Zack explained. Although I tried to correct it, it didn't work, so I let her call her that. Perhaps it was fate that I met her again at the academy. Master and Mrs. are really kind. Floor sighed. But why doesn't Miss Soros have a slave companion at the academy? Zack laughed. Even without a slave, it's just a loss of some points. If you don't strive for a ranking, as long as you graduate normally, it won't have much impact. A hint of imperceptible disappointment flashed in Fu'er's eyes. She keenly realized that it was probably for the above reason that she was bought by her master. Fu'er then shook her head abruptly. What am I thinking? Regardless of my true feelings, my master has been good to me, and I should repay him with all my heart and effort. Fu'er, do you think I bought you just to compete for first place in the academy? Zack's gentle voice pulled her out of her thoughts. I'm sorry, I, I. Caught off guard by her master's smiling face, the flustered Fu'er was somewhat incoherent and didn't know how to respond for a moment. Zack slowly said, at first, that's what I thought. But of course, I wouldn't just buy any slave, otherwise I wouldn't have gone to the deepest part of the slave market. If I didn't have a good impression of you, how could I be willing to pay such a high price? Seeing a blush on Fu'er's face, Zack appropriately patted her head. In the evenings to come, when we are alone in the dormitory, I will gradually tell you the reason. It seems they have finished talking. Let's go in and help. Taking the bewildered Fu'er by the hand, Zack walked towards the store. The voice of the pink little bug watching the show echoed in Zack's mind. TSK TSK TSK. After finishing all the work, the sky gradually darkened. Due to the thick cloud cover, the visual perception was that the natural light was noticeably weakening. It was already evening. During this time, many students peeked their heads out of the store's door, only to leave disappointed when they found out it hadn't officially opened yet. Hongdo, Zack, Fur, Rita tied on an apron, you've all worked hard. Let's have dinner here tonight. In addition to neatly arranged snack shelves, there was also a partially enclosed kitchen area on the first floor, with several tables set up. Mom, you've worked hard all day too. Zack stopped her, let me cook? Housework is a maid's task. Four elegantly bowed, Madam, please let me do it. Let me do it. I want to cook steak. Fish steak. Hongdo suddenly jumped up and hugged Zack's neck, excitedly saying, I've learned a lot. Miss Soros, pay attention to your image. Dinner ended in a lively atmosphere. Rita slept upstairs in the snack shop, while Zack and Hongdo had to return to their dormitory before the designated time. Before leaving, Zack left several hidden magic circles in various places. Although the academy security forces were strong and had never had any mishaps, he decided to be cautious. As a civilian student, Zack's and Fu'er's dormitory was located in a newly built castle, with only a narrow, long room. This bed is a bit narrow, Zack frowned. Although the interior of the room exuded a luxurious atmosphere, there was only a sturdy mahogany bed in the center. There were barely enough pillows side by side on top. If the master needs, I can sleep on the floor. Fu'er bent down, carefully arranging the bedding. No need, Zack said indifferently, taking off his coat. If you're willing, just squeeze a little. I'll take a shower first. Mm. Thank you, master. While Fu'er was in the bathroom, Zack lay on the bed thinking about the events of the day. Senior, can you tell me about the Soros family and the Thorn family? The pink little bug rolled around on the silk bed. The Thorn family is just an ordinary elven group. Hundreds of years ago, they successfully cultivated a semi-divine level elven king with the strength of the entire clan, known as the Thorn King at the time, so his people changed the name of the clan to the Thorn family. Of course, that Thorn King fell into the hands of the Demon King a few decades later, so this elven family only had a short period of glory. As for the Soros family, that's a different story. Apart from the information that the cat girl told you, there is a lot more to say. Young man, first of all, you must know that the Soros family members are of diverse races. There are humans, orcs, elves, dwarves, and even demons among them. Demons? Zack really hadn't thought of this. Yes, and there are also succubi among them. However, the demon members of the Soros family do not participate in the war between the demon realm and the human realm, and they have always maintained a neutral stance. Interestingly, the most famous succubus in their family disappeared from the outside world over a hundred years ago. 
I once heard a rumor that this succubus, due to her strong desires, raised a large number of goblins. Here, the pink little bug chuckled, the demon members of the Soros family publicly declared a rift with the other members, but I think it's just to allow the other members to live freely in the outside world and participate in the aristocratic politics of the kingdom. They should have private dealings. Zach humbly asked, Senior, why do you have such a speculation? It's simple. What truly determines the Soros family is the special blood flowing within each member. Despite being scattered all over, this blood unites them and makes them highly cohesive, able to gather together at any time when called upon. To this day, I have not heard of any internal strife within the Soros family. So, in the Soros family, racial differences are not important, nor is faith. It all depends on whether the unique blood of the family flows within you. Zach pondered. Just then, there was a knock on the door. Classmate, are you asleep? Hello, what's the matter? He walked to the door and politely responded. Hey, do you want to exchange slaves tonight? Zach was taken aback, exchange slaves? Yes? Always playing with the same one, you must be tired of it too, right? The voice outside the door said lewdly, brother, let's change it up, shall we? Seeing Zach's hesitation, the person outside immediately added, hey, don't worry, I'm not a noble, just like you, I'm also a commoner who worked hard to get in here. Our status is equal, just exchange for one night, and that's it. It was clear that the exams could only filter out the academically weak, not the morally corrupt. Zach looked at the pink bug in the palm of his hand and whispered, Senior, can I trouble you for a moment? Ha! Huh? The pink bug's eyes widened for a moment, almost exceeding the limits of her body. Where are you going? I mean, I want you to turn into mist and go out to see what's going on. Zach glanced at her, I want to make use of your stealth abilities. He had already used his auditory perception to confirm the movements outside the door and apart from sensing that there were two people, there was nothing unusual. But just to be safe, Zack decided to let the pink bug turn into mist and confirm the situation outside. As for why he didn't use the goblin shadow assassin skills, Zack was worried that using the abilities of the evil attribute in the heavily guarded academy might cause trouble. Just wait a moment, I'll put on some clothes, he shouted to the person outside the door. The pink bug didn't say anything. Her body exploded into a cloud of mist, stretched out from the top crack of the door, and after a moment, retracted and dissolved into Zack's chest. There is indeed a student with a slave outside the door, but the student is a noble, her voice rang in his mind, and the slave is also a male. Zack frowned. He seemed to understand who the real target of the person outside the door tonight was. It seems that having a high-value elven form can sometimes backfire. After making some preparations, he opened the door. A large arm immediately pushed the door open completely, and an excited fat man squeezed in, Elf brother, sorry, I actually wanted to exchange with you. The fat man looked at Zack, who was holding a large fireball in his left hand and a thick earth and stone chain in his right hand, and his voice gradually lowered. Zack lowered his head slightly, his eyes full of playfulness, it's okay, I was also thinking about how you would react. The fat man exclaimed in fear, you, as a commoner, can't act recklessly. My father is a city councillor, and we have a large plantation outside of Pernisport. The fat man and his slaves were all tied up and thrown into a corner, looking ashen-faced. Zack sat on a chair, leisurely crossing his legs, when did you start targeting me? Why dare to target me? I happened to see you bringing a female slave back to the commoner's dormitory, and I also found you appealing, so I became interested. The fat man shivered and said, good junior, as long as you spare me, we can talk about anything else. I can compensate you. After nearly half an hour of education in Zack style, he now believed that this elf could really do such a thing. You don't know my academic record? The fat man shook his head abruptly. I'm a bad student and never pay attention to grades. How could I know you were the top? Zack raised his eyebrows. Okay. Let's go with what you said. Compensation it is. After the fat man and his slaves fled in a panic, Zack said to Floor waiting in the bathroom, You can come out now. Stay alert. I have something to do outside. Kemp, did that commoner elf really outsmart you? Late at night, in an underground warehouse, a dozen or so people, both men and women, mostly nobles, were scattered around. Their slaves were not allowed to participate in the conversation and could only rest at the other end of the warehouse. Kemp's fat face trembled, no, that guy is just a lunatic with a human face and a beastly heart. I suffered losses and barely escaped. Someone joked, weren't you the one who volunteered to see his portrait at first? The crowd laughed. This. Kemp turned to look at a graceful blonde woman in the crowd, Alphine, no matter what, I did contribute the most this time, right? Of course, the woman's face revealed a chilling smile, your probing was very successful. A commoner daring to treat nobles like this has given us the most suitable leverage. This also facilitates the next plan. Being the top in the entrance exam this year, 
we can't let it fall into the hands of Sigma's group again. Well, good evening, everyone. A strange yet calm voice came from the door. It wasn't loud, but it drowned out the noise of the crowd. The smile on the blonde woman's face disappeared. They turned to look, and Zack appeared at the stairs of the basement, surveying the crowd unnoticed. Someone exclaimed in surprise, the slaves on guard are. They're fine, just sleeping soundly, Zack's smile didn't fade, I'm just here to visit you all. He had already figured out that the fat man was sent as a pawn by some student organization to test him. Being the top in the year definitely attracts too much attention, the pink insect had discussed with him before, if it's not for the chance to negotiate with the management, my suggestion is to aim for average grades at best. The top few in the year are always easy targets, Zack said indifferently, and commoners with unremarkable grades, even if they can meet the board of directors, don't have the strength and capital to negotiate opening a shop, and therefore cannot protect Rita. Although being the top in the year will definitely attract a lot of trouble, risks and rewards coexist. As long as I know how to use it, I can turn it into an opportunity. At this moment, Zack was smiling and looking directly at the blonde woman, sensing a strong magical aura within her. He could tell she was the leader here, but her methods were too low-level and childish, no wonder she couldn't grab the top spot before. He was eagerly waiting for the woman's response. The slaves surrounded him with various tools, watching him vigilantly. The expressions of the noble students were somewhat uneasy, and Kemp, upon seeing him, went weak in the legs and collapsed on the ground. His male slave hurried forward and barely helped him up. The blonde girl remained calm and spoke slowly, as a commoner, how dare you attack a noble? Do you not understand your place? This is not an attack, it's education, Zack replied. If you can convince the school authorities to see it that way, the girl stared at him, if you truly had no reservations, you would have already attacked instead of standing here chatting with us. Zack smiled, someone tried to violate me, and defending myself is within the school rules. The academy may have given you many privileges, but it did not give you the right to treat common students as slaves. The girl furrowed her golden eyebrows, your methods with Kemp have exceeded the scope of self-defense. I did not harm him, I was merely correcting his behavior and educating with love, Zack spread his hands, he was just frightened by himself. If necessary, you can sue me and request the church to review the memories. Of course, if it proves that I did act in self-defense, then you will be the instigator of student infringement. The school may let you off, and your noble parents may protect you, but you should be aware of the church's stance, right? The blonde girl couldn't help but look back at Kemp, only to see him stuttering and unable to speak. She sighed, do you think choosing to break the net and die like a fish will make it easier for you in the end? Her words also implied that the influential parents of her group would not let Zack off the hook. Zack chuckled, did I say I came here to confront you? The blonde girl was taken aback, huh? Your ultimate goal is to get me to join your organization, isn't it? Zack approached, and his aura gradually intensified. With each step, the noble students involuntarily took a step back, except for the blonde girl who stood her ground. I happen to be interested in the mysterious underground student organization as well. He smiled as he walked up to the girl, extending his right hand, may I join, madam? The blonde girl's eyes stared firmly at the refined elf in front of her. She realized she couldn't read his mind at all. But for now, she couldn't think of any other way to break the deadlock. In the end, she reluctantly extended her right hand, I am Alfani von Heydrich. Welcome to join, Zack. They shook hands. Zack felt the fine beads of sweat in the blonde girl's palm. After discussing relevant matters with Alfani and gaining a preliminary understanding of the organization, he elegantly performed a hand gesture and left gracefully. It wasn't until he left that the people present snapped out of their shock. I seem to have provoked someone formidable, Alfani stood somewhat dazed in place, murmuring to herself. Students who have not yet entered society are still just students, Zack sighed, perhaps another organization called Sigma might be better, but I doubt their level is much higher. The pink insect lazily lay on his shoulder, youngster, do you plan to gradually take control of this rather vicious group? Senior, why not? These people have brains, but not many, and it's clear they lack a suitable leader to guide them, Zack retorted. What about the student council? That won't be a problem. The academy is like a microcosm of society. Both sides can be played. The pink insect shook its head. It's a good thing you were a commoner before. If you were born a noble, I can't imagine what you would be like now. Thank you for the compliment, senior, Zack glanced to the side. Fleur was wearing a pure white nightgown with lace cutouts, her blood-like long hair spread out on the pillow, some strands already touching his neck. Her body was facing Zack, with her soft arms pressed against his back. Master, is there anything you need? Fleur asked. Due to the close distance, Zack's exposed skin could feel the breeze from her breath. He gazed into Fleur's sky-blue eyes and said, I want to discuss something with you. Hmm, she replied. 
Do you think slaves are born to be slaves? Zack asked, echoing the same question as the slave trader. Fleur gently closed her eyes. I don't know. Number one shows a bloody path to resist all this. I think she is right, and also not right. But I don't know what other path there could be. I ultimately chose to give myself to the master. As long as it keeps you satisfied, I am content, Fleur said. This was Fleur's choice. She did not regret it and secretly felt fortunate to have encountered such a gentle master. She was already satisfied. Her treatment had exceeded that of the vast majority of slaves. Zack looked at the magnificent chandelier on the ceiling and calmly said, Why are slaves destined to be slaves? Because of the unchangeable slave mark in our bloodline. The church tells us that this is proof of our redemption. By dedicating our lives, in the next life, we can be reborn as true humans, no longer suffering as slaves, Fleur replied. Zack continued to look at the ceiling and said, What if I said that this is all nonsense? Fleur suddenly opened her eyes, puzzled, and looked at her usually calm master. Master, why would you say that? These are the established rules of the world. Are the rules of the world always right? Always reasonable? Fleur, they are not, Zack said. You chose the path that most slaves believe is right, while number one chose another path filled with blood and violence, leading to another extreme. But in reality, there is another path to take. Slaves should never have been slaves. Or rather, no one is destined to be a slave, Zack said. Fleur was stunned. But the slave mark. That is just a tool created by the higher powers to oppress and control you, Zack turned to her, his bright red eyes meeting hers. It's the existence that is wrong, not you. No one should atone for a twisted fate they were born into. Remember, the three of us always took turns doing household chores, and Rita even paid you. The reason my mother and I never treated you like a slave, aside from the fact that I do like you, is because we never truly saw you as a slave. You were never a slave, but a true, living person, Zack said. Fleur stared blankly at Zack, her mouth slightly open, unable to react for a moment. Ella, dressed in a slender nun's robe, held her hands in front of her chest, gazing into the deep night sky. There were many skeletons standing beside her, moving musical instruments. They were all controlled by white insects. I can feel it, Ella murmured softly. God is surprised by this. A male voice came from her head. What are you doing with me? Playing, brother. Or rather, rehearsing, Ella said ecstatically, spreading her arms and standing on the top of the burial mound, bathing in the pale moonlight seeping through the gaps in the clouds, to perform a grand symphony for the upcoming new king. I am not a slave, I am a true person. Fleur repeated Zack's words in a daze, tears glistening in her eyes, silently streaming down her cheeks. She had grown accustomed to her inferior status, to the insults and beatings from others, and to a life without dignity. Even the one she was very grateful to, number one, only said to her, your tragedy is encountering a beastly master. Like me, finding a good master brings happiness. For the first time since her birth, someone had told her in person that she was never a slave, because there should never have been slaves in this world. Almost subconsciously, Furl remembered the word she had shouted in front of number one due to psychological trauma. I don't want to serve any master. Zack gazed at her wooden expression and gently said, As long as you find a good master, you can eliminate tragedy and find happiness, isn't that what you thought before? The problem is not about the goodness of the master, but the inherent sin of slavery at birth, which should not exist at all. Only when all slaves completely break their chains and break free from their cages, will this endless suffering come to an end. Furl murmured, Break the chains, break free from the cage. Zack affirmed, Yes, but I must point out one thing. Only by completely eliminating the slave imprint within you and all suffering people in the world, can this goal truly be achieved. If not, then even the beautiful scenes we envision will ultimately be just a daydream. Furl's shoulders trembled uncontrollably. Master. Zack, is this the path you have chosen? Yes, Zack said calmly. The pink insect that had been listening to their conversation couldn't help but interject, Young man, do you know what this means? I know. It means that I am not only against the kingdom and the church, but even against the existence that established all these rules. Zack was well aware that when he first established the idea of changing the current situation of the goblin tribe, he had already stood in opposition to the gods. Without truly changing the illogical asexual reproduction of the goblins, no matter how promising his promises sounded, it would ultimately be complete hypocrisy and empty talk. The twisted logic of goblin reproduction was undoubtedly intertwined with the gods, and was even deliberately created by them. He had long understood that the rules of the world represented the will of the gods. The absurd and extreme rules of the world, the tragic reproduction of the goblin tribe, the earthly hell of millions of slaves, all of these originated from the gods above. Zack sat up and calmly recounted, So, I have never given up on becoming stronger. 
It is for this reason that I have followed the expectations of Yar and the existence behind her. Only by becoming a god would he have the qualification to change everything. The pink insect lowered its head, seeming to want to say something, but ultimately fell into a long silence. Zack spoke again, Furl. Yes, Furl responded subconsciously. I mentioned the topic of why I bought you back during the day. I told you that I would explain the reason when we were alone at night, didn't I? Furl sat up, her soft crimson hair naturally flowing down, overflowing on the bed. Yes, Master, Zack. Zack's mouth curved up slightly. He gazed gently at Furl, showing an encouraging smile. I want to invite you to join me in resisting slavery. Do you want to completely rewrite your own fate and the unfair fate of your fellow beings? Only the slaves who have suffered persecution firsthand have the possibility of awakening and striving to break free from their chains. From the story of number one, it is also clear that the slaves who have suffered greatly are the soil for developing followers of the dark gods, but those organizations have never truly wanted to change these cruel rules. They only use the slaves, turning them from victims into another extreme, killing innocent people and further deepening the suffering and contradictions of the world. Fundamentally, the dark gods are also members of the gods above. They do not oppose the existence of slavery, but use the slaves as their pawns. Therefore, number one believes that slaves either have the luck to encounter a good master, or they become crazy and violent until they die, with no other choice. Zack knew that there was actually a third choice, a completely new path that no one had ever ventured on. However, this path would be against the gods, and to completely change this absurd world, the difficulty of success was no different from a fool's dream. Undoubtedly, the pink insect and Furl also understood this. If Fleur is unwilling, it is not surprising. There's no need to give me an immediate answer, and there's no pressure, Zack said calmly. You can take your time to think it over. I won't turn against you just because you refuse the invitation. If you give up, my attitude towards you won't change, and my mother and I will still treat you as family. Just follow your heart. If Zack were to blame or even force Fleur because she refused, he would be contradicting his previous words and not treating her as an equal. He won't be hypocritical. Zack was prepared for her rejection. He had said what he needed to say. He waited quietly for Fleur's response. Upon hearing Zack's invitation, Fleur froze in place and fell into silence. Follow your heart. She remembered countless days and nights oppressed and tormented by various slave owners, remembered the insane slave owner who tried to kill her, and remembered her own inner pain, despair, and complete numbness. The words echoed in her ears once again, I don't want to serve any master. In the depths of her originally numb heart, the spark buried in the ashes was stirred by a new breeze, gradually growing stronger, and finally burning fiercely in the withered state, I shouldn't be a slave. I am a true, living person. All men are born free. The flame transformed into another version of herself, shouting loudly in Fleur's ear, deafening. Fleur raised her head, looked at the Comzac, and tears flowed down her face. I want to obtain true freedom. I want to become a genuine person. I want to ensure that number one and all the slaves can also obtain freedom, that everyone is born equal. Zack, please allow me to follow you, even if it's a path full of thorns and difficulties, a path with little hope. This is my vow, and my commitment. She clenched her fist and spoke with a determined look. Fleur's attitude even surprised Zack. After a brief moment of thought, he smiled kindly, thank you, Fleur. Now, we are comrades. Zack reached out his right hand, and the resolute Fleur responded. The two held hands tightly. The symphony finally reached a magnificent climax and abruptly stopped. At the same time, Yar finished her final conducting gesture. She opened her deep eyes and looked expressionlessly at the skeletal legion below that had stopped playing. The unextinguished spark will eventually ignite everything, turning into a towering flame that reaches the heavens. The new king will be born in the midst of fire and blood. Yar recited in a trance, gazing at the vast sky. Everything is as you wish, my lord. I will head to the port of Punas. Zack, I will still address you as master in front of others. Please don't refuse, it's necessary for disguise. Zack nodded, Fleur, I understand. But you don't have to do all the household chores, right? Like washing my dirty clothes. Fleur didn't back down, I can't afford to reveal any flaws in the details, and this is voluntary for me. All right. Seeing Zack concede, Fleur happily picked up the clean clothes and hung them on the balcony to dry in the morning sunlight. Specks of dust danced in the light. Master Zack, I can also participate in battles when it comes to fighting, like last night's situation. She said to Zack earnestly while tiptoeing. Why did you add the word master again? Fleur's face showed a playful smile. I just thought that daily address should also become a habit. It was the weekend. Zack first consulted the advice of the pink bug and chose courses that could truly enhance himself, focusing on various advanced magic classes offered in the noble class, including theory and practice. 
He specifically chose Lana's course, from advanced magic to super advanced magic. This course is newly opened, and although Lana is very famous, the introduction and content of the course have caused not many people to dare to choose it. Many people can't even understand advanced magic, let alone upper level magic. Strictly speaking, upper level magic belongs to the domain of upper level races or silver level adventurers, and is not suitable for most students in the academy. However, the introduction of this course clearly states that although the course lasts for two years, at the time of graduation assessment, one must master at least one upper level magic in order to obtain credits. By setting such a requirement, they clearly didn't expect many people to sign up. The pink bug commented helplessly, young man, to be honest, I feel like this course was tailor-made for you. Zack took a sip of juice and said happily, well, I'm lucky. I can even have a silver level adventurer who has mastered super advanced magic specially serving me. Let me remind you, Lana and Yara used to be a team. The pink bug said lightly. Zack sprayed out all the juice. Master, let me help you wipe it. Floor bent down, took out a handkerchief, and gently wiped his mouth. Senior, why didn't you tell me about such an important matter earlier? By the time I saw it, you had already chosen it. The pink bug helplessly shook its tail, don't worry, now that Lana is a teacher, she has already left Yara's team and won't do anything to you. Zack's face twisted into a knot. At least Yara won't show up here. The pink bug shook its tail again and hit Zack's palm, and this course is indeed what you currently need, it's your only opportunity to access super advanced magic, so relax a bit. They were having breakfast at Rita's snack shop at this time. Hearing his movement, the girl at the next table, Red Bean, came over, Dad, Zack, don't waste food in the future. Her plate was already licked clean. Zack continued to point to the magic paper in his hand and check other courses, sorry, but I'm worried about choosing courses. Red Bean showed a cunning smile, Zack, wanna guess what course I chose? Zack said without looking up, is it Aglarum's course? Wow. Red Bean's eyes turned into stars, dad is amazing. He's like a mind reader. Miss Soros, please mind your address, and please be more elegant in your metaphors. Oh. After choosing the courses, he didn't have much free time on the weekend. In addition to enjoying the time with Rita and others, Zack also got involved in the student union and submitted his membership application. After starting the classes, Zack quickly adapted to the rhythm and steadily improved his theoretical knowledge. I can't always rely on my seniors, I have to learn something myself. Especially in terms of combat, for example, if I were attacked by a giant worm, I definitely wouldn't have time to ask you about its weaknesses, but should be able to respond based on my own understanding. Knowledge has to be in my own hands. The pink bug admired him, not bad, young man, it's good that you can understand this on your own initiative. Zack smiled, thank you for the compliment, senior. So, I'll leave the compulsory subjects like advanced mathematics to you. The pink bug blushed instantly, you lazy guy, and I just praised you. On the other hand, Zack's student union application was approved. He became the only civilian member of the student union. You actually joined the student union? Alphine, the leader of the underground group, was very surprised when she heard the news, that's great. She suddenly felt fortunate that she hadn't stopped Zack from joining the organization. Last year, they had been constantly driven away by the student union's lackeys, and their relationship with the student union had reached a freezing point, and now they unexpectedly had a mole in the student union. The only downside is that the mole is not under his control. The others in the group were excited. Do we finally not have to change places for meetings? Zack, where have they been patrolling recently? Zack, are you using your authority to suppress the Sigma group? If many people had previously consciously or unconsciously looked down on Zack's commoner status, they now regarded him as a true nobleman. Even the fat camp changed his previous attitude and showed great respect to Zack. The reason was simple. The members of the student union were mostly composed of elites from the nobility, who held real power in supervising the students in this loosely regulated magic academy. After graduation, most of these people became well-known political elites in the upper echelons of the kingdom. Faced with the cheers of the crowd, Zack couldn't help but smile wryly. When he had found the office of the student union and submitted his application, the noble members at the door had been polite and enthusiastic on the surface, but had actually kept him at arm's length. However, at that time, two board members who had a deep impression of him had come to the student union to handle Eleanor's file. They noticed the situation and entered the office, saying something to the members of the student union present. After that, the attitude of the student union towards him changed 180 degrees, and his membership application was approved. Zack later learned that the two board members had been commissioned by Eleanor to handle her file. His heart sank at that moment. In the midst of the praise from the noble offspring, Zack maintained a smile and responded, As a commoner, I can enter the student union, it's just a coincidence and luck. Alphine sighed, 
You are not a commoner, you are already a quasi-noble. Kemp then teased, coincidence and luck are also part of strength. To celebrate Zack's successful entry into the student union, I will bring something good for everyone at the next gathering. Someone asked in confusion, something good? Kemp chuckled, this good thing can't be brought in. So, I suggest that the next gathering be held outside the city of Pernus. Something good that can't be brought into Pernus? Zack instinctively felt that something was not right, and he glanced at the others at the gathering from the corner of his eye. They seemed normal and did not find it strange. It seemed that this group had left the city for gatherings more than once. A noble young lady complained, Oh, by the light of the gods, do we have to go outside the city again? I don't want to go too far, and besides, I want to go home and sleep in on the weekend. Alphine stared suspiciously at Kemp, this time, it's not something from your estate again, is it? Last time, you boasted so much, and in the end, it was just a funny blue slime. That blue slime is a mutant. It can dissolve fabric without harming human skin. He argued, isn't that amazing? I don't think such a vulgar creature is worth seeing. Alphine's expression was extremely cold. I think it's not bad. A male nobleman said enthusiastically, the process of a female slave struggling inside the slime, gradually tearing her clothes and not harming her skin, is very enticing. After watching it, the desire to have the slave at night is much stronger than usual. The noble young lady snorted, I think it's just like Alphine, not interesting at all. The students were divided on Kemp's proposal. Don't worry, this time it's not a common thing like a slime. I guarantee in the name of the nobility that it won't disappoint anyone. Kemp hurriedly shouted, turning to Zack, Zack, you will definitely be interested, this good thing is related to the elves. Related to the elves? Zack revealed a hint of curiosity. The area outside the city was not as safe as the protected area between the academy and the city of Pernus. After a moment of thought, he said, it's better to decline just to be safe. Zack, you can go. At this moment, the calm voice of the pink insect suddenly popped into his mind. Senior? Zack asked in a low voice that only he could hear, is it not a trap? Will it help you? After saying this, she did not respond further. Zack furrowed his brow slightly. He vaguely sensed that the state of the pink insect seemed somewhat unusual. You can go. Suddenly, the noble lady closest to him turned her head towards him and calmly said the same words as the pink insect. Ha! Huh? Before Zack could react, everyone present, including the chubby camp and the blonde girl Alphonsine, remained motionless and turned their heads towards him, emotionless and mechanically saying, You can go. You can go. You can go. Zack widened his eyes and instinctively took a step back, which caused a more intense change, the chairs and tables around him, the clothes and skin of the people, and even the ceiling and floor all cracked open with sinister black cracks. Countless cracks of various sizes twisted into mouths and surged towards Zack, monotonously and uniformly repeating, You can go. You can go. You can go. Zack suddenly woke up, and at the same time, he clearly heard his own mouth open and distinctly say, You can go. Good. Kemp saw Zack's reaction and immediately gained some confidence. Of course, the location is still the same. Those who want to attend the next gathering can raise their hands. Including Zack, about a dozen people raised their hands. Alphonsine initially had no apparent interest, but after seeing Zack raise his hand, she hesitated for a moment and also raised her hand. Young man, what are you doing? The pink insect in his origin was frantic, jumping around and shouting, this gathering looks problematic at first glance, why are you suddenly so reckless? There's no protection outside the city. Young man, can you hear me? Hey! Zack did not respond to her, but instead stared blankly at his raised right hand. In the lively atmosphere of the crowd's discussion, the palm of his right hand suddenly turned towards himself, the flesh split open, and a dark, gaping smile appeared, you can go, Zack. After a brief moment of dizziness, Zack opened his eyes again. Besides the main goal of expanding and strengthening our gathering, we usually research some strange things. Sometimes, because of the nature of certain things, we do need to leave the city. Don't worry, Zack, when we leave the city, we usually have bodyguards with us. He was discussing something with Alphonsine. It seemed to be the content of this underground group's gathering. Zack reluctantly nodded. You seem a little uncomfortable? Alphonsine looked puzzled. Do you need me to check on you? Or should I help you to the school doctor? Did I just fall asleep? No, you didn't. Alphonsine looked increasingly suspicious. Weren't you just vying for the position of deputy? I even agreed to it, and now you've suddenly changed like a different person. She suddenly froze. Rest well, Zack. She turned and left. Don't forget the weekend gathering outside the city. Zack's breathing became heavier. He felt his brain throbbing with a headache. No. Now there was only him in the underground warehouse, and Alphonsine, who was climbing the stairs and leaving. As the magical stone lamps gradually went out from far to near, 
the surrounding environment gradually darkened. Darkness was about to engulf him. No! Zack quickly swung his gradually stiffening body joints and ran up the stairs in large strides. The only exit here was the trapdoor of the underground warehouse. Don't go! He stared at Alphonsine's departing figure, staring fixedly at the diminishing light at the exit, shouting anxiously. Don't go! The underground warehouse echoed with heart-wrenching screams, as if there were multiple Zacks screaming at the same time. Zack scrambled up the stairs and threw himself towards the warehouse door. He had an unprecedented premonition that if he couldn't get out, he would be forever trapped in this endless darkness. He will be thoroughly erased. Just as the intense darkness in the basement was about to engulf him, Zack finally jumped out, bathed in a burst of light. Zack gasped heavily, quickly closing the hatch door of the underground warehouse, sealing the darkness inside. He completely relaxed his body, sitting on the ground, too exhausted to even observe his surroundings. When Zack had regained some strength, he reluctantly looked around, only to be surprised to find that this place did not seem to be on the surface, he was still in the center of the underground warehouse. There was no one around. Ah! Uh, Zack's head buzzed as he stared at the fading light in the air. It was becoming weaker and weaker. No! Zack hurriedly reached out, grabbing a hard, block-like object at the center of the fading light. What is this? His expression softened slightly as he opened his palm, revealing a bone-like die lying quietly in his hand, with a large and bright red dot facing him. At the same time, the light completely disappeared, and boundless darkness rushed towards him. Where is the light? Where is my light? Zack stared at the die in his hand, accusingly asking, Did you steal my light? Zack! You can go, but don't go, a neutral voice slowly emanated from the die. Zack's eyes reddened. He suddenly clenched the die, roaring fiercely, Give me back my light! Crack! The die shattered, turning into a pile of powder that flowed from his fingertips. The neutral voice gradually turned into laughter, echoing around Zack, You can go, but don't go. You can go, but don't go. You can go, but don't go. Zack slumped to the ground, gritting his teeth, staring at the encroaching darkness. No, I don't want to stay here. The darkness quickly climbed up his body, completely engulfing him like a liquid. Zack gradually suffocated, No, no. Soon, the underground warehouse submerged in darkness returned to silence. Zack sat on the ground, motionless, clutching his neck with both hands. Suddenly, he turned his head and calmly said, Zack, you can go, but don't go. Inside the dorm room. Master, good night, Floral smiled and said. Good night, Zack turned off the magic stone lamp and closed his eyes. There were still many slaves like Floral, working tirelessly in the factory, plantation, and various parts of the kingdom until their last drop of life and value were squeezed out. Currently, only Floral could be considered to have awakened reluctantly. He pondered. To break the chains of the slaves, they must first be guided to awaken from the brainwashing of the church. Zack couldn't help but think of something else. Ah, I have to go to the gathering outside the city this weekend. I probably have to bring Floral with me. Rita's Snack Shop Today's schedule includes a class with Lon, Zack said as he ate the omelet Rita made, reading the magic paper in his hand, the first class. It seems that not many people have chosen it, the voice of the pink little bug popped up in his mind as usual, I guess you might enjoy one-on-one -on -one education. I would be honored, Zack said with a hint of sarcasm. Since he found out that he could enter the student council, it was a series of coincidences caused by the school director at Lon's request, combined with Lon's past relationship with Yar, that he probably knew what was going on. More or less, Lon was the chess piece supporting him placed by the god in the academy. At this point, the pink little bug hesitated and asked, Young man, there's something I want to ask you. Hmm, why did you agree to go to the gathering outside the city? Zack bit into the omelet, letting the fragrant liquid yolk flow into his mouth. I evaluated it and felt that there was indeed some risk, but not too great, he said somewhat ambiguously, if there really is an unexpected situation, I can use my abilities to hide or escape back. If it's a situation that I can't handle at all, it will definitely cause a stir in Puna's port at this level. Still a bit reckless. The pink insect sighed, but since you are confident, I won't stop you. Zack smiled, in the end, the one who has already placed a big bet on me, would they be willing to see me in trouble? Committing suicide is different. Yar and that being obviously aren't the kind to willingly be taken advantage of, to clean up after you, the pink insect said helplessly, if you don't meet their expectations and do something stupid, they might decisively change their attitude towards you, even though they have done a lot for you. It seems that the deity is very clear that sunk costs are not considered costs. Zack sneered and continued to listen to the pink insect's words, of course, it's not ruled out that this step is within his expectations, or even what he expects. Take it step by step. Young man, every step forward now requires extreme caution. You were a bit impatient with Floor before, and you convinced Floor a bit too quickly. 
You must be more careful, Zack said softly, I just used her hidden resentment. He looked at Floor. She and Red Bean were eating at another table, patiently answering Red Bean's questions about dark magic courses. Young man, your willingness to develop her as a companion, to trust her, is also because you are the master of her slave mark, with absolute control and authority over her. You are still using her absolute obedience to you, the pink insect kindly reminded, but if you were to guide other slaves, you wouldn't have this advantage. This behavior itself is very ironic. The master talks about taboo topics of freeing slaves to the slave, just because she is a true comrade and can be trusted. This relationship is built on the control of the master over the slave mark. Zack looked at Floor, his expression becoming even colder, I know. I'll have to find a different way to deal with other slaves. Lawner's first class was an introductory theory class in a regular classroom at the academy. Don't bring slaves to class, Zack said to Floor outside the classroom according to the course requirements. Sorry, Floor, you can go back. No need, Floor said with a natural smile. I'll wait for you on the wooden chair outside the teaching building. Zack didn't insist. He entered the classroom. The huge classroom had only him as a student. He looked at the platform where Lana, with her pink curly hair, was wearing a white shirt and a gray pencil skirt, lazily sitting on the platform, crossing her legs and saying, good, everyone's here. Let's start the class directly, and it will be over sooner. She exuded the aura of a bitter office worker teacher from the inside out. Lana, am I the only student? Yes. I simply scheduled the class times of the other students separately, one-on-one -on -one efficiency will be higher, Lana said lazily, but today, a old friend happened to come to visit me. She wants to give you some advice on your studies. Ah, the surprised voice of the pink insect exploded in Zack's mind. Zack was stunned. He saw a black-haired female swordsman silently push open the front door and greet him with a smile. Hi, missed me? It was indeed Yar. Lana also turned her head in surprise. You two know each other? Yar walked straight up, propping her chin on the platform with one hand, and said contentedly, I've met Zack once, and we seem to have some fate. How do you know everyone? You even have a relationship with that goblin killer. Lonner complained, if I had your social connections, I wouldn't even lose the new weapons. New weapons? Zack keenly noticed this word. And you noticed their respective reactions, smiling even more happily on her face. Don't worry, Zack. I came this time to give you some advice. Advice? Zack coldly stared at Yar, emitting a faint aura of keeping strangers at bay. She spread out her hands, relax, I'm not here to collect debts this time. First, try to contact the hyped cinder of the Thorn family more, if you can establish a friendship with her, that would be best. The Thorn family is involved in the game of the elven tribe, but the innocent elven miss doesn't know. Yar said with a smile, I can't tell you the other reasons for now, I can only say it's very important. Zack quickly understood Yar's meaning. This elven miss was an important way to contact the elven tribe, and her character was easy to control. However, he had already started planning this when he first met Hype. After all, Rita's true identity might be related to the mysterious elven tribe. Yer looked at Zack and raised her eyebrows, it seems my previous warning wasn't in vain. Do you like to remind others in a sneaky way? Zack frowned slightly, even if you tell me now that the elven tribe may have lost a princess, it wouldn't make a difference in efficiency. It does. Yer said straightforwardly, if I told you now, there might be unexpected situations. What do you mean? She maintained a smile on her face, but sighed slightly, you should have guessed, not every deity watching you wants you to become a god. Zack suddenly realized something. Regarding the abnormality of his and Rita's origins, he had boldly made a certain guess, the hidden authority of the deity level. It seems it really is related to the gods. Zack shrugged and continued to listen to Yar's narrative. Second, make good use of the old woman. I gave her to you, not just as an encyclopedia and guide for you. The pink little bug in Zack's mind was immediately stunned, huh? Yar's smile on her face became even more charming. I guess the old woman has already stimulated you inside your body. However, if she wants to hate me, let her continue to hate me. After all, she is useless to me. If she wasn't useful to you, I would have gotten rid of her long ago. You scoundrel. The pink little bug jumped angrily. You, you with a head full of crap. Laner said casually on the side, is it okay for me to hear these secrets? It's okay. You are one of the few people in the world that I can trust. Yar casually reached out her right hand and placed it on Laner's shoulder. When I was unstable and both mentally and physically immature, you helped me a lot. Laner shook her head. I still prefer the way you were a few years ago, a bit more humane than now. Oh. Her right hand suddenly pinched the flesh on Laner's shoulder. Yar acted as if nothing had happened and turned to Zack. So, during your time at the academy, you should listen to Laner's lessons seriously. Not only mastering upper-level magic or super-level magic, but the learning process will also greatly benefit the growth of your elven abilities. 
Elven abilities? Laner's face showed a curious expression again, but the two didn't explain to her. If you're interested, you can communicate more with Zack in the future, Yar said casually. Her smile faded, and she said coldly, Third, be careful of the Soros family, be careful of their members. Zack didn't hide his surprise, why? Yar should be clear about the situation between him and Hongo, so, it was reasonable for him to show some surprise. They are not the help arranged for you by the gods. Yar squinted slightly, they are your enemies. I know you can't cut off the relationship all at once, so, you'd better gradually reduce contact with members of the Soros until you completely reject her. Do you want to sever ties with Red Bean? Zack thought for a moment and asked, is it related to the game? Yar nodded gently, yes. Finally, regarding the issue of slave liberation and the goblin tribe, I will stay in Puna's port to assist you. Even this is known. Zack subconsciously said, is this the request from that existence to you? Yar did not immediately answer his question, but a warm smile appeared on her face. She stood up and paced back and forth in the classroom. This is your request, Zack. Zack said coldly, I don't remember making such a request to you. It doesn't matter. By the way, according to the plan, I was supposed to arrive at Puna's port in another week. Yar continued to pace, do you know why I sped up and arrived early? Before Zack could respond, she added, there has been a divine battle on your body. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Laner and the pink bug in his mind spoke in unison, questioning. Of course, it's not a real divine battle, otherwise you would have been wiped out long ago, and the entire Puna's port would have been buried with you. Yar showed a rare expression of headache, the destined trajectory almost deviated, fortunately the Lord God was prepared early. Zack suddenly didn't know what to say. He vaguely remembered experiencing something, but, don't try to remember. Yar suddenly said sharply, you are not qualified to bear it now. Although it was daytime, Zack gradually heard whispers in his ears, male and female, like meaningless murmurs. The murmurs grew louder until they drowned out all other sounds. The bodies of Laner and Yar in front of him began to glow, becoming whiter and whiter. Everything was merging into pure white. All anomalies disappeared. Something was placed in Zack's hand at the same moment. He looked down and saw a bone die lying quietly in his palm. The number facing up was six. Phew. Yar, who had placed the die in Zack's hand, breathed a sigh of relief. You really should thank the die. Now, it has saved you more than once. Is that so? Zack looked at the die in his hand with some confusion. Although there was still a faint sense of familiarity, it was just an ordinary bone die. Yar's face remained calm, and her already pale face became even paler. Take it. That's all the advice I have to give. I've delayed some of your class time. You won't blame me, will you? She decisively turned and left, leaving Zack and Laner behind. Laner looked at him without surprise. Zack, how are you? Young man, are you okay? The pink bug in his mind looked worried. I'm fine. Zack breathed a sigh of relief. Shall we start the class now? Okay. At noon, Laner and Yar were dining in a private room at a high-end members-only restaurant for nobles. After setting up a sound barrier, they chatted for a while, and the conversation naturally turned to Zack. Yar, is Zack also a chosen one? Laner put down her chopsticks and said with some concern. More than that. Yar said lightly. He's on your side, isn't he? Yes. Laner's expression gradually became firm. Then I must teach him well. Laner's course is indeed very helpful to me. Zack and Four sat in a student restaurant, reviewing the details of the last class. After using various attributes of magic separately, Laner, with her pink curly hair, pointed out the shortcomings in the flow and efficiency of magic in his body, patiently helping him adjust the key magic nodes in his body. In addition to divine magic and shadow magic, you need to practice your other attribute magic daily, and you must follow the template I have corrected. Laner wore a pair of silver-framed glasses and meticulously instructed, advanced magic and even super-advanced magic have very high requirements for the basics. If there are any small flaws in any aspect, your learning process will be twice as difficult, and even if you manage to learn, it's very easy to cause a backlash. I will heed your teachings, Zack sincerely saluted. Of course, if you can break through to become a superior race, learning advanced magic will be much easier. So, for ordinary people, I would directly advise against learning it, and wait until becoming a silver level adventurer or a superior race before learning it. After all, with your great talent, you can try to learn advanced magic first, and mastering it will also help you break through to become a superior race, Laner added. Ordinary superior races and silver level adventurers are all built on resources. You don't have those conditions, so you can only find another way. Teacher, how did you become a silver level adventurer and master super advanced magic? Zack asked curiously. Laner seemed to have no strong background or support from any nobility. She didn't seem interested in answering immediately. That's a long story. 
I'll tell you when the time is right in the future. Master, why aren't you going to read his snack shop for lunch today? Zack's thoughts were interrupted. Before Florel got up to help Zack order, she asked him in confusion. Zack replied calmly, I'm tired after a morning of classes. I don't want to run so far. The voice of the pink bug popped up in his mind, young one, is it because of red bean? Watching Florel leave, Zack lowered his head, yes. Senior, do you think I should follow all of Yar's advice? He was well aware that Red Bean couldn't betray him, but the strange blood of the Soros family did make him wary. The pink bug hesitated for a moment. I'm sorry, I don't know, her voice trembled slightly, I really can't tell. I'm a useless senior, young one, I'm sorry, I'm of no use to you when you need me the most. She remembered Zack's unusual behavior when he attended the underground group meeting before. Combining Yar's words, she truly understood what had happened to Zack and she couldn't do anything, not even qualify to discover the god's war. I don't know either, Zack also felt somewhat strange about himself. After so much experience, his inner self was still as calm as still water, and he could still analyze calmly. In the end, when did I ask Yar to come and help me? To assist in freeing the slaves and goblins. Why was I so focused on freeing the slaves? At this moment, the dice in his pocket slightly heated up, and the confusion in Zack's eyes disappeared. This is the best choice, that's all. He said firmly from the bottom of his heart. Young one, the voice of the pink bug lowered. Let's change the subject. Yar also said to make good use of me. In that case, she at least hasn't discovered that I was originally the guiding light source for you, and thinks I'm just your guide. Zack's eyes suddenly lit up. I'm afraid the key is here. Senior, you are not what Yar initially said. You are not just useful for surveillance. She should already know, no, as the one who exists as the keeper, she must know that there is a light source within me. It was she who restored my body and implanted you into my source, and I had already gained divine resistance, with an extremely weak light source within me. I guess at that time, she had already discovered the light source. It's just because the goblin slayer and others were present, Yar didn't say much, and only said that you were only capable of surveillance. The pink bug was puzzled, I am indeed not a qualified insect, I cannot control the host. But if it's as you said, then doesn't she know that I will help guide the light source within you? This plan is designed very well. Zack couldn't help but feel, so she told you to advise me not to seclude myself and to go to school? Yes, the pink little bug admitted, the reason I agreed at the time was that if young people want to become stronger and have a thirst for knowledge, they should indeed go to school. It makes sense, Zack said, so, she told me again today to make good use of you. Senior, this means that both you and I have overlooked your own potential. We should continue to dig deep in the direction of the source of light. Let's work together in the future, okay? Okay. At dinner, Zack and Four did not go to Rita's snack shop. Hmm, why didn't Dad and Four come? Red Bean lay listlessly on the dining table, staring at the message Zack sent on the magic paper. He said he was busy today and didn't explain what he was doing specifically. Rita, still wearing her apron, comforted her, Zack has always been very hardworking. Maybe he's busy with his studies today and doesn't have time to come to such a remote place. Don't worry, Zack must have important matters to attend to. Let's be understanding for now. Meow Red Bean's mood didn't improve much. Under the same night sky, Zack was discussing the out-of-town arrangements for the weekend with Kemp, Alphine, and others, glancing in the direction of the snack shop. He understood that he couldn't avoid facing Red Bean's problem. The next day, Zack hurried over to explain the arrangements for the past two days to Rita and bid her farewell. Aren't you going to say goodbye to Red Bean? Rita asked with some concern. She didn't even go back to the dormitory yesterday and has been waiting for you. I was the one who finally carried her upstairs when she couldn't hold on any longer. Zack glanced upstairs indifferently, forget it, let her have a good sleep. I'll bring something for her and for you as compensation when I come back. Dear Zack, although studies are important, you should also relax properly. Rita tiptoed and gently touched his forehead, stuffing snacks and water into his backpack. I feel like you've been a little tense these past few days. It's nothing. Zack waved his hand, can I leave now? Rita smiled gently and shouted loudly. You and Four must be careful. I will not disappoint the lady's expectations. Four stood at the door and made an elegant salute. The two finally joined the nobles and set off on their journey. The pampered noble children did not choose to take a carriage out of the city. They dressed similarly to ordinary people and walked in groups on the main street. Their slaves and bodyguards were dressed in plain clothes, blending into the crowd. If it were a convoy of a dozen luxurious carriages, it would be too ostentatious to leave the city. The blonde Alphine walked up to Zack and said, This is a secret operation, so you'll have to adapt. Zack shrugged, I have no problem at all. Why don't you worry more about Kemp? The chubby Kemp panted, It's okay. When you see the good stuff, 
You'll understand that the current hard work is worth it. He seemed impatient about it. A faint unease turned into a small ripple, rippling in Zack's heart. He furrowed his brow imperceptibly, but his expression quickly returned to calm. Zack felt the bone dice in his pocket seem to be heating up again. He took it out and held it in his hand, but found nothing unusual. The dice didn't heat up, it just retained his body temperature and quickly cooled in the autumn breeze. The number facing Zack was six. Oh, brother Zack likes to gamble? Kemp's eyes lit up, then you must like the old place. We're going to a tavern outside the city with an attached gambling den. A gambling den. Zack sighed. He had his first encounter with the dice and had a strange dream near a gambling den. After leaving the city, under the leadership of Kemp and others, the group successfully arrived at the old place. This is a three-story tavern located on the main road, mainly serving passing merchants, and businesses booming. On the door, specially made colored magic stone lamps of different shapes form the italicized words old place. Is it really called old place? The pink bug in the mind commented. This tavern is backed by the Hygric family, which is also my family, so it can stand outside the unprotected city for a long time, Alphonsine introduced to Zach. As long as we study illegal things, we will come here to gather. The waiter at the door obviously knew this group of students. After a few words with the leader Alphonsine, he arranged for the servants to lead them inside. After passing through the bustling first floor of the tavern, the nobles passed through a hidden door and went straight down the spiral staircase. They arrived at the underground casino, which was even more lively than the first floor. Gamblers were clamoring, 20 points. I won. Again. I bet 79 gold coins. They continued down, winding through the maze-like corridors, and finally entered an inconspicuous room. This area is generally used for black market transactions, Alphonsine said to Zack. There may be followers of the dark lurking around, so be careful and don't wander. Zack calmly asked, providing a trading place for followers of the dark, aren't you afraid of falling? We won't check the beliefs of the trading parties or forcibly search them, Alphonsine said with a matter-of-fact expression. Otherwise, there would be no need for a black market at all. The black market itself may not see the light, but that doesn't mean it's evil. For example, a merchant sympathizes with the poor and obtains expensive discounted magic medicine formulas through the black market channels, mass-produces generic drugs, and sells them cheaply to the poor through the black market. This behavior is obviously illegal. But can you say that the merchant is not a devout believer of the light god? Does he have to be forced to fall? The meaning of the black market lies in this. The pink bug added leisurely, the merchant is doing something illegal, but he firmly believes it is for the benefit of the poor. This is a typical case of sacrificing small righteousness for greater righteousness, so it will not be recognized as fallen by the world rules. Zack nodded thoughtfully, speaking of which, Kemp wanted to violate me before, but he didn't fall either. Kemp's forehead suddenly broke out in a small sweat, I was just joking with you, if you don't want to, I definitely won't do it, but Zack, my brother. Zack teased, I was just joking with you too, just educating you. The two looked at each other and laughed heartily with the other nobles, easing the atmosphere. Zack understood that his nature was that of a goblin, belonging to an evil creature. For Kemp, let alone violating, even if he killed himself on the spot, it would not trigger a fall, provided he could do it. But Kemp only knew he was an elf, and theoretically it was impossible for him to do such a foolish thing, and Alphonsine also thought so. Therefore, his reckless behavior was beyond Alphonsine's expectations and became a bargaining chip in Zack's hands. It seems that Kemp's actions at the time were likely influenced. For himself, Zack would not be bound by the fallen rule. He was not on the side of good, so how could he talk about falling? The pink bug seemed to see through Zack's thoughts and said softly, young man, the nobles will also find many ways to bypass the world rules judgment to avoid their beliefs being forcibly changed. They have done a lot of bad things because of this. Zack nodded slightly in response. They sat in high-backed chairs, with silent slaves standing beside them, until a masked person pushed a small cart covered with black cloth into the room. Zack's eyes suddenly widened. He smelled a special and familiar smell, it's actually. Master Kemp, the things have been cleaned in advance. After the masked man bowed to the fat Kemp, he stepped aside. At this moment, everyone's eyes were focused on the cage. Kemp raised his head high, walked up and tore open the black cloth. Inside was a naked humanoid cub with wrinkled green skin all over its body. It was lying in a big shape, seemingly sound asleep. Damn! Some noble children exclaimed. Except for Zack, everyone present had never seen a goblin before. Kemp's face showed a proud expression. How about it? This time, I brought a live goblin cub for you. Alphonsine's eyes widened unconsciously. Where did you get this from? I remember that the ones in the wild have been almost killed by goblin slayers and other adventurers. This shouldn't be wild, right? 
It's confidential, Kemp observed the surprised expressions of the crowd with intoxication, and said proudly, this thing can't be brought into the city at all, so I suggested having the gathering outside the city. You're not afraid of death, a noble lady covered her mouth in astonishment. What's there to be afraid of if you're not making friends with goblins? Kemp said with pleasure, after today's gathering, it will be neutralized by my people. Alphonsine stared at the lower body of the goblin cub, half curious and half disgusted, and said, is this really just a cub? Guess why goblins have such strong reproductive abilities? A nobleman joked, hey, Kemp, can you arrange a female slave to demonstrate on the spot like the previous slime? Kemp shook his head, I tried before, but this cub is too small. Although it can barely stand up, it's not hard enough. The nobleman's face showed a disappointed expression, all right. Alphonsine took out a small notebook, squatted in front of the cage, and made notes around the goblin cub. Lord Heydrich is really serious, he always takes notes. The noble lady stared fascinatedly at Alphonsine's squatting figure. Kemp turned his head. Zack, do you know why I said I had a connection with you before? Look at its ears. He reached out and pointed to the goblin in the cage, they are pointed just like elves. It is said that goblins were originally a kind of elf goblin, but because they angered the gods, they were punished and turned into evil creatures, becoming the ugly appearance they are now, Alphonsine quickly turned around and said loudly, Kemp, don't compare the lowly and evil goblins with the noble elves. These two cannot be mentioned in the same breath. She was afraid that Kemp's careless words would offend Zack, who was an elf. Kemp was stunned for a moment, I was just casually talking about the legend of goblins, who would really equate the handsome Zack with the ugly goblins. Right, my good brother Zack? He had a pleasing smile on his face. Zack looked at the goblin cub in the cage and said naturally, I am broad-minded and don't mind. Good, indeed a prospective noble, different from those narrow-minded elves. A male nobleman cheered, you will surely accomplish great things in the future. The noble lady curiously said, it has been sleeping all this time, can we make it move? Sure, Kemp lifted his foot and kicked the cart hard. The goblin cub's body slammed into the cage and suddenly woke up. It looked blankly at the noble's present, and suddenly locked its gaze on Zack. King. The goblin cub stuttered out a goblin word. Zack's head buzzed, and his body trembled imperceptibly. What did it say? Alphonsine, who was taking notes, was stunned. Except for Zack, no one present understood goblin language. King? Does it already know that I have the talent of a goblin king? Could this cub identify? No, it couldn't possibly be of the superior race. Zack's brain was in a mess, staring blankly at the goblin cub. It crawled over on all fours, grabbed the iron cage, and laboriously said to Zack, the only elf is the king. Kemp also noticed something was wrong. Zack, why is it staring at you and seems to be talking to you all the time? Can you understand it? Zack quickly adjusted his expression to normal and calmly said, when I was still an adventurer, I took on a mission to eliminate goblins and roughly learned goblin language, so I can understand a little bit. I was surprised just now because it said that elves are considered close relatives of goblins, and it is the goblin king. This cub asked me to save it and give it 500 gold coins, and after the deed is done, it will appoint me as the goblin general. Everyone present burst into laughter. Good joke. What's the real meaning? Alphonsine asked with interest. It wants to eat me, Zack said with open hands. Everyone burst into laughter again. Kemp, how did you turn into a goblin? Kemp scratched his head and chuckled, this shows that Zack's appearance is indeed very charming, even a goblin that only likes females can be swayed. Zack resumed his serious expression, so, I need to talk to it and correct its thoughts, not like Kemp. He asked in goblin language, who told you? Goblin. Sage. The goblin cub's head lowered. Zack's pupils slightly dilated again. This news was like a bombshell. Ah, uh, sage? Goblin sage? The pink insect that had been silently observing couldn't help but exclaim, this kind of goblin hasn't appeared in a long time. Where did you come from? Zack hurriedly asked, are there any other goblin brethren? The goblin cub's hands trembled as it said intermittently, human estate. Enslaved, us. Kin, slaves, abused, dead. Goblin, needs, king. Save us. Zack's palms were slightly sweaty. He maintained a calm expression and naturally said to everyone present, I just gave it some ideological education. It has bowed its head in apology and knows it shouldn't learn from Kemp. Alphonsine asked, what did you say? In short, just one word, get lost. His response was met with laughter and sporadic applause. Zack smiled and thanked everyone, while his brain was rapidly thinking, in the human estate, there is a group of enslaved goblins, among them is a goblin sage. Kemp mentioned that his family has many estates outside of Puna's port. Could it be in one of Kemp's family estates? The goblin cub in the cage watched Zack's movements and suddenly began to bow, please, save me, king, save me, king, I don't want to die. 
Zack's figure visibly hesitated for a moment. He stared expressionlessly at the goblin cub that kept bowing. Suddenly, the chaotic murmurs sounded in Zack's ears again. This time, different voices gradually overlapped and became extremely clear. Zack, for your brethren, you cannot stand by and do nothing. With the goblin cub's feet as the center, the floor turned white and spread rapidly, dyeing everything around it pure white, almost touching Zack. The nobles who were still laughing ignored it. You cannot stand by and do nothing. I cannot stand by and do nothing. Zack murmured in goblin language, about to step into the pure white area. Young man, don't save him. The pink insect noticed his actions and shouted, you will be exposed. But her voice couldn't reach Zack's ears at this moment. At that moment, the dice in Zack's pocket heated up again. He quickly stabilized and looked coldly at the goblin cub. I'm sorry, Zack said in goblin language. The goblin cub stopped moving. The light in its eyes disappeared, leaving only a deep despair. Zack then explained to others in the common language, this goblin cub still hasn't given up, crazily craving my body. Alphonsine was stunned, so. I have completely extinguished its hope, Zack said calmly. After the party, Zack found Kemp alone and took him to a secluded room to talk. I'm curious about this goblin cub. Where did you get it from? Kemp shook his head, I can't say, that's my bottom line. Zack frowned slightly, then suddenly had a feeling and took out the dice. He let it spin in his hand. 6. Kemp's eyes momentarily filled with confusion. He said, somewhat puzzled, it's, it's from my family's estate. Next time, can you find an opportunity to take me there alone? I'm interested in goblins, Zack said lightly. Kemp suddenly woke up and firmly shook his head, absolutely not. Zack rolled the dice again. Still six. Okay, okay, Kemp's eyes returned to confusion, next time, find an opportunity, I'll take you alone. When the two returned to the others, Kemp acted as if nothing had happened, with a smug expression on his face, guess what Zack and I just did. Someone joked, did you ask him to help you clear your bowels? Your mother. Now it was the free time for the noble youths. Some went to the underground casino, while others brought along many toys and processed the in-check-in procedures with the slaves. Zack noticed that the iron cage containing the goblin cub was nowhere to be seen. Kemp's men had disposed of it. It's already dead. He muttered to himself. This is an unavoidable sacrifice, Zack, a somewhat familiar, neutral voice suddenly emerged from his pocket. Zack was suddenly stunned. He reached into his pocket and took out the ordinary dice. At this moment, the pink insect in his mind comforted him, young one, this is not your fault. It seems the elder didn't hear that strange voice. Only he could hear it? Zack silently nodded and went upstairs. Florel followed closely behind. He arrived at the brightly lit underground casino and scanned the twisting women and the frantic gamblers. It was a good time to test. Zack stood next to a gambler and spun the dice in his hand. 6. He and the impatient gambler looked at the cylindrical dice box in the center of the table, staring as the dealer opened it, ah damn. The gambler shouted in disappointment, pounding the table, it's just a little bit off. I don't accept it, let's go again. Zack raised an eyebrow. Could it be that the dice only worked for himself? He threw a gold coin, at least one gold coin was required to participate in a game, and spun the dice. Still six. In front of everyone, Zack said to the dealer, I'll also play around. The result was obvious. He also lost. Zack decisively left the table, sat in a corner, and carefully examined the dice in his hand. Florel couldn't help but speak, if the master wants to win, I can use a sacrificial spell to help you get some luck. I'm just curious to try, no need to trouble you. On the gambling table, the real winner is only the dealer, Zack said casually. He had already tested that the dice's numbers only worked in special circumstances. And the special circumstances were most likely the key points on his destiny's trajectory. The existence of using dice to ensure that I can smoothly act according to the predetermined fate trajectory. Zack muttered helplessly in his heart, I am currently being controlled, and the situation is actually no different from being a puppet. No, the dice in his hand suddenly spoke. Hmm. Zack stared at the dice, you can speak again? No, 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 Zack subconsciously widened his eyes. The entire underground casino was filled with neutral voices, overlapping and overwhelming all other noises. Not only the one in his hand, all the dice were speaking. Unconsciously, everything around him had frozen. Fleur's concerned expression froze on her face, a cheering gambler with arms raised, praising the god of light, had not yet had the chance to speak. The world once again turned into a photograph, depicting the scene of the casino's intoxicating and dreamy life. This familiar scene. Again? Zack exclaimed. Are you going to make me roll the dice to decide someone's fate again? At this moment, he heard the sound of clattering. Something small began to tremble, sway, and roll. 
One after another, dice of various shapes rolled off the gambling table, jumped out of people's hands, and sprang out after opening the dice box. Their numbers visibly increased, and their appearances became increasingly bizarre. Some emerged from the gambler's nostrils, some emerged from the magic stone lamps, and some forcibly squeezed out from the cracks in the walls. The dice turned into an ocean, submerging everything and rushing towards Zack. Zack still couldn't move. He stared fixedly as countless dice climbed onto his body, until they obscured his vision. In his ears, countless cold voices simultaneously exploded, instantly piercing through his entire body. Zack, this is a story you have personally opened. A well-trained plainclothes team was quickly heading towards the direction of the Old Place Tavern. They formed a neat formation and sprinted on the main road, while pedestrians and carriages ignored them. Soon, they entered an inconspicuous abandoned building, dispersing into different rooms and overlooking the brightly lit Old Place Tavern. This mission is to bury the Old Place Tavern, the leader of the silver-ranked adventurers said in a low voice. His hands brushed his waist and then grasped two daggers inlaid with black agate. What about the unrelated individuals other than the target elf? This is a necessary sacrifice, the silver-ranked adventurer responded without hesitation, there will be no chance after the official start of the game of the gods. Tonight is an unprecedented opportunity and also the last chance. Hey, good evening, everyone, a calm female voice suddenly came from behind them. The muscles on the face of the silver-ranked adventurer suddenly tensed. He quickly turned around, ready to stab the newcomer with the dagger. The other plainclothes also raised their weapons or held onto their spells in an instant. Their attacking movements stopped. So it's a follower of the God of Light, the silver-ranked adventurer breathed a sigh of relief, has the church also sent someone this time? The visitor was a kind-looking woman named Yar. She was dressed in a revealing black nun's outfit, with a large expanse of snow-white skin exposed on her chest and her split hem unable to cover her smooth thighs. On the nun's outfit, the central white stripe, due to its position at the navel, did not bend with the curves of the body, forming a pure white cross when viewed from the front. She had no weapons in her hands. The existence of the Moon Mother, who holds the secret authority, means that her followers not only have no hidden whereabouts, but also cannot detect others approaching, Yer said with a light laugh, you guys can't do it. The silver-ranked adventurer remained unfazed, it's enough. The target elf does not have the strength of the superior race. It's your belief in the God of Light that, if the so-called leader of the gods had won earlier, we wouldn't have to work overtime now. Yar smiled mysteriously, clasped her hands devoutly over her chest, and said, he did win indeed. A plainclothes sneered, the followers of the light god have always been like this, with nothing but a hard mouth. The silver-ranked adventurer couldn't be bothered to say anything more, you better not disrupt our plans, just watch. He suddenly realized something was amiss. It was almost time, but the plainclothes in the next room seemed to have been silent all along. Yar's smile became even more charming, oh, I forgot to tell you, your subordinates are quite useful. The air in the room froze for a second. The silver-ranked adventurer and Yar quietly locked eyes, their brains seemingly working at lightning speed. He suddenly stepped back, and the dagger drew a circle in the air, and a brilliant starry night poured out from the circle, like a colorful black, directly attacking Yar. You traitor, attacking your own allies, aren't you afraid of falling? The silver-ranked adventurer roared. Yar did not move, just smiled faintly, just like your plan to kill everyone at the old place, this is all necessary sacrifice. Just as the dazzling darkness was about to engulf her, Yar's figure disappeared. She can instantly move without chanting. The silver-ranked adventurer's expression suddenly changed, quickly turning around and drawing a circle with the dagger around himself. The colorful darkness immediately surged back to his side, rotating along the circle, protecting him inside. In just a moment, the other plainclothes didn't even have time to react, their eyes becoming empty and lifeless, you're swiftly shuttled around them and released white insects to eat their brains. Attack! She finally sat on the windowsill, crossing her legs at the silver-ranked adventurer. The plainclothes immediately launched an attack on the silver-ranked adventurer. More controlled plainclothes opened the door and joined in the attack. The rotating colorful darkness seemed to have a spirit, actively devouring all kinds of spells and weapons, leaving no trace. Beast! He gritted his teeth, it turns out to be a legacy of the eastern continent. Protected by the strange darkness, the silver-ranked adventurer raised two daggers high and suddenly stabbed the ground. Several overlapping magical runes spread out from the dagger, emitting a strange black light, his movements suddenly stopped. The silver-ranked adventurer looked incredulously at his stiff and unresponsive body. When did the petrification curse happen? No, it couldn't have been the nun. The colorful black darkness lost control and fell to the ground. The attacks of many plainclothes rained down on him. At the same time, Yer stood up, reached into the void, and pulled out a transparent greatsword burning with black-purple flames. The greatsword chopped down, vertically splitting the controlled silver-ranked adventurer in half. 
The black purple flames quickly spread to his whole body, instantly turning him into ashes. It's over, Yar smiled, Lon, thanks for the petrification curse just now. Only a transcendent mage can unleash the curse with such power. A pink-haired Lon yawned, wearing a pink plush pajamas, walking out of the shadows. I almost arrived late, luckily I can teleport from a distance, few her gaze focused on the two daggers in the ashes, the petrification curse cost me quite a bit of money. I'll take these daggers as payment. Yar casually said, very well. I'll take these loyal subordinates. She scattered some yellow long bugs, similar in appearance to mealworms. This group of mealworms swarmed towards the pile of ashes, devouring them clean, revealing a pile of gold coins and a few gems. These are mine too. Lan unceremoniously squatted down, sweeping them away, since we're done here, I'll go back to continue sleeping. Yar's smile remained unchanged, good. Sweet dreams, dear Lan Lan lazily nodded. She silently recited a spell, her body spinning, and a huge magic circle appeared under her feet, and half a second later, her figure disappeared. Yar glanced around at the plainclothes officer standing by and said disdainfully, the current god of light is nothing more than a despicable usurper from outside. He is not worthy to be compared with the god of light whom I believe in. In another direction, many plainclothes officers were also secretly approaching the old place tavern. The leader instructed his subordinates, we only need to attract the protectors of the target spirit, while another team of silver-ranked adventurers is responsible for infiltrating and killing the target spirit. It's almost time, get ready. 3, 2. Dozens of long, red and white intertwined objects flew into the sky and pierced the plainclothes hiding in the corners and on the rooftops. They were blood spears that automatically tracked the enemy. The flesh magic of the upper demon race. The leader shouted. The plainclothes quickly deployed the shadow magic formation, chanted spells, and disappeared into the darkness. Great dark god, the endless darkness is your sacred territory, and you will not allow the invasion of heretics. Please guide me to hunt down the heretics. Lying on a distant rooftop, lowly merchant no. One raised the freshly prepared human head and quickly chanted incantations. The flesh on the head instantly dissolved, leaving only a skull with dark flames burning in its eye sockets. A pure black halo perfectly blended into the night and spread outwards. The figures of the plainclothes emerged one by one from the hiding darkness, each surrounded by a bright white mark. Not good. The plainclothes quickly chanted spells, attempting to use holy magic to counter the blood spears, but it was too late. The blood spears accelerated directly towards their targets, piercing many plainclothes with precision, draining their flesh and turning them into skeletons wearing human skin. The blood spears then expanded and transformed into humanoid forms, gradually growing black skin and wings, they had transformed into mindless lower demons. Several leaders promptly released holy magic orbs to counter the blood spears, and the plainclothes who had not been marked from a distance escaped and scathed. However, they still had not discovered where the upper demon race that launched the attack was hiding. We cannot defeat the upper demon race. The leaders immediately reached a consensus, if we fail, so be it. For the greater good. As soon as the words were spoken, another black halo slowly unfolded. Its range was enormous, completely marking the positions of everyone. The lower demons spread their wings, wielding bone swords transformed from human skin skeletons, dripping with blood, and charged towards the plainclothes, at the same time, more blood spears formed a torrential blood rain, descending upon the positions of the plainclothes. They once again chanted holy magic spells, only to find that they could not cast anything. We have no magic power left. What's going on? One leader hesitated for a moment and threw out the only golden spherical object in his hand. Holy Grenade! A huge light burst forth from the grenade, turning into a dazzling pure white sun, rising slowly. The holy light engulfed the entire area, turning it into a pure white ocean. The distant lowly merchant quickly turned and ran, but she could not outrun the spreading holy light. Is it already daytime? Why is the sun rising outside? A holy magic explosion? In the late night, the old place tavern and other places were suddenly bustling, and merchants and gamblers all ran out onto the streets. The rising white sun hung in the air, illuminating the thick, low-hanging clouds, evaporating all the blood spears and lower demons in the sky. Yer stood behind the window, gazing from a distance at the rising sun, across many blocks. Just as we temporarily joined forces with the believers of darkness, the god of light church, although not directly arranging personnel this time, has also supported our temporary allies. It's a good thing. She glanced around at the puppet plainclothes and looked towards the position where the silver-ranked adventurer had been burned to death, narrowing her eyes. Now that the ground plan has failed, as the mother of the hidden goddess, how will you play your next move? Before the game officially begins, this is your last chance. After the tremor of the sacred hand grenade, the underground casino descended into chaos. As the gamblers and the dealer fled, they did not forget to gather their belongings. Floor. 
Alphonsine and a group of nobles rushed out from the underground black market area and saw the red-haired maid standing by the wall. They quickly took her hand and said, What are you standing here for? If something happens to you, I won't be able to explain to your master, Rita, and Miss Soros. Fleur hesitated for a moment, I. It's chaotic outside, the pink insect whispered in her ear, two groups of people are fighting. I also sensed the presence of the upper class race. Fortunately, they are not coming for us. Fleur, join the chaotic crowd, and we'll sneak out. Okay, Fleur's eyes flashed with confusion. They joined the disheveled nobles and, escorted by bodyguards and waiters, escaped through a hidden passage from the tavern. The little sun became a signal, igniting the battle outside the city of Pernus. The followers of the Dark Existence continuously emerged from the shadows and fought fiercely with the followers of the Mother of the Moon who came to support. Despite being greatly weakened by the light of the Holy, the fanatical devotees showed no fear. Many devotees cut off their fingers, shaved off their flesh, inserted inverted crosses into their bodies, and even cut off their own or others' heads, setting off one sacrifice after another. We beseech the dark origin of the universe, the supreme god of destruction. We offer our sincere blood sacrifice. They were well aware that launching an attack outside the strong city of Pernus, even if they survived the current battle, would be difficult to escape the subsequent pursuit. Therefore, almost all ordinary devotees had given up hope of survival from the beginning. They would release their pain and madness completely tonight. Lowly merchant no. One was too close to the little sun, and even if she ran frantically, it was too late. Just as her body was about to be engulfed by the holy light, a tall figure with wings spread out intercepted her and flew straight into the sky. His body took the brunt of the strong light, emitting the stench of burning flesh. Master, thank you. Moving at high speed, lowly merchant couldn't open her eyes and barely spoke. No. One, your wish to see the child may not come true. The upper-class demon flapped his wings and flew into the sunlit clouds. Don't worry. I saw her, and she's doing well. Lowly merchant seemed to remember something. I didn't see the master of no. 86. The lowly elf. Our mission is complete, and we have alerted the defenders of Pernisport. The upper-class demon hid in the clouds and sped towards the sea. I hope the supreme dark god will be satisfied. Zack, this is a story you opened with your own hands. Completely engulfed by the dice, Zack's vision was filled with light. When his vision returned, he found himself standing in a nearly withered patch of grass, the yellowed grass gently brushing against his shins. Looking around, all he saw was the color of withered yellow. A wasteland. An endless wasteland. Zack had returned here once again. He looked at his body. He had returned to the body of a human once again. Unlike last time, he now held a six-sided die in his hand. The die was almost as big as a third-order Rubik's Cube, and it felt heavy in his hand. It was showing a six. Just as Zack was lost in thought, a familiar neutral voice came from the die, Zack, you need to revive more divinity temporarily. Revive divinity? Zack hesitated briefly. Suddenly, he saw the pattern on the die facing him begin to distort. The six dissolved, spread out, and gradually reformed into a five. Go to the White City. The sound of the dice became urgent. White City, Zack's mouth repeated. He saw a completely white city rise up on the distant horizon. A railway extended to his feet. Otherwise, you will die completely. Everything will die. Zack heard the clanging sound approaching from a distance, getting closer behind him. It was the sound of a train. He quickly stepped aside as an old steam train, spewing black smoke, slowly came to a stop beside him. It was pulling several green carriages. The doors on the carriages opened automatically, and inclined iron plates extended to his feet. Get on quickly, Zack heard his own mouth say. Suddenly, he felt a palpitation and looked in the direction the train had come from. The wilderness was no longer calm. The thick clouds on the horizon were torn open, revealing a brilliant starry sky or a colorful darkness. It poured down like a scroll of ink, eroding and devouring everything in the wilderness. This unstoppable starry sky was coming for Zack. The dice kindly reminded him, the mother goddess of the moon has broken through the limits. The divine strike is imminent. Just as Zack caught a glimpse of the starry sky, his head began to throb. From out of nowhere, gentle female murmurs lingered in his ears. The murmurs soothed Zack's heart, alleviated his pain, and gradually relaxed him, making his body feel comfortable and soft. A strong desire surged in Zack's heart. He wanted to fall asleep, sinking into endless darkness and the warm embrace, never wanting to wake up again. No! Zack fiercely hit his head with the dice, the pain making him see stars, but he managed to regain control of his body. He scrambled onto the train. As the doors closed, the drowsiness and fatigue that had been present throughout his body disappeared. At that moment, Zack glanced at the dice, and the number on it had changed to four. The train quickly started, its piercing whistle echoing across the desolate wilderness. 
At this moment, the sky had been divided in two. On one side, the clouds were tinged with a yellowish hue, while on the other, the pitch-black night sky was filled with stars. Across the vast wilderness, a steam train raced towards the white city, its whistle resounding across the plains. The night sky descended like a brilliant black curtain, swallowing everything in the wilderness, chasing after the fleeing train. The surface of the curtain was smooth, without a ripple, like a two-dimensional giant canvas. As the wilderness was gradually devoured, flat stars emerged on the surface of the curtain, emitting a brilliant light that completely suppressed the twilight colors of the wilderness. The long black night would eventually replace the brief twilight. Zack sat by the window, trying not to look back, gazing at the increasingly clear and magnificent white city in front of him. His expression became uncontrollably excited. White city. White city. Zack heard his own mouth start to clamor, followed by his eyes, nose. And finally, every inch of his skin, every hair, all echoed the same excitement for the impending moment. Regardless, he was finally going to enter the long-awaited white city. Quiet. The dice in his hand seemed unable to bear it and spoke slightly unkindly. The carriage returned to calm once again, with only the clanging of the train in Zack's ears. He tentatively asked, Why do you want me to go to the white city? Perhaps fearing another seizure, the dice immediately responded, You are currently unable to resist the divine strike. You will temporarily return to the crumbling divine seat and obtain the forgotten divinity. Zack listened attentively and suddenly asked, Is this also planned? Is this the inevitable trajectory of fate? Yes. Is it my plan? Yes. Is it my future self? The dice fell silent for a moment. When Zack's entire body began to shout White City again, it spoke once more, it is the past, temporarily the present, not necessarily the future. Upon hearing this response, there was no change in Zack's expression. It seems that I have always been my own puppet, he said, looking at the dice in front of him. It was gradually transforming into a three. At this moment, the tone of the dice rose again, divine strike is imminent. The train ascended a pure white bridge, gradually rising but not slowing down at all. They finally entered the range of the white city. The pitch black curtain behind them was very close to the train. The air outside the window was crazily pouring backward. Against the backdrop of the boundless and immense canvas that occupied the sky, the magnificent white city appeared extremely small at this moment. At this point, the edge of the curtain reached the boundary of the white city and suddenly became stagnant. It seemed to be blocked by the boundary of the white city, temporarily entering a stalemate. But it did not stop there. The starry sky on both sides began to encircle the city, encroaching on the outskirts of the wilderness. Until this two-dimensional, colorful, pitch-black canvas completely enveloped the white city, swallowing the last hint of dim yellow sky. The white city was completely shrouded in the brilliant light of the stars. Feeling the immense oppression of the dark curtain, Zack's face became even calmer. The lights inside the carriage came on. At the same moment, the pavilions and towers of the white city also emitted a faint white light from the windows and doorways. Moving at high speed, Zack roughly surveyed the buildings of the white city. Their appearance was very similar to the Chinese architecture he had seen in his previous life, the only difference being that they were all composed of a single color, white. It was only with the help of the shadows cast by the light that Zack could barely distinguish the outlines of the buildings from the homogeneous white. What exactly is the white city? He tentatively asked the large dice in his hand. The dice remained silent. Is it the divine kingdom I once belonged to? No, Zack fell into contemplation. He did indeed feel very unfamiliar with the white city. When he first saw the white city in the wilderness, it seemed to be his first encounter with it. What was the significance of the existence of the white city? As he pondered, the buildings of the white city were no longer visible outside the window. The height of the elevated bridge was gradually ascending, towering above the buildings. The steam train was heading towards the highest point of the white city, the Grand Central Tower. Suddenly, it braked sharply, and sparks flew between the wheels and the rails. Zack held onto his seat tightly to avoid being thrown forward. The steam train stopped at the platform, which was completely white and seamless. As soon as the door opened, Zack quickly jumped down and ran towards a spiral staircase. Although it was a completely unfamiliar place, there was a premonition guiding him in the direction he was heading. As he ran, Zack glimpsed through transparent, seemingly non-existent windows, a colossal planet appearing on the dark curtain. It was a huge green moon, emitting a destructive oppression. The bright green light made the stars pale in comparison, casting everything in a green hue. The moon was gradually expanding, compressing the space of the curtain and approaching the tiny white city. Divine strike is imminent. Zack's dice in hand let out a loud scream. At the same time, the number on the side facing him transformed into a two. He increased his speed once again, running with all his might using the human body named Lu Jia. He felt as if he was about to take flight. 
Finally, after running past countless pure white stairs and corridors, Zack arrived at the highest room of the White Tower. It was an extremely grand Chinese palace with a height of over a hundred meters. The difference was that it had no walls or tiles, only massive columns supporting the hollow dome. Looking towards the end, at the heart of the hall was a completely white throne. It was already half destroyed, with stones from one side scattered on the ground, leaving only half of the structure struggling to support itself. A strong desire filled Zack's heart like never before. This is the crumbling divine throne, he murmured, rushing forward and in the blink of an eye, he ran to the front of the throne. It once belonged to me, Zack shouted, looking up at the approaching green giant moon. It had occupied most of the pitch black curtain, and a blurry face gradually appeared on it, pressing towards Zack's position. Zack stared coldly, closing his eyes. He suppressed his impulse, feeling a surge of madness rapidly circling around the divine throne, growing stronger. Source of light? No, it's the source of divinity. Zack placed his hand on the intact armrest of the divine throne, and his entire body began to accept the surging madness. His body gradually filled with it, and all the distractions in his mind quickly disappeared. Nothing mattered anymore, including the looming giant moon. One point. The dice's piercing scream echoed in the great hall, the divine strike has arrived. At the same time, Zack suddenly opened his eyes and reached into the void. Several thick chains gradually took shape, coiling around his arm as if they were black snakes. Then, the ends of the chains were tightly bound to a goblin with a dark green skin sack. It also emerged from the void, bare-bodied, with a black light flashing at its heart. This was Zack's goblin original body. The Zack with a human body and the Zack with a goblin body calmly faced each other. The green giant moon stopped just a short distance from their heads, and the pattern on the dice's surface solidified into an irregular puddle of red liquid, not yet fully transformed into a point. Except for Zack, everything in the wilderness stopped at that moment, even the divine strike of the moon goddess could not be avoided. Zack, the goblin Zack spoke, his voice hoarse, your corresponding body in the real world has been hidden by the moon goddess. You have been forgotten by the world. The only way is to completely neutralize her divine strike. As soon as he finished speaking, pure white light rose from the overturned divine throne, attracting each other and converging into two human forms, like a group of glowing fireflies, finally forming two figures. Both of them had pointed ears, light gray hair, and Rita-colored pupils, and they were completely naked. They were the elf forms of Zack, one male, and one female. Seeing three different versions of himself, Zack seemed to have anticipated it. The other me, please help me, completely unleash the power of the white city. Please help me neutralize the divine strike. The two elves and the goblin Zack nodded silently. The four Zacks reached out their arms towards the center, and the palms of the goblin oozed a black liquid, while the palms of the two elves oozed a pure white liquid. They were the concentrated liquefied sources of darkness and light. The black and white substances violently sublimated, and when they came into contact, instead of annihilating each other, they merged into a state of mutual interpenetration. They began to rotate rapidly until they formed a pattern that was extremely familiar to human Zack. Taiji. Because of Zack's actions, the high tower where the palace was located, and even the entire white city, began to tremble violently. The divine source continued to emanate from the half-destroyed divine throne, flowing through the bodies of the four Zacks, and finally entering the rotating Taiji pattern in the center. The size of the Taiji pattern suddenly expanded, covering the entire white city, and confronting the huge, flat green moon. When the power within the Taiji pattern accumulated to a high level, the four Zacks recited in unison, there is Taiji, which gives birth to the two poles, the two poles give birth to the four images. With this body, create the four images, with light and darkness as the two poles, and all things return to one. The hands of time turned once again. The pattern on the dice's surface completely changed to a blood-red dot. In the instant when the Taiji pattern touched the green giant moon, Zack neither saw any images nor heard any sound. In that moment, he was deprived of all senses. Everything seemed to be distorted and shattered. Nothing made sense anymore. Your counterattack collided with the divine strike, causing the annihilation of extremely high energy, and even creating a black hole. The dice's tone seemed slightly dissatisfied, if not for my superior skills, you would have been swallowed by the black hole. Zack slowly opened his eyes. He saw the dusty big dice rolling around him. It always had one side facing him. The number was six. Zack sighed. He looked around, but both the goblin and the elf versions of himself were nowhere to be seen. He lay on the soft dry grass, with a thick layer of clouds above his head. The familiar twilight colors returned to the wilderness. The huge terrifying green moon, the star-studded flat scroll, the colorful pitch-black night sky, Zack couldn't find any trace of their existence. They seemed to have never appeared. You have resolved the divine strike, the six-point pattern of the dice seemed like six eyes, cunningly staring at Zack, Zack, 
Before you go back to sleep, do you have any questions? It was clear that it was in a good mood. Has the White City been affected by the divine strike of the Mother of the Moon and destroyed by the Black Hole? The dice let out a mocking laugh, it has always been there. Zack subconsciously turned to look. The magnificent White City stood on the horizon of the wilderness, no different from before. What is the true face of the White City? No one knows, the dice returned to its emotionless tone, some have called it the ideal country. The appearance of the White City is not certain. The shape that each visitor can feel is closely related to their own nature. Is that why the half-destroyed divine seed appeared? Zack glanced at it. Are you part of the White City? No, I am part of you. The gods roll the dice to decide everything in the world, and I am your dice. I symbolize a part of your divinity. Zack was somewhat puzzled, so, am I indeed a god? You are a fallen light god, the dice recounted calmly, now you are only a part of the fallen light god. The most important part, light god? Zack paused, but the light god is still active in the world. The current light god is an outsider who usurped the god's position, the dice said indifferently. The light god that Yar worships is. It is another part of the fallen light god. He retains most of the position and divinity, but lacks the most important thing. It is he who commands Yar and the pink insects, guiding and protecting you step by step to ensure that you always stay on the predetermined path. The name of the light god has become obsolete. Except for the devout Yar, most people now call him the insect god. The insect god, the god of the insects. Zack had a strange feeling. Why is it a name similar to the eastern gods? The dice continued, the usurper naturally opposes your revival, so he took action during the gathering in the underground warehouse of the academy, trying to change your trajectory. Suddenly, a large number of memories flooded Zack's mind. He was initially unwilling to go outside the city for the gathering, but with a series of bizarre scenes, he eventually unknowingly changed his choice. The dice explained, at first, the mother of the moon used her secret power to modify your cognition, making you unconsciously believe that it was reasonable not to participate in the gathering outside the city. The insect god immediately attacked, showing you the first scene of the illusion. He urgently wanted to tell you that you could go outside the city, but it seemed a bit too forceful for you. No wonder the illusion was filled with indescribable and terrifying mouths. Zack somewhat helplessly covered his face. He should have thought of this earlier. In the battle in the cave with Yar, when Yar's whole body opened small mouths and spewed out blood threads that pierced him, the shape of those mouths was exactly the same. Similarly, the senior pink insect at the time told him that he could go, probably also under the control of the insect god. The six-point pattern of the dice seemed to blink quickly, in the second scene of the illusion, the usurper light god took action, creating a false hope of light to lure you into it. The power he released and the power of the dark god fell into a divine battle. The power of the dark god is what you saw at the time, the darkness that eventually swallowed you. The dice suddenly raised its voice, if I hadn't immediately cleansed that ball of light, giving it a one point, and let it fail completely, it's very likely that the light god would have succeeded. You're still raving about me stealing your light. I stole your horse. Zack's gaze turned away for a moment, then he carefully asked, is the dark god also related to me? I have no authority to know. The most reasonable guess is that he is an absolute enemy of the usurper light god leading the group of gods, so he made some kind of deal with the plague god to come and help you. He may not necessarily want you to become a god, but he definitely wants to disrupt the light god's plan. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Zack said softly, no wonder his followers call the light god a false god. He hadn't thought much about it before, thinking it was just a way for the opposing light and dark gods to quarrel, calling each other false gods. Now it seems that the dark god has long known that the light god is nothing more than an outsider usurper, so his followers contemptuously call him a false god. Perhaps this is the reason why divine magic cannot be cast without chanting and must recite the pre-spell incantation? A breeze blew from somewhere, causing wave after wave of yellow waves on the desolate sea. Zack rolled over on the soft grass and asked, did the mother goddess of the moon intervene in Rita's life early on? Yes, the dice rolled, the plague god realized the interference of the mother goddess of the moon, so he ordered Yar to remind you and break his secrecy. Zack remembered something else, so tonight, is it a game you set up for the mother goddess of the moon? Yes. He is more determined than the light god to put you in a desperate situation, even at the cost of personally intervening, and the trajectory of fate has already calculated to this point. Breaking through the boundaries of the world, suffering the backlash of divine strikes, the black hole has also been included in his domain by the white city, the dice said disdainfully, after that, for a long time, he and his followers will not come to disturb you again. Zack nodded, I still have one big question that hasn't been resolved. The general content of the trajectory of fate is to help me collect the remaining parts and ascend to the god's throne again? The dice rolled, you can understand it that way. 
Is it necessary to transform the goblins? Yes. Is it necessary to free the slaves? Yes. Why? I can't tell you for now. The dice decisively refused. If you know the detailed steps and key nodes, there is a high possibility of irreversible deviation in the future. But there is one truth I can tell you. Zack raised his eyebrows. In fact, the history of the slaves has been secretly rewritten by the mother goddess of the moon. They were not originally non-believers. He realized something, you mean. The slaves were all once your people. Zack's eyes widened suddenly. This short sentence was like a heavy bomb. The dice seemed indifferent to his reaction and continued. The vast majority of the slaves are descendants of the fallen light god's followers. After the god's fall incident, they were unwilling to believe in the usurping light god and raised the flag of rebellion, thus suffering the cruelest punishment. They were forced to be slaves for generations. So, freeing them and breaking the brainwashing of the church is a very crucial step. Zack was stunned, so, that's why I actively thought about how to free the slaves. It was not only influenced by the concept of equality from his past life, but also because these suffering people were the faithful descendants of himself as the light god. The dice continued, so, I have exerted quite an influence on you, accelerating the transformation of your inner beliefs, starting with the slave four, gradually introducing the flames of rebellion and liberation. You're not the one Yar gave me, are you? The timing doesn't match. Since the first time you touched the bone dice next to the casino and rolled the dice, I've been by your side. Zack fell into silence. He stood up, feeling the slight chill brought by the gentle breeze, I remember something else. I remember that after the gods fall, the eastern continent separated from the main continent, leaving only a few survivors and witchcraft. The elders told me that the eastern continent is related to things like chopsticks. Is the eastern continent connected to me? The dice spoke slowly, it is equivalent to your divine realm. When the gods first walked the world, you personally raised the eastern continent and endowed it with many characteristics. It could be said that it is your entire effort. Zack's body trembled slightly. Its separation is related to the current light god? The dice answered bluntly, it is indeed his doing. To erase all traces of you from this world. Where did the eastern continent finally go? It may be a corner beyond the reach of the divine city, or it may have sunk into a bottomless abyss. The dice's words carried a hint of uncertainty. I cannot know for sure, but it is most likely completely destroyed, even if found, it would only be a wasteland. Zack stood still for a while before squeezing out a sentence, were all the absurd rules of this world set by the former light god? Of course not, the dice patiently replied, this also involves the issue of the moon mother goddess modifying history. They want to completely erase all traces of your existence, and distort the reasonable world rules you set. Zack asked calmly, which gods have not sided with the usurper? Apart from the dark god and the witch god, there are. The dice suddenly stopped introducing, it's too early for you to ask about this now. But most of the gods are indeed on the side of the light god. They basically don't do anything productive, spending their days researching how to roll the dice to make the world more interesting. Is the current situation of the goblin tribe also related to these gods? Yes. They distorted the goblins into goblins, just to roll the dice to determine the fate of adventurers and enjoy the scene of goblins harming women. But they will be happy if the goblins succeed, and also happy if the adventurers escape. Regardless of the outcome, it's all fun for them. However, most of the wild goblins are no longer descendants of the original goblins. Zack frowned slightly, you mean the wild goblins? They are pure divine puppets placed in the world by the gods, the dice said lightly. If your real world body encounters those goblins, don't hold back, kill them all. They cannot be corrected. What is truly suitable for you has already been arranged. The slave goblin tribe you saw at the gathering outside the city is what you mean, that most of the wild goblins are creations of the gods? Zack asked. They all come from the moon, the dice explained, although they have no outward differences from the native goblins transformed from goblins. You will understand the fundamental difference between the two when you come into contact with the slave goblins later. So, his teacher, the old goblin king, was also a member of the native goblins? It probably was once a goblin enslaved. Zack nodded. Thank you for the reminder. There is another question. When I just resolved the divine strike of the moon mother goddess, why did the power I used involve Tai Chi? Could it be something designed by the me before the fall? He did not understand the principle behind it, just subconsciously following the muscle memory of his body. It was as if Zack had performed the exact same operation countless times. You have so many questions, the dice's tone was obviously unfriendly, but still answered him, but your guess is not wrong. This is the fundamental reason why the light and dark sources in your body can coexist peacefully. I don't really understand the specifics, only that it is related to the former harmony of yin and yang principle in the eastern continent. Of course, with the separation of the eastern continent, 
all knowledge has disappeared without a trace. So, my body was specially designed to harness the power of the White City to resist the Divine Strike. Zack sat down, his hand resting on his chin, it seems that this is a necessary design for the path to godhood. I'm glad you understand, the dice rolled around Zack again, the time is almost here. You are about to return to slumber. With the mentality of taking advantage of any opportunity, Zack shamelessly asked quickly, what exactly is the game of the gods? Once you surpass the superior races, Yar will naturally tell you. If the dice had an expression, it would surely be extremely impatient now, you only need to know that after tonight, the usurper, the light god, and the gods who support him will not personally intervene against you for a long time. As soon as the words fell, white static flickered in front of Zack's eyes, filling his field of vision. Wait, I still have one more question, the last one. Zack desperately tried to stay awake, resisting the sudden drowsiness. About my reincarnation. Pure white engulfed everything. He knew nothing. Zack suddenly returned to consciousness, finding himself sitting in a real leather armchair. He stood up. He was still in the underground casino, but at this moment, the casino was empty. The gambling tables were tilted, and chips, dice, and cards were scattered on the floor. What happened? Where are the others? Senior, do you know what happened? Zack called out softly, but did not hear a response from the senior. The pink little bug was also gone. His heart skipped a beat. It must be because of the secret influence exerted by the mother of the moon on me, so they all temporarily forgot about me. Zack thought calmly, as long as I make contact with Fuhr and the others again, I can dispel the hidden effect, just like the incident with Rita's background. There are no signs of fighting at the scene, people should have fled. What happened in the underground casino while I was away? If Fuhr and the others are okay, they should have returned to the city. I just need to return to the academy to meet them. After making up his mind, Zack silently walked up the spiral staircase and arrived at the deserted first floor of the tavern. He smelled the scent of blood and burnt smell. The smell is coming from outside. Zack frowned, has there been a battle in this area? He activated his magic perception and sensed many patrolling soldiers and hidden scouts on the street. The outside is the army of the church. I can't risk using the goblin's body to escape through shadow. I estimate that this area has already been tightly sealed off. The body of the male elf won't work either. I will have to continue attending classes at the Noble Magic Academy in this form in the future. If my appearance is marked by the church, it will cause a lot of trouble for my studies. So, there's only one choice left. Zack sighed helplessly and began to search the staff room and the tavern. I hope there are women's clothes left behind. At the entrance of the old place tavern, a pair of soldiers on guard suddenly heard a sound coming from the inside of the door that had been sealed with a strip. Who's in there? The soldiers' spirits lifted, aiming their guns at the door. I I am sorry, I, I fell asleep in the corner and woke up to find everyone gone. A pitiful female voice came from inside the door. The two soldiers looked at each other and silently gestured to the street. Nearby soldiers quietly gathered, taking cover in different positions, ready to shoot at the old place tavern. An officer took out several magic scrolls and ordered in a low voice, if the situation changes, no need for a command, open fire at will. Yes. After receiving the officer's instructions, the soldier guarding the door carefully tore off the seal and opened the door, hands up, don't make any extra movements, come out. A casino girl, dressed as an exquisitely beautiful female elf, walked out nervously. She stood tall, with smooth, snow-white skin that seemed delicate, and her light gray long hair was tied into twin ponytails. Her light and short skirt barely covered her perfectly curved round hips. Innocence and temptation achieved a perfect balance in the youthful elf girl. She was Zack, who had turned the source of light. In a short time, Zack only found the casino girl's work clothes, and now she regretted it. The clothes were even more revealing than she had expected, and obviously too tight. She should have chosen men's clothing instead. Stop. Get down. Put your hands on the back of your head. The soldier was not swayed by Zack's appearance, but instead became more alert. Shouldn't a woman with such beauty be a plaything of the nobility or royalty? How could she appear in a rundown tavern outside the city of Puna's, and right in the area where the cultists attacked? Arrest her immediately, the officer said coldly after seeing Zack obediently lie down with a fearful expression, take her back for questioning. If we can prove that there is no problem, we will release you. Nearby, the silver-ranked adventurer who was monitoring did not warn or launch an attack, so he secretly breathed a sigh of relief. The officer, with his rich experience, immediately understood that this situation was most likely a lonely young lady from a noble family who had come out to experience life and unfortunately encountered a cultist attack. You don't need to bother, a calm female voice sounded behind the officer. The officer quickly turned around and saw a nun, Yar, walking gracefully in her nun's attire, with a smile in her eyes. 
Lady Yar, the officer respectfully saluted, do you know this elf lady? Yar was the silver-ranked adventurer responsible for the old place tavern area. Although she was not directly under the jurisdiction of the church, her devotion to the god of light was well known. She cleared her throat, Zack is one of my lovers, and also my pet. She is one of us, and also a devout follower of the god of light. A lover? A pet? Zack stood up and caught the meaningful glances from the surrounding soldiers. She almost couldn't control her facial expression and gritted her teeth, saying, by the grace of the god of light, I am indeed Lady Yar's lover. The officer saluted, I'm sorry, Miss Zack, for the trouble you've been through. Yar nodded slightly in response. After the officer completed the routine procedure and recorded Zack's facial features, she took Zack's hand and left steadily. In the safe area, Yar led her into a seemingly abandoned small house and pointed to the bed that had been prepared in advance, saying, please sit. I have to go back to the scene soon, she said lightly to Zack, your student uniform has been neatly folded on the table. Thank you, Zack said briefly. Even if I'm beautiful, I have no interest in people. I am just a parasite by nature. Yar glanced at Zack and said, the words just now are just to get you out as soon as possible, don't take them to heart. Let me tell you what happened. Before you were directly attacked by the mother of the moon, she sent many followers to attack you, and they fought with the prepared followers of the dark god. The war was very fierce. The followers of the mother of the moon were completely wiped out, and only a small part of the followers of the dark god barely escaped. Yar recounted emotionlessly, when the church arrived, the battle was basically over, and many bystanders had died in addition to the followers of both sides. You must also be wondering why the mother of the moon had not acted against you before, and then suddenly went all out? She had actually been eyeing you for a long time. She didn't act before because she didn't have the opportunity, but once she did, she would have put you to death directly. Zack fell into contemplation. This was the real world, not a virtual novel. Enemies wouldn't do stupid things like attacking the old to bring in the new. Such foolish behavior only served to give the protagonist experience points. The truly rational approach is to eliminate any potential threat at the earliest stage once it is identified. If there is no opportunity, then temporarily avoid contact with the other party, or deceive them to make them unaware of the danger. When the time is right, launch a sudden attack, ensuring a decisive blow without giving the other party time to prepare or react. This move is indeed ruthless. Before tonight, she had no idea that the mother of the moon was her enemy, only knowing that a god with hidden authority seemed to be targeting her. If it weren't for the white city and the dice, without the preemptive preparation left by me, I would have already died from the divine strike. Zack once again clearly realized the nature of the beings he was facing. Their power far surpassed their own, and their strategies were not to be underestimated. He had to be even more careful, not making a single misstep. After Zack had digested what was said, Yar continued, Now, the game has begun. You don't need to worry about them launching a divine strike like tonight, or about them informing the church or the kingdom of your information and sending diligent heroes chasing after you around the world. Zack raised his head, Are these the conditions of the game? Exactly. You are the chosen one, one of the participants in the game. Yar smirked slightly, you were chosen by the great divine being. If everything goes as expected, you will soon qualify to know the specific details of the game. Does that mean I am about to break through to the upper race? Is it referring to Lana's advanced magic course? Zack couldn't think of where the key to the breakthrough was for a while, so he had to bow to Yar and say, Miss Yar, thank you once again for your answers. Yar tilted her head, if you really want to thank me, then bark like a little dog. I refuse. After Zack transformed into a male form, he smoothly returned to the academy. The sky was turning a pale blue, and the deep night was gradually fading. It was almost dawn. Zack stood in front of the dormitory door, hesitated for a moment, and then used the key to open the door. May I ask who you are? Fleur was wearing a thin nightgown, sitting on the edge of the bed, looking a bit haggard, as if she hadn't slept all night. Zack caught a glimpse of a pink little bug quickly retreating into a cup. I am Zack, he said calmly. Fleur's body trembled slightly. Zack. Fleur murmured, Zack, Zack, Zack. This word seemed to have a magical power, making her involuntarily repeat it over and over again. Zack could feel that from her, as if an invisible and intangible film was rapidly cracking, and the cracks were spreading throughout the world. At this moment, the world remembered Zack once again. The pink little bug poked its head out in surprise, while Fleur stared at him, tears streaming down her face. You are, the young. I remember, I remember everything. Fleur staggered to her feet, you are Zack, once my master, now my. She rushed forward, tightly embracing Zack and sobbing, I'm sorry, Zack, I'm so sorry for abandoning you outside the city. It's not your fault. Zack gently stroked Fleur's blood-red long hair, I've come back. 
Feeling the warmth of the girl in his arms, he sighed almost imperceptibly, deeply moved. Fleur, too, had been persecuted by the current gods and other gods, the descendants of his former subjects. Under the influence of the dice, he had indeed had more thoughts of using this girl before, without truly treating her as family. The one he cherished the most, the one he trusted the most, had always been only Rita. As for the predecessors, they could also be considered as half of his family. Only after Zack completely eliminated his concerns about the pink little bug did he truly understand that the moth god was one of his few helpers. The pink little bug stood there dumbfounded, young one, what on earth happened? A faint smile appeared on Zack's face. This is a long story. The Old Place Tavern's Underground Casino. Yar changed into casual clothes and spoke to the dice on the table. After that battle, Zack's humanity has returned to a higher level. Did he consume a lot of divinity in the White City? Well, he hasn't broken through to the upper race yet. The divinity you gave him before is not stable and secure. I understand. In any case, we must ensure that his fate does not go wrong. Yar stood up, bowed to the dice on the table, and left. Any possible obstacles need to be completely eliminated. Young one, you actually intercepted an attack from an existing being. After Zack finished speaking, the pink little bug was in great shock. No wonder Yar hopes that you can become a god. She said somewhat timidly, maybe I should call you senior. She actually made the former god of light call her senior after calling her senior four years. Zack quickly waved his hand, no need, I don't have the memories of being a god of light now, nor do I have the corresponding power. I'm just an ordinary person. It's you who have guided me all the way and helped me many times, that my mother and I can come to today. You have always been my formidable senior. This, the pink little bug's face turned even redder. Her body shrank back into the cup. The pink little bug might not be able to accept it for a while. To avoid putting too much pressure on her, Zack's gaze turned to the side. Senior, I do have a question. I haven't heard much about the existence of the mother of the moon, goddess of the moon. What kind of existence is she? Is she also recognized as a true god by the church? The pink little bug cautiously poked her head out again, she is one of the true gods, but she has always been mysterious, and the outside world knows very little about her, unlike the high visibility of the god of light, the lord of lightning, god of thunder, and others. I only know that the two red and green moons in the sky belong to her domain. Her followers usually hide in society, and on the surface, they usually also believe in the god of light as a cover. Because the belief in the God of Light is the most widespread and tolerant. She does not force her followers to maintain a single belief. Zack nodded, doesn't she have an exclusive church? There should be a secret church, and only devout believers know where it is. As she spoke, the pink little bug's body emerged a bit again, mainly because the church of the God of Light also allows believers of other gods to pray, so most of the gods basically have few exclusive churches. The belief in the God of Light is the most tolerant, but the power of light is the most dominant. Zack smiled, I remember you told me this, senior. The pink little bug's face turned even redder, it's good that you remember. After finishing the dormitory affairs with Four, Zack quickly arrived at Rita's snack shop. To his surprise, Rita seemed to have not forgotten about him. Forget you? Rita looked somewhat surprised, dear Zack, how could mom forget you? I have been thinking about what gift you would bring back. But Hongo sleeps soundly in the second half of the night. She said she wouldn't sleep if you didn't come back. I teased her about why she didn't wait for Zack, and she directly said she had never heard of this name. I immediately understood, she must have been waiting and got angry Rita chattered on, not noticing the subtle changes in Zack's face due to surprise. Hondo's reaction was normal, but why hadn't Rita forgotten about him? Was she not affected by the secrecy imposed by the goddess of the moon? But Rita had just recently deciphered her hidden status through Yar, which also showed that she was not immune to secrecy. The only person who has never been influenced by the goddess of the moon from beginning to end is Yar, the guardian of the gods. Zack's eyes suddenly widened. Hmm. Rita's head tilted cutely and she leaned closer to Zack. Is there something on my face? No, I was just lost in thought for a moment, Zack replied, regaining his smile but with a slight sweat on his forehead. Could Rita be in trouble, like becoming a follower of some deity? Or is it because the intimate blood bond between mother and son is a special case, so it won't be affected by the hidden power of the mother of the moon? After hesitating for a moment, he decided to temporarily ignore this issue. Zack handed a beautifully wrapped gift box to Rita, come on, mom, open it and see. Am I going to give a gift to Red Bean? I'll see if I can make her happier. Members of the Soros family are your enemies. Try to avoid contact with them in the future. Zack remembered what Jar had said and asked quietly, Elder, do you think I should cut off all contact with Red Bean directly? The words of the pink bug echoed in his mind, I don't know. 
If I set aside emotional considerations and think about this issue purely from a rational perspective, Red Bean is probably a hostile presence planted by your side, a thunderbolt that will eventually be detrimental to you. The Soros family has continued for thousands of years through special blood, even surviving major catastrophes like the Godfall, and I think there should be a hidden figure behind them. Considering Yar's advice to you, it is clear that this figure is in an antagonistic relationship with you, and the Soros family even created the illustrious Soros dynasty before the separation of the eastern continent. This indicates that before your fall, that deity already existed. I boldly speculate that during the Godfall, he may have betrayed you, the leader of the gods, and colluded with current luminous beings and other outsiders, so the Soros family has always flourished. Zack furrowed his brow, the elder's analysis is indeed very reasonable. This also aligns with Yar's advice, indicating that Red Bean, as a member of the Soros family, poses a great threat to him. Even if I can sever ties, my mother cannot. Zack sighed, and besides, Red Bean is innocent. Even if she is guilty, it is because of the mysterious blood of the Soros. The pink bug said with concern, young one, this is a plot against you, assuming that you will not kill Red Bean and temporarily cannot deal with the issue of Soros blood. Members of the Soros family always unite in critical moments. I suspect that this kind of blood is likely a form of forced manipulation. Zack nodded and added, or forced brainwashing, erasing memories, and so on. Be prepared for the worst. But since I have already promised Red Bean a gift, I still have to give it to her. He activated his auditory perception and heard the faint, even snoring coming from Rita's bedroom. Zack knocked on the door. Ah, dad's back. Came a surprised voice from the other side of the door. Footsteps quickly approached, and the door opened, a excited figure threw herself into Zack's arms, sniffing around, Dad, what did you bring for me? Why aren't you wearing clothes? Zack's face instantly darkened as he scolded, You're such a big girl, don't you have any shame? Go and put on some clothes. It's uncomfortable to sleep in underwear. And it's comfortable to sleep naked. Excited Red Bean was pushed into the room by Zack, who turned his head, Dad, I smell seafood and barbecue, let me have a bite first. The pink bug sighed softly, how could the young one bear to sever ties in this situation? Just as Yar had said, Zack's life unexpectedly remained calm and uneventful. He took the initiative to contact the elf Miss Hippie, who was struggling with her studies, and informed her that he was temporarily a commoner, so life was a bit tight, and he hoped to earn some extra money by teaching her to help with household expenses. Zack's move was like a timely rain for hype, so she readily accepted it. After discussing the terms, Zack discovered a fact after several study sessions. The only word to describe this young lady's study was hopeless. She clearly lacked interest in studying and did not take it seriously. When Zack explained, she always stole glances at his profile. If it weren't for my commoner status, I would really want to marry him. He's serious and a bit cute, and he's much more handsome than those young masters in the clan. Oh, Zack activated his auditory perception and listened to Hype and her blue-haired lowly slave whispering, but it's feasible to marry into the Thorn family, right? Joining the student council is considered noble, with a promising future. Father might really approve of our marriage. Miss, please stop daydreaming. He clearly isn't interested in you, the blue-haired lowly couldn't help but sigh. He's getting close to Miss Soros, I think he's planning to marry into the Soros family. Hype said with some guilt, even if it doesn't develop into a marriage, I'll give him some benefits after graduation, and it would be a good explanation for him to come back to the clan with me. Truly a divine arrangement, or should I say, my arrangement, Zack muttered to himself. He didn't need to find reasons to persuade the young lady, she was the one trying to get close to him. After the study session, Zack sighed with relief and walked out of the classroom in a good mood. Floor, who was waiting outside, naturally approached him, Master, it seems that Miss Cinder is interested in you. Did she cause you any trouble? Zack shook his head, I have no interest in her. Whether it was his imagination or not, Zack noticed that Floor seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. After truly getting used to the life at the academy, time passed quickly. Apart from Lon's advanced magic classes, Zack found the other courses easy to handle, with the external brain, the pink little bug, working tirelessly. With Lon's help, Zack's use of the light source magic power improved day by day, until he began to try advanced magic. No need to rush your choice, the pink-haired Lon patiently advised him, take it slow, find the most suitable advanced magic for you, and you'll achieve twice the result with half the effort. With your progress, you should be able to master several advanced magics before graduation, and you can further study super advanced magic after graduation. If you're willing, you can come find me after graduation. Contact information? I probably won't be teaching in Pune's port in a few years. Well, if you contact Yar through the insect, you'll definitely find me. Of course, he didn't neglect the work of the student council and the underground group gatherings. 
Drawing on his experience from his previous life in college, Zach made many practical suggestions to the student council, and his efficiency was so high that he was soon promoted to a key position in the student council. On the other hand, as Zach became the mole of the student council, Alphine's underground group gatherings also became more active. Zach gradually became the true backbone of these noble children. After some consideration, Alphine decided to pass the leadership position to Zach. You are the true leader, I am not worthy. At the same time, Rita's snack shop became more and more popular. After several rounds of surveys and selections by Zach, he finalized a batch of high-quality and affordable snacks, as well as delicate snacks for the noble root, which were deeply loved by most students. To ensure the students' shopping enthusiasm, we must start from their needs, Zach said to Rita. Similarly, young people have a trend-following atmosphere, so we must regularly pay attention to the food information in Pune's port. For new products, if they meet the food safety and hygiene standards of the academy, we can first bring in a small batch to observe the students' shopping situation. If there is still a high demand for the snacks after a month, it means that the students have developed a buying habit and this is exactly what they need. To determine the basic policy of coexistence of traditional snacks and new snacks, aristocratic route and cost-effective route, in order to meet the needs of the majority of student market. Rita's eyes were full of confusion, up, now, she and Zach are completely not short of money. During this time, Zach also occasionally took the initiative to contact Fatty Camp, until he completely integrated into his social circle. For Zach's initiative, Camp obviously had another kind of unhealthy idea, but it was cleverly diverted by Zach every time. On a normal weekend, Camp finally agreed to take Zach to see the slave goblins in the manor. This secret must not be leaked. He changed his usual carefree attitude and sullenly explained to Zach, although the church allows nobles to use goblins as slaves, this is conditional. This must never be known to the public. Except for family members, we will never tell outsiders about the existence of goblin slaves. Once known to the public, the church will not easily let us off. Zach, I take you as a true brother, so I am willing to satisfy your curiosity. He exaggeratedly sighed, you also must take me as a true brother, right? Zach nodded solemnly, that's natural. But I have a question. Since it will be a big deal if goblin slaves are discovered, why does your family still insist on using them? Camp puffed out his belly, with his hands behind him, looking like a leader. Zach, do you know the difference between goblins and slaves? Zach pretended to be ignorant, I really don't know. I hope brother Camp can enlighten me. Camp coughed, the greatest advantage of goblins over slaves is their strong breeding ability and shorter maturity time. The cost and time spent on training a goblin cub into a skilled worker or farm slave are much lower than that of a slave baby. The breeding ability of goblins is also incomparable to that of slaves. An adult female slave can give birth to two to three goblin cubs at a time, and the pregnancy time is greatly shortened. The workload of two low-level goblins can completely replace that of a slave. If evolved into a big goblin, the workload of one big goblin can replace that of three adult slaves. Taking into account various factors, the cost of using goblins for the same work is much lower than that of using slaves, creating extremely high profits for us. Zach listened attentively to Camp's explanation. He asked, is it common for nobles to use goblins as slaves? Not common. Fatty Camp shook his head, his fat cheeks trembling, to use goblins in large quantities, it is necessary to completely isolate outsiders, at least not to be discovered by commoners. It is not suitable for big cities like Pune's port, only closed places like plantations and mines are suitable. Zach nodded slightly, Camp, to be honest, if I can become a noble after graduation, I also want to acquire my own industry. But the cost of buying slaves in bulk is extremely high, and if hiring commoners, we also have to consider wages, benefits, and vacation issues. That's why I am quite interested in goblins. A sly smile appeared on Camp's face, and his eyes almost squeezed into a slit. I see. That's great. He happily put his fat hand on Zach's shoulder, after I graduate this year, I can probably get a manor from my father and then I can sell you some goblins and female slaves at a low price behind the scenes. In return, Brother Zach naturally has to be sincere. I remember that the elven tribe will not violate their own oaths, right? I know that Brother Zach is not that kind of person, but such a risky matter must have multiple insurance. Once leaked, the church will not let the two of us off. Zach naturally moved his restless fat hand away and shook hands with him. I swear in the name of the elf clan that I will not disclose the information about goblin slaves to the outside world. If I break my oath. He boldly made up the consequences of breaking the oath. What does the oath of the elf Zack have to do with my goblin Zack? Good. Zack, you are indeed loyal. Kemp cheered, clapping his hands with a joyful mood. Let's go. I'll let you see the efficiency of goblin slaves first. In order to show sincerity, the two did not bring their own slaves this time. After a simple disguise, 
they sat in a plain looking carriage and left the port of Pune's. Last time we were supposed to play for a day when we left the city, but unfortunately we encountered an attack by cultists. Kemp complained, I hope nothing goes wrong this time. Zack nodded lightly, focusing on the scenery outside the window. Outside the city of Pune's, there were dense residential areas and shops along the main road. After the carriage left the city, it traveled several kilometers before the density of houses gradually decreased, interspersed with small and large green vegetable fields. A little further down the road is a large noble plantation. Kemp glanced at his pocket watch, the carriage has traveled more than half of the distance, it will take about half an hour more. Zach casually asked, what does your estate usually grow? Almost everything, and we also raise a lot of livestock. The main economic crop is cotton, slaves and cotton. Zach couldn't help but think of the plantation cases he had seen in the American South in his previous life. The carriage finally turned into a small road on the side of the road, with endless golden wheat fields on both sides, and thin and weak slaves with tan skin scattered among them. They were sweating profusely as they harvested the wheat. The slave owner wore a cowboy hat and rode a strong horse, wandering around the field, occasionally using magic to extend the whip and lash the slaves who slowed down in rhythm. Zach looked at all this with a gloomy expression. All these slaves were descendants of his former subjects. Zach, do you also think these slaves are no good? Kemp snorted, high training costs, often lazy, light beating has no deterrent effect, heavy beating can easily cause internal injuries, reducing work efficiency. In my opinion, the church should change the slave imprint, so that they cannot think of anything other than work in their minds. Zach turned around and gave him a cold glance, I really don't like slaves. Great minds think alike. Compared to slaves, I also prefer the cheap and useful goblins. Kemp raised his thumb, I'll arrange an exciting show for you later. The carriage meandered through the vast wheat fields, passed through a dense and unventilated forest, and finally arrived at Kemp's secluded estate. Young master. The slave guard saluted, who is this elf guest? The student council cadre from the academy, the future duke or general, Zach, my true brother who was closest to me in the academy. Kemp said proudly, as if these titles were his own, he is also my best true brother in the academy. The slave guard understood and opened the heavy iron gate engraved with exquisite carvings, congratulations to the young master for gaining another good brother. Zack intentionally or unintentionally glanced in Kemp's direction, you have quite a few brothers. Ahem. Kemp said softly, actually, those are just good brothers with whom I have had negative interactions. The relationship between me and Zack is naturally pure friendship, it's not the same thing. Of course, if Zack is willing, we can take it further. Zack's facial muscles twitched, then he smiled contentedly, unfortunately, I only like the education of love. Kemp pursed his lips, raised his fat belly and looked at the sky with his hands behind his back, as if nothing had happened. After passing through layers of tightly guarded walls and several watchtowers, the two finally arrived at the row of dilapidated grass huts where the goblins lived. The Zack brothers are lucky. Today happens to be the goblins' breeding day, Kemp said to Zack with a smirk. The people at the gathering will envy you. Breeding day. For goblins and female slaves? Zack asked calmly. He could already smell the goblin scent, along with the stench of debauchery. Yes. Goblins don't have a long lifespan to begin with, and with the heavy labor, they basically won't live for more than a few years, so they need to breed frequently, Kemp said nonchalantly. You don't need to worry about the goblins' food, no need to specially prepare meat. The dead goblins can conveniently satisfy their protein needs. If a female slave gets sick and dies, she can also be used to feed the goblins, as an extra meal for them. This, Zack was dumbfounded by the image of the pink little bugs in his mind. Who exactly are the goblins? Don't insult the goblins, Zack whispered, then looked at Kemp with interest. So, this can also save on the cost of handling the bodies. Kemp grinned widely. That's why I said goblins are so useful, perfect laborers in garbage disposals. After entering the grass hut, Zack's first impression was that he might be having a hallucination in the dim light. He had never seen goblins so thin. These goblins were hunched, emaciated, with abnormally long and twisted limbs, standing in line with a vacant expression. Not a single goblin reacted to their entry into the grass hut. They were like rows of bamboo worms, their skin covered with scars, and even if they fell dead the next second, it wouldn't be surprising. These laborers don't have much time left, and they won't last long, Kemp said, clicking his tongue as he appraised the goblins. I feel quite compassionate, letting them have a good time before they die. Zack didn't say anything. He just calmly watched as the servant with a whip commanded the front row of goblins to obediently walk to the center of the grassy area and lie down. Shoo, the servant immediately blew a whistle. The exciting show is about to begin. Kemp's expression became excited. Equally frail and emaciated slave girls, with protruding ribs, entered the grass hut from another door. Their bodies were dirty, 
and their numb eyes scanned the people who had entered, waiting obediently for instructions. They were not ashamed to be seen naked by men. They had long lost their sense of shame. Zack couldn't help but furrow his brow. Do you think this is a good sight? He now only felt deep disgust in nausea, as well as sympathy for the slaves and goblins. Kemp seemed to have misunderstood, turning his head to the respectful servant beside him. Order them to work harder, they need to be more passionate. It's no fun if they're like dead fish. The Zack brothers need to learn from our successful experience. Everything follows the young master's orders, the servant said with a fawning smile, then turned and changed his expression, roaring fiercely. Today, the beloved young master Kemp and the esteemed elven guests have come to inspect. You must give a 120% effort for this mating. Later, young master Kemp will score your performance. The highest scorer can have an extra meal, but the lowest scorer, he twisted his lips cruelly, that goblin will be your extra meal tonight. The slave girl's faces showed panic. Lazy ones, I hope you can show your true abilities. The servant glanced at his pocket watch and suddenly blew the whistle. Now, begin. The girls rushed forward, competing to provide service to the listless goblins. Don't take mine. Sorry, sisters, this is my partner. All the children I gave birth to before were its. I know you're tired, but I don't want to die, I'm sorry. Please, get up quickly, please. I'm sorry. Sniff. I didn't hurt you, did I? Several overseers walked back and forth behind the slaves, wielding whips. If any of the girls slowed down, they would unhesitatingly lash out. Are you not eating with such a small movement? Stupid pigs. How did I teach you usually? What are you doing? Ha! Huh? Lowly things are indeed useless. Can't even handle a goblin. That's enough. Zack finally couldn't help it and said to Kemp, Tell your men to stop. There's no need to intimidate them. It's counterproductive. You're wrong, Zack, my friend. Kemp said without looking back. This lazy bunch is like this. If you don't push them to the limit, they dare to slack off. Mild verbal reprimands no longer work on them. You have to constantly remind the slaves to make them fear you and be willing to listen to you. But there's no need to kill slaves today. Zack frowned, after all, they are your father's property. These lowly creatures are just consumables, can be replenished at any time. Kemp said indifferently, the elves are too kind-hearted, so it's normal for Zack, my friend, to not accept it for a while. Let me tell you, if you want to be a slave owner, you must be cruel, learn to establish authority, and often use examples to warn others, otherwise the slaves won't listen to you. The most effective way to establish authority is through elimination, which can both improve work efficiency and serve as a warning. Zack's fist slowly clenched. Thank you for your advice, Kemp, my brother. He gritted his teeth without changing his expression, I understand. After several rounds, both the goblins and the slaves were exhausted. Zack noticed that all the goblins seemed to have no interest in this, and some even showed obvious disgust. They had hardly had any proper rest, and their spirits were exhausted. But they still worked hard to cooperate with the slave girls. Be careful. Don't fall. Does it hurt? You seem to be bleeding again. Hold on. Don't fall, you'll die. These beastly humans. In front of those who didn't understand goblin language, these goblins were just chattering. Kemp clapped his hands and laughed, you see, these guys have a lot of energy again, they're having a great time. Goblins are indeed goblins. How satisfying is it for you, young man? Zack reluctantly nodded slightly, did these goblins not sleep? Oh, isn't the cotton ripe recently? It needs to be harvested within a few days, right? To ensure work efficiency, these goblins haven't closed their eyes for days, they've been working non-stop except for eating. Kemp showed a lecherous smile again, you see, even so, they still have enough energy for mating. They're much more useful than slaves. Zack casually asked, do the nearby nobles also use goblins? This whole area is secretly using them. Kemp admitted, if you want to buy a plantation after graduation, I suggest you come to this side. That way, it's convenient for me to sell you goblins. Zack nodded again, looking through the entire process. Along the way, a slave girl overexerted herself and collapsed on the ground. He was about to go to her rescue when Kemp stopped him. Zack, my brother, I know elves are soft-hearted but this is my family's property, not yours. Private property is sacred and inviolable. After becoming a slave owner, you can't be so soft-hearted. For a soft-hearted slave owner, the slaves will only take advantage. He then shouted to the slave girls, the lowest score is in. You can relax now. Young man, do not act rashly. Otherwise, you will undoubtedly deviate from your destined path. The pink insect felt the anger accumulating in Zack's mind and quickly reminded him, remember everything you see today, and repay these guys double in the future. The dice in Zack's pocket also began to heat up slightly, maintaining his outward calm. A neutral and illusory voice echoed in his ears, this sacrifice is necessary. A servant stepped forward, lifted the fainting girl, drew a long knife, 
and cut her throat with one stroke. Another servant brought a large basin, hung the girl upside down from the ceiling beam, and began to collect the blood. They treated the slaves just like they would slaughter a chicken. After the unbearable and lengthy process, Kemp began to score the female slaves, two points, four points, three points. He walked past, his face greasy and smiling kindly, unfortunately, three people received the lowest score of one point. The girls didn't even have the strength to stand up. The girl who was given a score of one point looked at their young master with sunken, pleading eyes, unable to say anything. Zack stared into their cloudy eyes and saw the heart-wrenching plea in despair. Like a blunt knife, it cut into his heart. Kemp, that's enough, he advised, didn't you already hang the lowest scorer? Kemp turned his head, revealing a cruel grin, the one just now was also one point. But since brother Zack is so merciful, I'll make an exception. Do you know about the slave arena in the capital, brother Zack? Arena? Zack suddenly had a bad feeling. Yes, the arena, Kemp's fat jiggled, you three, from now on, fight each other until one of you dies. The other two will be spared from the punishment of the lowest score. It's fair to exchange someone's life for your own, isn't it? Kemp kindly assessed the three frail female slaves, the layers of fat on his face making him look somewhat benevolent. This disgusting fat pig. The pink insect couldn't help but curse, young man, don't get agitated, don't fall for it. This is not your fault. She felt Zack's emotions like a volcano that had been building up for a long time, barely suppressed by a thin layer of indifference. And the pressure inside this volcano was still rising. Don't worry, elder, Zack took a deep breath, his whisper suddenly increasing in volume, brother Kemp, I have a suggestion. What suggestion? These three are as thin as sticks, even if they fight, it will be feeble. It won't look good, he said without changing his expression, first, feed them some meat for a few days, let them gain some muscle and strength, then the fight will be worth watching. Meat? That would be an additional cost. I'll pay for the meat, Zack interrupted Kemp's rhythm, you should also know that these three can't even stand up now, and if they fight, it will be a mess. I don't want to see a fight without strength. It's meaningless. With that, he took out the dice from his pocket and rolled it with his fingers. Three points. He rolled it again, and the dice changed to two points. Obviously, it was just an ordinary die now. The events of today did not belong to a critical point, so Zack couldn't use the power of the dice. He stared at Kemp coldly, or do you prefer to watch three sticks fight? Kemp seemed to be intimidated by Zack's aura and remained silent for a while. Fine, he finally said slowly, since brother Zack wants to see an exciting fight, I'll make an exception again to fulfill your wish. The slaves won't gain any muscle for a while. We'll see next time. As Kemp finished speaking, the three female slaves completely collapsed on the ground, motionless. Thank you. Kind. Sir. Zack heard the faint voice of gratitude. His expression did not change noticeably. After discussing the details of goblin work with Kemp, he left the grass house and got on a carriage back to the port of Puna's. In the middle of the night, the low, thick clouds covered the moon completely. In the manor, the last group of goblins, illuminated by the magic stone lamp and whipped, dragged their crumbling bodies back to the drafty thatched house. They did not speak to each other, huddling in silence. The cold autumn wind was biting, and it was the goblins' only means of resisting the cold without proper clothing. The human overseer skillfully filled the water bucket, extinguished the magic stone lamp, kicked the broken wooden door shut, and hung a heavy iron lock. I have to get up before dawn again to drive these beasts to work, he complained casually, but at least I'll have a change of shift the day after tomorrow. Can't keep my sweetheart in Puna's waiting too long his footsteps faded, and the manor returned to its calm state. Most of the goblins did not sleep. Their eyes glowed green in the darkness, as if waiting for something. After some time, the outside iron lock made a faint sound. Click. The broken wooden door creaked open a crack. A few gusts of cold wind entered the thatched house, causing many goblins to squeeze further inside. King? A goblin cub hesitantly asked, then immediately covered its mouth. The stuffy, foul air from inside the room seeped out through the crack. The wooden door slowly closed again. Although the goblins did not smell anything, they knew someone had entered. After the door closed, there was silence once more, unbearable and oppressive. Zack hid in the shadows, masking his scent, carefully sensing the situation inside the thatched house. He had already cleared the traps around the house. As he scrutinized the goblins' appearances, Zack recalled his time in the goblin caves. King, why do you want the students to become goblin kings as well? In the ancient city hall, Zack knelt on one knee, asking the aloof goblin king. The goblin king casually sat on the throne, idly running his fingers over the exquisite carvings on the armrest. Apart from them, there was not a single goblin in the hall. This was a secret summons. In addition to the reasons I told you before, there is another very important point, the goblin king lazily said, a goblin king is a superior race. 
Only by becoming a superior race can you have the independent strength to survive in this malicious world. A superior race is a watershed. Below the watershed, all living beings are mere ants in the face of fate, and any thoughts of resistance are just empty talk. No matter how you struggle, you are ultimately just a puppet of others. Above the watershed, you can gradually break free from others' control and truly take control of your own destiny. I don't need to emphasize the importance of this, do I? Taking control of his destiny, Zack listened earnestly and said again, King, I feel that I am just one step away from becoming a true goblin king, but no matter what methods I try, I cannot break through the bottleneck. I have a request, if I may. King, could you tell me how you became a goblin king back then? The goblin king's eyes grew even deeper. The flames burning on the torch were reflected in its eyes, like insignificant sparks. It straightened its posture. I also wandered for a long time. At that time, I was just like you, a little furball. I had no teacher, couldn't enter the academy, and spent my days hiding in the shadows of the city, living in constant fear, and dreaming of rescuing my beloved from the persecution of the church. But at that time, I was powerless. I had no help. I had to figure everything out on my own. It took me several years to break through as a goblin king. During that time, I also received news that my beloved was to be publicly executed for refusing the church's invasion. The goblin king's tone gradually became more excited, with a hint of urgency, boy, during that time, I was even more anxious than you. The deep, uncontrollable sense of powerlessness in the face of an established destiny, I still remember it vividly, until I witnessed the slaughter of my fellow slaves by humans, not sparing a single one. It closed its mouth and gazed calmly at the intense darkness deep in the hall. Zack remained quiet, patiently waiting. The only sound left in the hall was the faint crackling of burning flames. The Goblin King spoke slowly again, in fact, if you understand the key, breaking through as the Goblin King is not difficult. Let me give you a phrase. Born to be king, bear the weight of the king, and you will surely be king. After this, it depends on your insight. Zack silently pondered over these words, born to be king, bear the weight of the king, and you will surely be king. Born to be king should refer to possessing the talent of the Goblin King, a condition I have already fulfilled. The key lies in bearing the weight of the king. What does it mean to bear the weight of the king? Does king here refer to the meaning of a crown? Until the audience ended, Zack still hadn't figured it out and could only keep it in his heart for the time being. So, when the pink insect emphasized the importance of the academy and the potential opportunities, he once again thought of the Goblin King's experience, and then remembered this phrase. At that time, he still didn't understand. Now, as Zack gazed at the damp, foul-smelling thatched hut, crowded together, silently waiting for the goblin slaves, he suddenly understood something. There was a goblin sage hidden in this row of huts. The goblin sage had foretold Zack's arrival, and it used the word king. Not the possessor of the talent of the goblin king, but the goblin king. What do the goblins truly need in their fervent desire for a king? They want to no longer be oppressed, they want true freedom, they want. Zack's pupils suddenly contracted. Staring at the goblin's eyes, filled with anticipation, in that split second, all the scattered clues and hazy memories gradually connected in his brain, and the threads became clearer. At this moment, he finally understood the meaning of bearing the weight of the king. Weight refers to the fate of a race. Only by being recognized by the subjects and actively shouldering the heavy fate of the goblin race can one become the goblin king. Unconsciously, I began to actively want to change everything, to free all the slaves from endless oppression. To give them real freedom I must completely reverse the fate of the goblins and the slaves. At this moment, Zack felt the solid membrane begin to loosen. He no longer hesitated and stepped out from the shadows in the form of a goblin. The goblins in the room stopped breathing at that moment, all looking at the tall figure of Zack. King? King? Is it you, King? The sage said that the king would come here tonight to save us. The goblins excitedly whispered to each other. Some of them crawled forward, wanting to touch Zack's ankle. Zack calmly said, I am the Goblin King. I came here for one purpose. From now on, you are no longer slaves. You will gain true freedom. His aura began to surge, and all the magic automatically rushed toward the breaking membrane. The pink insect was working hard to guide the gradually agitated dark source and light source. Young one, your body is undergoing irreversible changes. Stay vigilant at all times and don't let your emotions control you. The goblins had waited for a very long time, and Zack could read from their eyes the heartfelt desire. Many goblins, despite being covered in wounds and with only a breath left, had persisted until today because of the prophecy of the goblin sage. They only wanted to witness the moment when fate was rewritten. The suppressed volcano in Zack's heart was slowly erupting. His body seemed to be cracking and burning. His face remained as calm as water. The king will bring us freedom. King. Freedom. 
The voices of the hunched goblins turned into solid strength, together with Zack's magic, attacking the gradually loosening membrane. He straightened his body, clenched his fists, and suppressed a roar from the depths of his lungs. The dark clouds in the sky were dispersing. Moonlight pierced through the clouds, streaming through the thatched roof, enveloping Zack's body and spilling onto the straw-covered ground. A goblin slave shed muddy tears and cried out, Please become our king! Please save us! King! We have waited too long! The membrane blocking Zack's breakthrough as Goblin King was continuously cracking. At this moment, the energy around Zack was spinning rapidly, and the pink insect inside him was desperately suppressing the chaotic energy. Young one, come on! The most critical moment is here. Zack's body had already expanded by a circle. He responded, I will live up to your expectations. An older goblin suddenly remembered something and hastily said, King, please put on the crown. After speaking, it regretted it. A group of slaves didn't even have a single coin, let alone a crown made of real gold and silver. But there's no crown. A young goblin said sadly. Zack struggled to maintain his body from being overwhelmed by the frenzied energy and said in a deep voice, It's okay. He quickly scanned the surroundings and soon found a dead, yellow thorn bush between the cracks where the load-bearing pillars were inserted into the ground. It was stained with some dried black blood. This was the blood of the goblin slaves. Zack stepped forward steadily. With each step, he endured the pressure of his body about to collapse and felt the painful baptism of fire. But Zack's actions were without hesitation, until he pulled out the thorn bush by the roots. He bent the thorns into a circle. Not too long, just the right length. He then pulled a piece of straw and secured the circular crown made of bent thorns. Not for power, not for fame, not for wealth, only to save the fate of the goblin tribe, to end the history of slavery filled with blood and tears. This is the crown of thorns, soaked in blood and tears. Zack gazed at the crown in his hand and slowly placed it on his head. This simple action became the final signal. The already fragile membrane completely shattered, and the uncontrollable energy and magic surged. A completely new set of information flooded into his mind. His body underwent a complete transformation at that moment. Just like the old goblin king, Zack's entire body erupted with a terrifying aura, and the pure aura of the superior race made the surrounding goblins prostrate in awe. He turned around, and his eyes, like those of the old goblin king, were deep and absorbed the surrounding light, including the moonlight peeking from the high sky. I am the goblin king. Several hours ago, at dusk, Zack, draped in a black robe, secretly contacted Yar through the pink insect. Let me guess. Admiring the real-time image of the white insects surrounding her, Yar smiled brightly. Are you inviting me to participate in your ritual to overthrow the Goblin King? I request your help. After some processing, Zack's voice and the image leaned more towards neutrality. What is it? Am I going to be the bait? Yar's smile did not fade. Yes. The escape of goblins and slaves will surely attract the army of Pernisport. I am willing to pay a certain price for you to attract attention openly. Then you owe me another favor. She tiptoed, spinning in place, there's no way around it, you're my little dog, after all. Zack pretended not to hear Yar's last words and elegantly bowed, thank you very much. I will definitely repay your kindness. After the contact ended, Yar put her hands back in front of her chest and began her daily routine of devout prayer, my lord, how could I be so ungrateful as to demand recompense from you? To dedicate my life to you is the greatest honor of my existence. The factory district of Puna's port. At this moment, Yar had changed into a revealing off-the-shoulder black evening gown with a magnificent train, standing on top of a giant factory chimney that pierced the clouds. The top of the chimney was extremely cold, but she painted no mind in her thin attire. Yar stood with her chest held high, eyes closed slightly, facing the wind, hands clasped at her abdomen. She was sensing the messages in the wind, or perhaps the divine oracle from the heavens. A new king will be crowned tonight. Yar's hands gradually spread out to the sides of her body. The end of the old world will begin tonight. Her long, fair arms extended over her head. In her right hand, she held a baton made of purple heart wood. At the peak of Puna's port, I will compose a new life for the king's birth. She slowly opened her eyes, her deep purple irises devoid of joy or sorrow. It seemed as if time in the entire world had momentarily stood still. Then, Yar's raised right hand cleaved through the air cleanly and decisively. Outside the city of Puna's, in one of the cemeteries, the white-haired gravekeeper was huddled in his small wooden house as usual. He had been carrying out this monotonous, repetitive work for decades. After making his usual rounds, he prepared to extinguish the dim oil lamp and go to sleep. As he lifted the lamp, the gravekeeper's movements became mechanical, gradually stiffening until they stopped altogether. He turned his head stiffly, his neck almost bent at 180 degrees, and his eyes stared fixedly at the gloomy cemetery outside the window. 
Among the rows of crosses and tombstones, a decaying, maggot-infested hand broke through the earth and reached menacingly toward the sky. In the cold wind, Yar closed her eyes in ecstasy, her face slightly flushed. It seemed as if there was an invisible orchestra in front of her, playing a grand symphony under her direction. I hear it. One, two, three. She murmured along with the beat. The buried things are gradually awakening, only to bury everything. In various cemeteries outside the city, one skeleton after another shattered their coffins, broke through the earth, and stood unsteadily. Their eye sockets gleamed with a ghostly white light. Maggots crawled up and down the corpses, manipulating their movements. Soon, the skeletons gathered together, forming a legion, and marched in perfect formation toward Puna's port under the cover of night. In the outer city area, a steam-powered ocean freighter slowly sailed into the harbor, preparing to dock for the day. The old captain, pipe in mouth, stepped out of the captain's cabin and habitually glanced at the sea, only to drop his pipe on the ground. At the boundary between the shimmering sea and the sky, a massive, dark behemoth was gradually rising from the depths. It was a dilapidated giant ship. Its enormous tattered sails billowed in the wind, and its charred masts pierced the sky. It's a ghost ship, one of the sailors exclaimed, having also seen it. The sailors excitedly rushed to the ship's railing, watching the majestic ship. Thank goodness it's not encountered at sea. It dares to loiter near Puna's port. This will be quite a spectacle. Their chattering voices gradually faded away. Two, three, four. Enormous ghost ships rose in succession from the seabed, following behind the lead ship. Their spacing was almost equal, forming a formation heading straight for Puna's port. Compared to the awestruck crew, the fear in the old captain's eyes grew more intense. Finally unable to contain himself, he shouted, this could only be the fleet of annihilation. The legendary fleet of annihilation from the eastern continent. What are you all standing there for? Run. A sailor asked, why should we run? The defenses of Puna's port have always been impregnable. At that moment, everyone saw clearly that a flash appeared on the first giant ship. A sharp whistle tore through the night sky, and a section of the outer city wall of Puna's port exploded. Wearing a crown of thorns on his head, Zack gazed at the goblin slaves waiting around him and said loudly, Tonight, I will lead you to liberate the slaves and break through the cages. His palm opened, feeling something, and suddenly clenched into the air. Inside the thatched hut, the shackles on the goblin's feet instantly broke with a loud noise. Smash the chains. The goblins shouted in unison, smash the chains. A voice angrily shouted, what the hell are they babbling about? Looks like some goblin bastards are going to die. A nearby overseer, awakened by the noise, carried a long whip and kicked open the broken wooden door, standing dumbfounded. The goblins inside all looked at him in unison, their faces calm. Zack smelled the strong bloody scent of goblins and slaves on the overseer, and said in a deep voice, an eye for an eye. His palm curved inward again. At the same time, the overseer was suspended in the air, struggling desperately, ah, uh, help. It seemed as if an invisible hand was choking him. Zack coldly watched all of this, and his five fingers closed instantly. The overseer's neck burst open, and his body, gushing with blood, fell to the ground. An eye for an eye. The goblins roared. Go pick up your weapons and liberate all our suffering brethren. Zack tossed the terrified overseer's head aside, stepped over the headless body, and led the goblins to other thatched huts. Behind them, the thatched huts were ablaze, shining brightly in the night sky. Enemy attack. The alarm sounded in the port of Pernus, and countless windows were lit up again. Sharp whistles filled the various military camps as soldiers in armor or armed with swords and guns immediately rushed out of the barracks. The silver-ranked adventurers responsible for guarding and the higher races quickly returned to their posts, listening to the communication soldiers report the situation. The dark airships roared with the sound of propellers as they ascended into the sky, carrying soldiers or ammunition. On the inner city of Pernisport, several jet-black giant cannons adjusted their angles and fired at the huge fleet on the sea. The shells hit several giant ships accurately. Flames erupted on their decks, but quickly and strangely extinguished. The giant ships remained unscathed, and this seemed to be a signal. On all the giant ships, the fire at the muzzles began to flicker like stars. The deafening roar of the fire and the rain rushed straight towards the port of Pernus. For freedom, more and more goblins joined Zack's team. Without exception, they had all been persecuted as slaves. A big goblin shouted loudly, King, please let us liberate the slaves of other races together. They are all victims. Zack said in a deep voice, that's why I'm here. To liberate all the slaves. His voice, though not loud, clearly reached the ears of all the goblins. In response to Zack's words, the goblins raised farming tools such as sickles and shovels as weapons, and enthusiastically rushed into the dormitories of slaves of various races, freeing them from their shackles. The goblins who could barely speak the common language shouted awkwardly, suffering. 
Brother, run with me towards freedom. Fight for freedom. We don't have to be slaves anymore. Destroy those beasts. The slaves, who had been so abused and had long been numb, stared blankly as their shackles were removed. The sudden turn of events left many of them momentarily stunned. Seeing this, the dice in Zack's pocket prompted, Zack. Of course, I know what to do, he said, taking a clean white cloth handed to him by a nearby goblin and pouring the blood of an overseer onto it. The white cloth was instantly dyed red with blood. Zack tied the red cloth to a long wooden pole, making a simple red flag. He forcefully planted the red flag into the ground. An invisible aura quickly spread out in all directions. All the slaves were filled with spirit, and many of them shed tears on the spot, freedom. I don't want to be a slave anymore. Bring back my family. Bring them back. I don't want to see any more children die in humiliation like my daughter. There shouldn't be slaves in this world. The red flag was like a torch, breaking the brainwashing effect imposed on the slaves by the church, igniting their withered hearts, and igniting the flame called rebirth. Soon, the second, the third. The bloodstained red flags rose one after another from the darkness, accompanied by countless burning torches and the bright eyes of the slaves. Watching all this, Zack couldn't help but think of a sentence he had seen in his previous life, what the proletarians have lost is only the chains, and what they will gain is the whole world. Well, you have learned to use your special abilities, the dice whispered satisfactorily, the stage is set for you. Offer a salute to the birth of a new era. Zack saw the distant port punas, where countless sparks rose into the sky, bursting into brilliant flames. Slave rebellion. Suppress quickly. Eliminate all the leaders. Well-equipped slave guards quickly arrived under the command of the steward, but when they saw the swaying red flags, they all froze in place. What's going on? The steward shouted in frustration, I am your master. Carry out my orders. He muttered under his breath, but the terrifying fact was that the slave marks deep within the bodies of these slave guards did not respond to his coercive commands. The control of the slave owner over the slaves had failed. The slave guards looked at each other, and then one by one, they stabbed the steward, who was unable to react in time, directly in the chest. I don't want to listen to your orders to kill my fellow brothers anymore, you scoundrel. Plantation after plantation was set ablaze, and red flags rose one after another. The slaves picked up hoes and hammers, and erupted into fierce conflicts with the nobles. The noble masters could not understand why the slaves, who had always allowed themselves to be exploited, had completely broken free from their control and raised the butcher's knife in revenge. They, who had always been high and mighty, dominating the fate of the slaves, now faced the awakening of the vast slaves and were nothing more than paper tigers. Smash the chains. An eye for an eye. Blood for blood. Fight for freedom. One noble villa after another raised the red flag, and many nobles who had mistreated the slaves in the past were directly hacked to death by the angry slaves, their bodies hanging outside the windows. But not all the nobles and their lackeys were weak and easy to bully. The noble guard, composed not of slaves, engaged in a fierce battle with the ragged slaves. What is the church doing? What are those people in Port Punas doing? The terrified nobles cowered in the fortress, complaining loudly as they observed the crowd holding torches through the crenellations. I have never evaded taxes, and have always been loyal. Why didn't they come to defend us immediately at this critical moment? Because they are also in dire straits. A clear female voice sounded, and a woman with blood-colored long hair stepped steadily up the stairs, her long sword stained with blood. She was Floor. Who are you? Did you command them to rebel? Did you make my slaves no longer obey my orders? The nobleman said reluctantly, his body trembling uncontrollably. The appearance of this woman meant that his personal guard was completely finished. I don't have that ability, Floor, with bloodstains on her face, smiled, and these people have never been slaves, nor do they belong to you. The only master of their destiny is themselves. Do you remember me? Upon hearing this, the nobleman's heart skipped a beat, and he stared intently at Floor's face. He finally remembered something. You, you, you. You should still remember that little girl, right? Führer approached step by step her bright red long hair flying behind her. That day, in front of her, you held down her only good friend, and peeled her skin off, one by one, until that poor child's screams went hoarse, and she died in agony. You said, if I didn't obediently listen to you, I would meet the same fate as her. The noble's face turned liver-colored. He fell to the ground, desperately pressing against the wall. You, you can't be that obedient child. You're the devil wearing her skin. Führer's advancing steps briefly paused. The smile disappeared from her face. You're right, the obedient little Fuhrer who could endure any torture and obey is dead. Now, I am the devil returned from hell. Fuhrer's bright red hair flew into the air, and with a sudden stomp of her right foot, a huge sacrificial circle appeared beneath her. Come, I will return all the pain that child suffered back to you. The noble saw a huge tentacle extend from Fuhrer's back, 
No longer caring about his image, he screamed, Don't kill me. I'll give you as much money as you want, I have plenty of money. Of course, I won't kill you right away. Fuhrer's voice began to sound ethereal. That would be too cheap for you. At the top of the fortress, the noble's pig-like screams echoed through the sky. Huff, huff. Fuhrer was covered in blood, standing with her eyes closed at the top of the fortress, her bright red hair swaying in the cold wind. On the ground, there were only a few clothing fragments and struggling bloodstains left. The fed tentacle affectionately stroked her head, then retracted into the gradually dimming sacrificial circle. Fuhrer, you have avenged. You have successfully avenged your deceased friend. You are no longer the weak and incompetent obedient child. Fuhrer muttered to herself, trying to comfort herself. She thought this would be a satisfying revenge, but she did not taste much of the pleasure of revenge. The words of the Lolita merchant no. One rejecting her echoed in her ears again, you are not like us. No. 86, you are only suitable to be a good person. The best ending is to find a good master and live a simple and happy life. Don't define me at will. Fuhrer instinctively shouted, I have found the most suitable path. I have successfully freed myself from slavery and avenged that child. I am no longer the same as before. Look, so many people agree with Zack and me. If that child knew in heaven, she would surely be pleased. Pleased? The voice of the Lolita merchant sounded again, cleanly interrupting her, once a person's consciousness completely dissipates, there is nothing left. Your friend has long returned to dust. Heaven and hell, reincarnation and transmigration, are all fabrications of the church to tame and brainwash slaves. You should have known this long ago. So, there's no need to use your long dead friend as a shield. You just want to cut off your former self, the obedient child too weak to resist. Your revenge is only to satisfy your own spiritual needs. Like your idol Zack, you disguise yourself as an indestructible false appearance. You firmly believe that the so-called only path is also the same. A drowning person grasps at a straw and deludes themselves into thinking it's absolute truth. Fuhrer clenched her fists, her nails deeply embedded in her flesh. No, you are the one who's wrong. She was almost going mad, punching the battlement at the top of the fortress. The path described by Zack is the only solution, to let the oppressed slaves rise up and fight for their own destiny and freedom. The voice of the Lolita merchant suddenly approached. That voice sharply said, is that so? Will the church, which holds the power of speech, just sit back and watch the slaves completely overturn? The gods in the sky will allow their long-standing rule to be completely shaken? Four suddenly couldn't speak. Compared to slaves, the enemy has overwhelming strength without any suspense. Take a closer look at the crowd below, four. They have nothing but hot blood, no mature guiding ideology, no effective struggle program, and no power to resist the enemy. Do you think this purely emotional and violent resistance will succeed? Slaves have always been at the bottom of society, and there have been many commoners who sympathized with their tragic fate. After tonight's bloody riot, there will be no more commoners standing on the side of the slaves. Similarly, the vast majority of people's understanding of slaves will change from sacred and inviolable private property to a threat that must be completely eliminated. Fuhr stared blankly at the swaying red flag in the night and the flames and black smoke rising in the air. Be careful of your former master, Zack, the voice of the merchant lowly returned to calm. He caused all this not just to change the fate of the slaves. He obviously has other purposes. Fuhr shook her head desperately, you're talking nonsense. Who are you? Whether it's nonsense or not, you can wait for the outcome tonight, he <laughs> he. The voice suddenly chuckled softly, as for who I am? I have always been you. A few days ago, after Zack successfully took the divine strike of the Mother of the Moon, the underground casino was deserted. Undercover Yar was talking to the dice, see the end of chapter 87 of volume 2. Before breaking through to the superior race, no matter how much divinity is given, it can only be maintained for a short time. Once the concentration of divinity decreases, the humanity of that body will rise again. Too much humanity is prone to accidents and deviating from the path of destiny. He is very likely not to actively raise the banner of rebellion at that time. He is not stupid and knows that such a riot is bound to fail and ultimately will doom the lives of those slaves. His human nature will definitely hinder the plan. So, when Zack breaks through to the superior race, I will immediately inject a large amount of divinity to completely suppress his humanity. In this way, he will completely transform into a qualified vessel. Yar listened attentively to the dice's words, holding several colorful casino dice in her hand. She sighed, they are all the descendants of the gods, after all. If there were other choices, I really wouldn't want to sacrifice them. The dice said indifferently, this is a necessary sacrifice. If they knew that all this was for the revival of the once-worshipped gods, most people would be willing to sacrifice themselves. 
Moreover, we have given them the opportunity to vent, to seek revenge on the slave owners and nobles, haven't we? Dying on the path to freedom, this kind of death is already fitting. You're close to rise, so, the symphony I conducted that day is not only the birth of a new king, but also the lament of destruction. The dice said lightly, the birth of a king is destined to be accompanied by countless dry bones. In the cheering crowd, Zack looked coldly in the direction of Puna's port. These slaves seeking freedom were composed of goblins, dwarves, humans, orcs, and other races. Despite their different appearances and habits, they were united for the same goal of pursuing freedom. Tonight, they had no barriers. He turned to a goblin little one, goblin sage, the water has been muddied. It's time to notify the tribe to evacuate. Evacuate? The goblin sage was stunned, king, are only goblins involved in the evacuation? Yes, Zack said in a deep voice. A big goblin interjected, what about the slaves of other races? Zack looked calmly at it, I am the goblin king, not the king of everyone. I am only responsible for the goblins. The goblins around him fell silent. Now is indeed the best time to retreat. The slaves are completely intoxicated with the emotions of freedom and revenge, their eyes bloodshot. After killing the nobles and their families, some of them began to wave their butcher knives at the fleeing civilians, shouting, anyone who stands with the nobles and the church is a beast. Eliminate the followers of the light god. They are the ones who persecute us the most. Settle the score with them. Fight for freedom. Many slaves who realized that something was wrong began to intervene, but their opposing voices were drowned out in the increasingly extreme tide. It is obvious that the slave revolt is getting out of control. Observing the scene around him, the little goblin sage lowered his head and said, King, we will follow you completely and retreat with you. Before that, I dare to ask one thing. Some female slaves have fallen in love with their own kind. If they are willing, can we take them with us? In the process of breeding goblins for the nobles, the tormented female slaves have been treated gently by the slave goblins. The nature of the slave goblins is goblin, and they do not want to force the miserable female slaves. They have become the only light and redemption in the dark and hopeless lives of the female slaves. For a long time, many female slaves have fallen in love with the slave goblins because of this. When breeding, they mostly choose the goblin they are familiar with. After listening to the sage's explanation, Zack nodded gently and said, Okay, I leave this matter to you to arrange. After hearing the goblin sage's profuse thanks, he looked again in the direction of the port of Puna's elder. In any case, the studies at the academy still need to be completed. Rita and Red Soros are important to the plan. The pink insect did not answer. She had passed out from exhaustion after helping Zack break through the Goblin Queen. Zack said to the goblin next to him, find me a good room. The goblin bowed and said, I will arrange it for you. After a moment, Goblin King Zack lifted the magic that isolated him from the outside world and walked out of the room. Has the matter arranged by the goblin sage been taken care of? Report to the king, it has been arranged. Very well. Depart immediately. The goblins and some female slaves ran towards the vast jungle outside the plantation, while the already fanatical slaves did not notice. After some time, a handsome male elf walked out of the room. He was the elf Zack. The separation of the dark source and the light source is a bit more complicated than expected. Zack looked down at his tattered clothes and smiled. Next, I have to go retrieve floor. Ah 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 dash fire. Get the buckets. Explosions everywhere. Help. Save my child, he's still down there. Smoke billowed from the outer city of the port of Punas. Many buildings were destroyed in an instant, and flames ignited one building after another. The civilians who were killed in their sleep were the luckiest, as they had not yet experienced much pain, the residents who were lucky enough to survive were trapped under the rubble, and many of those who ran into the streets were engulfed in flames caused by the explosions. These flames from the cannon were not normal. Conventional firefighting methods were of little effect. The civilians engulfed in flames cried out in agony until they gradually burned into motionless black charcoal. What is the church doing? What is the government doing? An angry civilian looked towards the higher inner city, doesn't the port of Punas have so many strong people? Why aren't they coming to protect us? Compared to the outer city, the inner city was calm and peaceful, untouched by the attacks. The shells launched by the giant ship exploded in the air or were shot down directly before hitting the buildings. The government and the church clearly had the ability to deal with the intensive bombardment, but they did not care about the life and death of the outer city's civilians. Oh 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 dash damn. Inside the port of Puna's noble academy, most of the noble children were awakened by the sound of the cannons and rushed out of the dormitories. With the help of telescopes or farsight spells, they quickly noticed the huge fleet on the sea, the demon clan's fleet? It doesn't look like it from the outside. This seems to be a ghost ship. The legendary ghost ship that only exists in stories? How can so many appear at once? Will they come to attack us? 
Do you think it's possible? The government always prioritizes the safety of the nobles. Many people even bought snacks from Rita's snack shop, eating and chatting while watching this grand fireworks display. Alphany, in her pajamas, yawned, I have to record this once in a lifetime ghost fleet. Oh, I forgot to bring my notebook. She hurried back and inadvertently heard the worried voice of the elf Miss Hippie, there's a fire in the outer city area. Are those civilians okay? Shouldn't they need help? Ah, watching the flames rising and the continuous explosions in the outer city area, a female student from a civilian background let out a loud scream. She then covered her mouth and sat weakly on the ground. My home is in the area that's on fire. Dad. Mom. Alphany frowned, fought for a moment, and still ran back to the dormitory. She still felt that it was more important to hurry and record the ghost fleet. Hippie ran up and said, Classmate, do you need my help? I can take you to the outer city area to save your family. Miss. The blue-haired slave anxiously reminded her, Don't help others recklessly. The outer city area is very dangerous right now. The civilian female student looked at Hippie with teary eyes and a trembling voice, Are you willing to take me there? I have a few civilian classmates I know, and their homes are also in the outer city area. I'm sorry. Hippie said helplessly, bowing her head, my abilities are limited. I can probably only help one person. Truly a hypocritical elf who likes to act like a big shot. Fatty Compu, holding snacks, joined the lively conversation of the noble children, wanting to help people, but because you're useless, you can only help one person, huh? So many civilian students' homes are in the outer city area, how can you possibly help them all, stupid elf? Hippie protected the trembling civilian female student and turned to glare at him. So what if I'm hypocritical and useless, can only help one person? Unlike you, who just stands there foolishly, bringing shame to the honor of the nobles. Then I wish you'd die in the gunfire. Compu saw their retreating figures and casually threw round cookies into his mouth. It's hard to reason with a damn ghost. At the highest point of the inner city area factory in Pernisport, you looked at the outer city area where fires were raging due to the bombardment of the fleet, and then glanced at the unscathed inner city area. Her commanding movement stopped. My lord, it's time for a break. Her narration was gentle and pleasant. The chapter symbolizing new life has come to an end. Next, I will play the dirge of destruction. The capital city, the grand cathedral of Wolfgang. A cardinal in red hurried past several brightly colored stained glass windows, and his reflection was clearly reflected on the floor-to-ceiling windows. He walked towards the center of the cathedral. The pope, wearing a crown, stood under the magnificent dome, silently looking up at the painting on the ceiling. Your holiness. The Pope turned around, his face still wrinkled and expressionless, something happened in Pernisport? Yes. The Cardinal stopped about five steps away from the Pope. He spoke as briefly as possible, during the fall of the gods period, the legendary fleet that destroyed the eastern continent reappeared after thousands of years. They are shelling Pernisport. The Pope nodded gently, I would like to hear your opinion first. The fleet that destroyed the eastern continent is a creation of impure gods, directly involved in the war of the gods. Apart from that, we know very little about them. I believe that the current defense forces in Pernisport are not enough to deal with them. The archbishop in red robes bowed and said, I request that you recall the brave squad and immediately expel the invading fleet of the annihilated country. I'm sorry, I cannot promise you that, replied the pope. Your holiness, why is that? A hint of surprise flashed in the archbishop's eyes. The pope did not respond immediately. He closed his eyes and removed the crown from his head. Just now, the demon realm, which has been strategically defended for nearly a century, suddenly launched a full-scale attack on the human realm. The demon king tore up the ceasefire agreement and openly destroyed several fortresses. The demon god has already set foot on the human realm. The archbishop was speechless. Besides the brave squad, several gold-ranked adventurers have gone to resist the invasion of the demon king, such as the sword maiden of the water capital. The pope sighed, we also need to ensure the defense forces of the royal capital and key fortress cities. So, we can only rely on the port of Pernus. As the Pope was about to leave, the Archbishop hurriedly said, Your Holiness, there is still a situation in the port of Pernus that has not been reported. A slave uprising? For the first time, the Pope's usually calm face showed a slight change. Yes. Preliminary judgment indicates that an invisible force is rapidly spreading, causing the slave marks imposed by the gods to lose their effect. The Archbishop said in confusion, The Church is studying the reasons for the failure of the slave marks and brainwashing effects. The fleet of the annihilated country, the slave uprising, the port of Pernus, the invasion of the demon king. The Pope murmured, pacing back and forth, it seems that there are pawns who want to become players. Are you referring to the entrance of the divine game? The chosen ones did all this? The Pope did not respond, continuing to gaze at the painting on the dome. After the Archbishop left, 
he scrutinized the portraits of the gods of light and darkness, squinting his eyes. Now we can only wait for the attitudes of the gods. A fleet of airships carrying several silver-ranked adventurers took off one after another, heading straight for the giant ghost fleet on the sea. Dozens of steam-powered ironclad ships sounded their whistles as they sailed out of the military port behind the giant pillars supporting the inner city. There is hardly any information. Many generals at the naval headquarters frowned, discussing how to effectively deal with the suddenly appearing ghost fleet. We asked the royal capital, and they only know that this should be the fleet of the annihilated country in the eastern continent. Wasn't that fleet swept into the dust of history along with the eastern continent long ago? Why did it suddenly appear at this critical moment? Even the attacks of gold-ranked adventurers have little effect. The only thing to be grateful for is that our defense forces can withstand the bombardment of the fleet of the annihilated country. The commander, with his hands behind his back, gazed at the huge black ships on the sea, forming a dark mass. Do you think it is necessary to ask the city lord at the level of a demigod to intervene in the current situation? It seems that they have no intention of landing in the port of Pernus at the moment. A general said thoughtfully, it is very likely to evolve into a protracted war, or we can only wait for this fleet to retreat on its own. What about the counter super magic? The situation arose suddenly, and we are currently hastily preparing the corresponding personnel and materials. What about the gold-ranked adventurers proficient in super magic? Several gold-ranked adventurers are unwilling to use super magic that consumes too much, and the only silver-ranked adventurer proficient in super magic is serving at the Pernus Noble Magic Academy and is not a member of the military, currently in a state of being out of contact. The commander criticized in a deep voice. Pernus Port has been peaceful for a hundred years, and the city defense has slackened to this extent. Issue the order to spare no effort and accelerate the deployment of super magic. Yes. Yar stood upright, looking up at the dozens of military airships flying overhead. The airships were surrounded by defensive magic formations, intercepting all the bullet-like shells. They fired at the giant fleet on the sea. But like the attacks from other directions, they did not cause any damage to the giant fleet. The tattered black warship was under attack from airships, city defense cannons, and ironclad warships, with explosions going off one after another, but it remained unscathed. Soon, the port of Punas will use super-dimensional magic, your smile as she gazed at the massive fleet, her fair arm holding the command baton reaching towards the sky. Her arm suddenly struck down vertically, and her black off-shoulder dress fluttered in the wind, turning blood red in an instant. White stripes flowed on the crimson hem of her dress. Yar's shoulder-length black hair gradually turned white, swept up by the howling wind, scattering like an unnamed white flower in full bloom. Her smiling face gradually turned frenzied, to my forever lost homeland. Oh lost giant ship, at this moment, reenact a fragment of the Battle of the Gods. As soon as she finished speaking, the gun ports of the massive fleet on the sea surface suddenly changed. They all turned a conspicuous crimson. The situation has changed, be on guard. The commander in the airship was the first to notice this, immediately ordering the silver-ranked adventurers to deploy high-level magic defense. However, the incoming shells easily pierced through the airship's multiple layers of defense magic, as if they were made of paper. What? The silver-ranked adventurer decisively jumped out of the cabin, while the commander and other soldiers had not even reacted yet. Boom! Several airships were directly penetrated by the shells, causing violent explosions. Boom! The steam-powered ironclad ship that had just left the port of Punas was broken in half, with naval soldiers and ship fragments flying into the air together. Boom! A series of small mushroom clouds suddenly rose from the inner city area of the port of Punas. Warning! All defenses have failed. Warning! All defenses have failed. Faced with the sudden turn of events, the nobles in the aristocratic area, who were still watching the fireworks, were all stunned. Before they could react, a sharp sound rang out, and the shells exploded above their heads. The naval commander stared at the unstoppable, directly approaching death god, leaving behind a final sentence, immediately informed the old lord of the city. Yer spread her arms, gazing intoxicatedly at the dozen or so airships above her turning into burning meteors, trailing long tails of flames as they fell towards the sea. Whether noble or commoner, death will be given equally to all. She suddenly tore off a piece of crimson hem and tied it to the command baton, making a rough red flag. Yar stared at the red flag and said with a smile, go and fulfill your mission. With a toss, the red flag fell towards the industrial area below, sinking into the darkness. Ah, without the command baton, it's not very convenient to perform. She reached into her close-fitting dress from her chest and elegantly pulled out a brand new purple sandalwood command baton. Luckily it's big enough, otherwise you'd have to tie it to your leg. Another voice sounded in her head. Brother, you're in a good mood today, even teasing me. Yar smiled, once again raising the command baton. 
I am indeed very happy to see the warships of my homeland again. The voice said, don't keep the gods waiting too long. Yar, continue to perform. Okay. Although located on a mountain, the Puna's Magic Noble Academy was not spared. Several shells broke through layers of defense and hit within the academy's range, exploding loudly. The noble children who had placed themselves outside the battlefield to watch, chat, and eat snacks were suddenly in disarray, fleeing. Mom! This way, run! Hongdo carried the frightened Rita, weaving through the crowd, fleeing to the other side of the mountain, the opposite slope area. The snack shop has been destroyed. Zack will be sad when he sees it, I've let him down. Rita turned back, looking at the flames rising into the sky in the darkness. Hongdo comforted her, as long as mom is okay, dad won't be angry. The snack shop can be reopened in the future, open as many as you want. Rita thought of something and asked anxiously, Red Bean, where is Zack now? Red Bean was also unsure of where Zack had gone, so he could only reply, Dad is very capable, he will definitely be fine. Rita nodded gently, but the worry on her face did not fade. Fuller was being carried by the elf Zack as they ran, not knowing what to say along the way. He forcibly took her away from the battlefield between the slaves and the nobles, passed through the bombed city gate, and went against the fleeing crowd without any explanation. He only said one thing, Fuller, I need your help, please go back to protect Rita and Red Soros. Zack, what do you want to do? I will explain to you later. I have something important to do. Zack seemed unwilling to waste time on conversation. After sending Fuller far away to be with Rita and Red Bean, he disappeared into the shadows, using the powerful perception of the upper race to carefully search. Soon, he found the target of this trip. Fatty Camp was busy packing various luggage with the slaves and bodyguards in a panic. They hid in a secluded place for fear of being robbed in the chaos. Princess Port is no longer safe. I have to find my father, the city councillor. I don't think so. Camp raised his head at the words and immediately showed a surprised smile. Brother Zack, you came at the right time. Can you protect me to go to the city government? I will give you a considerable amount of gold. Zack stood with his hands in his pockets, leaning casually against the wall. Are you going to run to the manor outside the city? Of course not. Zack, haven't you heard the news? Camp asked in surprise, the slaves outside the city have revolted. My family's manor is probably more dangerous than the academy. We need to run to the capital, that's our family's headquarters. Zack said indifferently, there's no need for that. It's good to stay at the academy. Good, the ghost fleet is about to land. The army in Princess Port is all useless. Camp's words were intense, shaking the fat on both sides of his cheeks. Brother Zack, you are smarter than me, can't you see how the battle is going? The lord of the city has not made a move yet. Zack casually stretched out his hands, and you misunderstood me. I think it's best for you to stay at the academy forever. Camp and the others were stunned. Zack twisted his hands in the air, and flames ignited on everyone except Camp, and the tongues of fire soared into the sky. Ah, these people died in the flames caused by the explosion of the shells. He listened to the screams of the slaves and bodyguards, and said indifferently. You. You. Camp, who was frightened, became incoherent, his face turned pale, and he struggled to crawl back. Zack watched as he crawled into the room and calmly said, and you, will die right in the center of the explosion. He clasped his hands together, and the joints of his fingers suddenly bent. There was a bang. The house in front of Zack instantly exploded, and the heat and flames soared into the sky. Without looking back, he turned and left, with flames dancing wildly behind him. If the elf Zack wanted to continue his studies at the academy, he had to kill Camp. Only he and the people in the manor knew that he had gone to see the slave goblin before the slave revolt. And the slave goblins had all evacuated tonight, and the people who knew about the manor were either the rebellious slaves or had been killed by the slaves. Once Camp knew about this, he would definitely suspect that something was wrong with him. The bombardment of the eastern continent's fleet brought chaos and opportunities, allowing Camp and the others to die in the gunfire. Just in case, he even contacted Yar to ensure that the snack shop would be shelled after Rita and the others ran out. He had also made prior arrangements with his teacher Lana on how to explain his disappearance to the academy, in order to accelerate Zack's progress in learning advanced magic, they held private lessons in a secluded location cut off from the outside world. This left Floor as the only variable. I should kill her on the other side of the slave plantation and erase all traces, but that would make it inconvenient to explain to the academy why I was having private lessons while my slave went missing, Zack hurriedly made his way to the outer city, and my body seems to instinctively resist the idea of killing Floor. The influence of humanity still lingers within you, a voice emanated from his pocket dice, but as time changes, divinity will thoroughly cleanse this body for your use. Zack nodded, very well. I'm quite busy tonight. I'm back here again, Zack, or rather the human Lu Jia, 
opened his eyes. Before him lay a vast wilderness, immersed in eternal twilight. Zack, congratulations on breaking through to the upper race, he turned his head and saw the dice, now a size larger than last time, rolling aimlessly on the grass. I don't think this is a time for congratulations, Zack recalled everything. He had just broken through to the upper race, only to be forcibly returned to the wilderness. He felt something was amiss, dice, can you explain the situation? Of course, of course, the dice stopped and faced him, showing a two, you have completed the task of guiding the slaves to rebellion, and are now carrying out the follow-up plan to go to the outer city of Pernus to save Hype and improve her favor. Guiding the slaves. Ah, Zack's eyes widened suddenly, what did you say? A little something happened. The dice did not conceal anything, and told him everything, so, now your divinity is dominating your body. Because I cannot directly lead the slaves to revolt, you arranged such a play. Zack said calmly, in that case, why not just completely eliminate my humanity and keep only the divinity? His original plan was to withdraw only the goblin slaves after becoming an upper race, and temporarily not consider freeing all the slaves. The reason was simple, there were not yet the conditions for a successful slave uprising, and a sudden and immature uprising would only result in the needless loss of slave lives. His original arrangement was to start with Floor by his side, combining the reality of the other world with the guiding thoughts of his past life gradually finding a difficult but truly successful path. Whether it was due to the equality thoughts of his past life or because the slaves in this life were descendants of the people of God, Zack knew deeply that the process of the new world replacing the old world would inevitably be accompanied by a large amount of bloodshed, and would inevitably have to completely overthrow the church that held absolute authority in the gods above. This was not something that could be accomplished overnight. So, he wanted to minimize the sacrifices during the process, and take the least detours, but all of this was disrupted by the dice, Yur, the goo god, and the other divinity that dominated him. Zack was extremely angry at the dice's surprise attack and the infusion of divinity, directly treating a large number of slaves as sacrifices on the path to godhood. But the experience of his past life told him not to let emotions take over at any time, otherwise the only chance of turning the tables would be lost. Now, he was thinking more calmly and quickly, trying to find an opportunity to break the deadlock, since my humanity is an unstable factor that hinders the plan, why not just cleanly eliminate it, rather than choosing to preserve my humanity? The dice thought for a while before answering, its explanatory voice carrying a hint of surprise. Because your humanity is very important. Although it may hinder the trajectory of fate, it is indispensable for becoming a god. The dice originally thought that this betrayal would directly break through Zack's humanity, even leading to a complete breakdown, falling into rage and madness, or even despair. Anyway, his humanity was completely suppressed, imprisoned in the wilderness, and any action could only be impotent rage. At that time, it would add, very good, keep it up. This would make it easier for it to completely control the unstable mental state of humanity and continue its plan. Darkening or paranoid lunatics are often the best to control, just like goblin slayers. Although the goblin slayer is not affected by the bad luck of the gods throwing dice, as long as the gods tell him where the goblins are through various means, they can bring him there, such as indirectly eliminating the troublemaking dark elves by eliminating the goblins, thereby achieving the goal or expectation of a certain god. The goblin slayer's life has been completely tied to the elimination of goblins. So, although he is a special piece that is not affected, he is equivalent to being indirectly controlled by the gods. When he appeared in the goblin cave and encountered Zack, it was also the handiwork of a certain god who did not want Zack to become a god. But Zack was not unprepared. The dice and the witch god had already anticipated that Zack, who was originally an important part of the light god, would definitely be guided by hostile gods to target the goblin slayer. If the goblin slayer insisted on killing Zack, then the witch god's follower, Yar, would directly turn against him and completely wipe out the goblin slayer team present. She even had a reason to explain to the adventurers association, the goblin slayer is crazy enough to kill goblins regardless of the lives of the victimized elves. I chose to protect the victims. So, the battle in the cave was also a game against the goblin slayer. The gods both hated and liked the goblin slayer as a special piece. In order to retain the goblin slayer as a special piece, they violated the usual practice of the gods not directly participating in worldly affairs and saved the goblin slayer. But this was exactly the result that the dice and the witch god wanted to see. The goblin slayer was thus planted with the seed of suspicion and gradually realized the truth about the goblins and their connection to the gods, gradually developing the idea of completely eradicating the root of the goblins. The wild goblins all come from the moon and were placed there by the gods for their amusement. So, the trajectory of this special piece's fate was changed by them. The goblin slayer gradually embarked on the path of resisting the gods, deviating from the fate of futilely killing goblins for a lifetime. 
As for breaking the usual practice, there will be a second time after the first. The sudden attack on Zack by the mother of the moon, the goddess, was also the same. My humanity is important. Zack lay on the soft dry grass, chewing on the words of the dice. The dice actually didn't need to tell himself this fact, because it was equivalent to actively giving himself a handle. With the indispensable handle of humanity, his operating space would expand in the future, and he might not be suddenly eliminated no matter how much trouble he caused. So the question returns to the dice. Why did it specifically inform itself? If it was just deceiving itself, in fact, humanity is not important, it's just because the dice wanted to have fun with him. This is indeed possible given the unpredictable nature of the dice. But it has an important reason for not doing so. Keeping Zack's humanity as an unstable factor is no different from keeping a tiger as a pet. Even if the dice likes to have fun, it wouldn't be foolish. A certain high-ranking demon is a cautionary tale. I remember the dice saying that it is also a part of the fallen light god. Although after the fall of the light god, the split which god, dice, and Zack all have their own thoughts and personalities. If the creation of the god is successful, and the various parts of the fallen light god are reunited, will there be multiple different personalities coexisting in a complete deity by then? Probably not. Zack finally understood why the dice had specifically informed others of the crucial fact that humanity is indispensable. It was to make him realize that he could actually use this to counter the dominance of the divine within himself. Zack couldn't help but think of a fable, the snipe and the clam are in a fight, and the fisherman benefits. He chose not to expose the dice and instead rolled over on the grass. Dice, I have lost control of my body. Even if you tell me that humanity is important, I can't see its significance. It seems that I no longer have any presence from now on, dice, he hinted to the dice, indicating that he needed to know how to counter. Zack's humanity can indeed understand my hint, the dice said, standing up on its edge and spinning in the air, aligning one side with Zack. Four points. Through. Indeed, there was no need to drive Zack's humanity crazy in order to control him. First, the dice couldn't attack the divine dominant Zack, as that would deviate from the plan and completely shift the course of fate. If they chose internal strife, their common external enemy, the current leader of the gods, the group of gods, would probably be delighted. Keeping a clever and reliable teammate in reserve to participate in balancing, as a hidden move for critical moments in the future, would indeed be more in line with their own interests. Alright, the dice's neutral voice came out, having a presence is actually not difficult. Even though Puna's port was already engulfed in war, the factories were still running, and the slaves were not allowed to rest. On one hand, the Puna's port government quickly dispatched troops to eliminate the attacking skeleton legion and the rebellious slaves at the city gates, on the other hand, they had discovered that the failure of the slave marks seemed to be contagious, so they also cut off the passage between the rioting slaves outside the city and inside Puna's port. We must ensure that the slaves inside the port, especially in the factories, do not cause any trouble. The slave uprising absolutely cannot spread to the city, emphasized the city government officials to their subordinates. Nothing can be stopped, especially not the factories. The medium causing the failure of the slave marks has not yet been determined. The senses of the slaves, who toiled tirelessly without any reward or rest, had become numb, and they had no reaction to the flying gunfire outside. They had to meet their quotas for the day, otherwise they wouldn't even have food to eat and would suffer beatings. It wasn't until Yar threw down the red flag. It happened to fall near a slave laboring mechanically. The emaciated, haggard-faced slave subconsciously glanced at the red flag, and the vacant expression on his face instantly twisted. Why have I been deprived of my personal freedom and the right to be born as a human? Why can't I decide my own life and death? Why have I silently endured for so long? Why? Why am I destined to be a slave since birth? A series of questions completely shattered the slave mark in his heart, and the spiritual brainwashing of a lifetime as a slave to atone, and in the next life, become a human failed. Instead, a strong sense of resentment, anger, and even hatred surged forth like a fountain. He remembered everything. He had a daughter once, but she was bitten to death and eaten by a noble's pack of dogs, simply because the noble felt that his daughter's emaciated, stooped body was dirtying his eyes. He had a son once, who was not yet 10 years old when the slave owner demanded his participation in the factory's work. After failing to meet the adult production targets for several days and going hungry, he had to steal the cat food prepared by the slave owner for his pet cat. When caught, the slave owner chopped him up and made him into cat food for the pet cat. The slave stood still, his eyes turning red. He gritted his teeth, breathing heavily and convulsively crying out of extreme anger and sorrow. His fists gradually clenched. His jagged, dirty nails deeply embedded in his flesh. Not far away, the overseer quickly noticed that someone had stopped working. Hey, you pig. You're finished. He raised the whip aggressively and was about to swing it. Bang. 
A heavy iron hammer struck the overseer's back. Ah! The overseer let out a painful scream and immediately knelt on the ground, not even realizing what had happened. He turned his head and saw all the slaves in his line of sight had stopped working. They had heard the overseer's earlier cry and now saw the red flag lying on the table. They were all staring at the overseer. Are you planning to rebel? The overseer shouted. Do you want to rebel? Do you think you, a bunch of idiots, are irreplaceable? There are plenty of people who can do your job. Bang! Another hammer struck him. The thin and weak slaves swarmed him, raining down punches and tools on him. They're crazy. They're all crazy. Stop. Spare me. The overseer, who had always been arrogant and tyrannical, gradually turned into a sobbing beggar, and his voice gradually faded away. He was beaten to death, and the fists did not stop until then. Yar, is the red flag so magical that it can directly control the unity of the slaves and even make them follow one after another? Not exactly, brother. The red flag can only break the slave imprint and brainwashing effect of the descendants with the help of the divine, and it has no other effect. Yar explained to herself, smiling as she directed, well, not entirely without other effects. It has some psychological inducement, but that's all. So, the reason these slaves have become so crazy. Exactly. It's not so much because of us, but mainly due to the nobility and the church, due to this corrupt and festering era. Yar closed her eyes slightly, tiptoed, and raised her baton, elegantly spinning on the chimney top amidst the flying gunfire. Even if they gave the slaves a little dignity, things wouldn't have escalated to this extent. Since they chose to crush and exploit the slaves, they should be prepared for the backlash one day. For thousands of years, these arrogant beasts have completely forgotten that the slave imprint and mental brainwashing are just a cover-up. Even if not now, they will eventually face the accumulated anger of the vast slaves. The funeral bell symbolizing the end of the old era tolls for them. The industrial area of Puna's port. The emaciated slaves, having killed the overseer, spontaneously gathered around the red flag made by Yar. Their bodies were thin, but their eyes were bright. A trembling slave raised the flag and roared, We have no way out. What should we do? Even the wavering slaves knew they were at a dead end. Whether they surrendered or not, the nobles and the government, who had always oppressed and exploited the slaves, would not spare them. Continuing to work will only lead to torture and death, resisting them will also lead to death. Since we're all going to die, we might as well fight them. They drink our blood, so before we die, we'll skin them alive. We want true freedom. The slaves quickly reached a consensus. They began making red flags symbolizing resistance, using the tools at hand as weapons. The slave who first discovered the red flag howled, they took away my family, and I will make them taste the pain of losing their own. In response, the slaves let out a deafening roar, kill. Shovels, hammers, crowbars, and various red flags were raised into the air, waving freely. Fight for freedom. Their heartfelt, soulful anger spread along the iron pipes of the factory, echoing throughout the entire inner city. It was already the late night. The ultra-high magic arrived late, and the iconic huge magic array lit up one after another, barely resisting the rain-like bombardment of the giant warship. The splendid explosions in the air, along with the flames rising in the city, illuminated the port of Punis as bright as day. The deputy commander of the navy, who temporarily controlled the army, had not yet caught his breath when he received a new piece of bad news, the slaves in the factory have gone on a major strike and launched an armed rebellion. Due to the ghost fleet and the attacks from outside the city, the defense forces inside the city were weakened and unable to suppress it immediately. The deputy commander of the navy angrily grabbed his stubble, that's why these idiots took advantage of the situation. The communications officer hesitated for a moment and said, Commander, those slaves claim they only want freedom, not to overthrow the government. I think. The deputy commander roared, to hell with their freedom. Slaves can only ever be slaves. Do these pigs and dogs dare to make demands of us? Immediately inform the church to clean up the rebellious slaves. No, clean up all the slaves in the port of Punis. The communications officer urgently advised, Sir, without the slaves, all the factories in the port of Punis will. Didn't you hear what I just said? The deputy commander suppressed his temper, accompanied by heavy breathing, his body rising and falling, even without the rebellious slaves, they cannot be left. It is urgent to eradicate them completely. Otherwise, even if we suppress this rebellion, these idiots will come back sooner or later. Fight for freedom. It's hard to imagine that a skinny, underdeveloped person's body could burst out with such great energy. The red flag spread along the huge pipeline, reaching every corner of the factory, flourishing under the scorching steam and on the cold gears. During this time, the overseers, slave owners, and others who didn't have time to escape were overwhelmed by the tidal wave of angry slaves. Being beaten to death on the spot was their best outcome. 
Those who had committed more evil deeds, even death was not enough to vent the anger, had their limbs cut off, were tortured by being dragged on the ground with a rope, or were hung on lampposts like scarecrows. Everything they had done to the slaves was now being repaid twofold by the slaves. Ironically, the more cruel the slave owners, who were notorious for their cruelty, the more they were seen as kind and devout followers of the light god in the hearts of ordinary people. Many civilians and a few nobles who had not mistreated the slaves were spared by the slaves. Unlike the loose group of slaves outside the city, most of the slaves in the factory knew each other, and therefore communicated in a timely manner, determining who their true enemies were, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Brothers and sisters, don't trouble those who are not involved. The enemy is the slave owners, government, and church who have been oppressing us for generations. On the side of the street, in a pile of civilians gathered in fear at the sight of blood and violence, a bold little girl curiously asked, Aren't you afraid of death? The ragged slaves looked at each other, then laughed heartily, No. People will die eventually, and I am willing to die for freedom. I want to become a true person before I die. One slave even threw a hard candy to her, but before the little girl could pick it up, her fearful parents kicked it away. Be good, don't get involved with them. The little girl obediently shrank back. A moment later, she found that the slaves had no intention of harming her and were all rushing towards the transition area of the port of Punis, which made her even bolder. Taking advantage of her parents' inattention, she asked loudly, Where are you going? This time, the slaves answered loudly and clearly with their frail bodies, We are heading for true freedom. Absolutely cannot let the rebellious slaves rush to the noble and administrative districts. Under the strict orders, the armed guards used the transition area of the port of Punis as a boundary, forcibly requisitioning many middle-class houses to create several blockades and temporary defenses. On the elevated bridge with multiple sets of railway tracks, before the barrier devices were fully erected, the defending soldiers saw a series of steam-spewing locomotives, blowing angry whistles, speeding towards the defensive line. They hurriedly retreated from the tracks and fired at the charging locomotives, but bullets alone could not cause effective damage. The raging locomotives forcefully destroyed the incomplete barrier devices. This is impossible. Where are the cannons? There were so many cannons. What about high-yield explosives? A soldier pointed to a gradually dissipating mushroom cloud in the distance and exclaimed, The ammunition and weapons depots in this area were destroyed by the ghost fleet long ago. The military officer of the defending soldiers cursed loudly, This is damn impossible. Are you telling me that we can't even come up with a single bomb now? Is it really that coincidental? I also find it unbelievable, but it's true that we don't have anything usable, sir. Some of the undamaged explosives mysteriously became unusable due to dampness and other reasons, and there hasn't been any wet weather recently. As they watched the locomotive that had already broken through the barrier line and the countless red flags erected on the industrial area pipelines, the officer fell into contemplation. The superposition magic defense array is now activated, so we don't need to worry about the ghost fleet's artillery for the time being. Immediately request from the church and deploy the armored trains. The whistling wind blew down the decaying grass. The wind, too, will eventually collide with a thick brick wall and come to a stop. We may be the wind, or we may be the grass. Will there be someone to knock down that wall again? The conductor on top of the chimney stopped conducting once again, and her sweet voice was singing an ancient ballad. She was surrounded by several silver-ranked adventurers in an attacking stance. As Elle's hair had grown longer and completely turned white, her appearance became even more pale and poignant, as if she had completely transformed from the inside out. Not a single one of the silver-ranked adventurers associated her with the devout follower of the light god, L. Who are you? Are you related to the ghost fleet or the slave uprising? The leading silver-ranked adventurer did not sense the magic power emanating from her. Either this person had a strong ability to shield against magic perception and identification skills, or this person was just an empty shell with no substance. L, who was singing, did not pay attention to the surrounding adventurers. She lowered her head and took out a walnut-sized die from her chest, spinning it in her palm. The side facing up showed six dots. It seems that the Lord God is not willing to let me die yet. L's bloodless face forced out a faint smile. Even though I don't have many years left to live. Commanding the fleet of the god's creations, even as a devotee of the god, she had to expend her lifespan as a cost, not to mention the effort she would put in afterwards. But she didn't seem to mind. The movements of the silver-ranked adventurers around her froze. The flying shells hung still in the air. Why do you bother with this? The die in her hand let out a sigh. These rebellious slaves are destined to die. No matter how hard you try, you can't change that. In its view, Elle had spent a lot of unnecessary lifespan specifically commanding the giant ships to bombard the command system, headquarters, ammunition depot, city defense cannons, 
and even chasing after the defending soldiers carrying bombs, clearing many paths for the initial successful uprising of the slaves. This was actually meaningless, as the elite army of Puni's port would not be defeated by this level of attack. This action only slightly prolonged the lives of the slaves. You're right, but they are all my compatriots. Al smiled faintly. I can't give them true freedom, but at least I want them to be real people in their final moments. I don't want them to be oppressed slaves until the end, and die in oppression. So you want to be a foolish good person? No, I never wanted to be a good person, it's just that I don't care about gains and losses like you do. Just consider this a momentary madness, Dice. The Dice's voice was amused, it's rare to see a sober person calling themselves mad, that's the best joke I've heard. In this sick world, isn't being sober a kind of madness? Yar's slender fingers caressed the patterns on the Dice's surface, do you think you will knock down the wall in the song? At this moment, she was like a child. When the dice didn't respond, she asked again, will the wall collapse at the end? Poor guy. The dice couldn't be bothered with her and crumbled into powder on its own. The pocket watch on the silver level adventurer's wrist began to spin. Yer spread her arms, leaned back, and fell towards the chimney. Attack! The silver level adventurers decisively unleashed a variety of high level magic that engulfed Yar in an instant. For a moment, the upper half of the chimney was blasted to pieces. After everything dispersed, they found no trace of Yar's body. She was saved by a long-distance instant teleportation magic array, even I can't track her. That guy shielded her. A silver-level adventurer proficient in teleportation magic sensed the residual aura in the air and said resentfully, this is at least the strength of a gold-level adventurer. But the ghost fleet has indeed begun to retreat. An upper-level race member pointed to the sea. On the sea, the dark giant fleet's hulls gradually began to fade until they slowly dissipated into the smoke. Why didn't anyone notice this mess earlier? She was always in the most conspicuous position in the entire Pernus port. In any case, the biggest threat to Pernus port has been eliminated. Everyone present is a hero. Let the church handle the investigation. Loner, you almost arrived late. Weak Yar was carried by Loner with pink curly hair and teleported to a designated secret room. Loner stared at her and said, after a few years, I thought you had really matured, but it turns out you just grew a layer of false hard shell. Your heart still likes to think of unrealistic things. Yar didn't answer, allowing her to manipulate her exhausted body, watching her shake her head and shake out the pile of white insects. You go and take a bath for me too. Yar immediately shouted, don't disrespect Lord Brother. Despite her words, the white insects obediently rolled into the bathtub. By the way, shouldn't the game of sibling role-playing end now? Loner said impatiently, I can understand that at first, to cover up your immaturity, you created a perfect elder brother who could help you out everywhere. But now, still playing this, do you not think it's foolish for me to keep accompanying you in this act? Brother is not fake. He really exists. Yar protested as she was rubbed with soapy water. Enough. Loner shouted irritably, you know very well that your brother died thousands of years ago. For a moment, the two fell into a brief silence. I'm sorry, I misspoke, Loner said briefly, instinctively placing her head near Yar's hand. She expected Yar to retaliate as usual. But this time, she didn't receive Yar's retaliation. Loner looked up and saw a barely noticeable tear rolling down Yar's calm face. She was at a loss for words for a moment. Yar sighed, no need to apologize, Loner. You're right. I just stubbornly created a perfect dead person with insects that I needed to talk to, understand me, and help me through difficulties. He's just a spiritual symbol that I need. So many years have passed, and I actually, I completely can't remember my brother's face anymore and the hometown that can never be returned to. I remember, I originally just wanted to go home, so I prayed to the gods, that's all. But I, I can't remember anything about my brother in the hometown. Loner silently watched as Yar, who had shed all pretenses, began to quietly sob like a little girl, completely different from her usual self. Rest well during this time, and try to restore your appearance. After all, your long suffering is almost over. After briefly treating Yar, she teleported away again. She couldn't be out of touch for too long, she had to find Zack in time. In the secret room, Yar was soaking in the bathtub, softly singing a folk song from an unknown era, the wind that whistles by, blowing down the withered grass. The wind will eventually hit a solid brick wall and stop. We may be the wind, or we may be the grass. Will the person who knocks down that wall appear again? Oh, bird seeking freedom, devour the incurable pests. The bird will eventually collide with a sturdy cage and fall. We may be the pests, or we may be the bird. Will the person who breaks free from that cage appear again? The song echoed in the secret room, gradually fading away, and Yar once again picked up a conductor's baton. But her hand paused in the air for a moment, and then she slowly put down the baton. 
She just murmured softly, Will I be able to see the moment when the wall collapses? Can the caged bird finally find redemption called freedom? The elf sack was carefully searching in the outer city area. He ignored the woman rolling in the fire, stepped over the man wailing from his broken leg, and walked past countless charred corpses of civilians. Compared to these, he was more concerned about other situations. The fleet's bombardment has just stopped. Interesting, Yar held out longer than I expected. Suddenly, his eyebrows twitched. Zack stopped and stood on the ruins, feeling the breeze. He discerned something in the pungent smell of smoke and the burnt odor. Very good, Hip has been here. Hey, come help. Zack turned his head expressionlessly and saw several police officers in the distance struggling to rescue civilians pinned under several nailed-down pieces of wood. The civilian was groaning continuously. A police officer shouted to him, Yes, you, come and help. Without much hesitation, Zack decisively stepped forward and effortlessly lifted the pile of wood, moving it aside. The civilian with the injured leg straightened up and said with difficulty, Thank you, thank you for saving me, respected elf sir. This strength, truly worthy of the elven race. The police officer politely saluted, although I'm sorry, you will have to come with us next. The police station and the church are searching for people, to arrest the accomplices of the slaves, please understand. Zack said coldly, sorry, I have urgent matters. Ah, then please show your emergency pass. The order just issued prohibits citizens from freely moving on the streets in the outer city area without permission, and all outsiders must obey the government's unified deployment and management. The police officer's words were very polite, if you don't have a pass, we'll have to trouble you to wait. While he was still speaking, his head suddenly flew into the air, accompanied by a horrifying fountain of blood. At the same time, the bodies of several other police officers also exploded, spilling their contents all over the ground. Because Zack's speed was extremely fast, they didn't even have time to be surprised. The civilian, who had been tending to his injured leg, stopped groaning when he saw this scene. His face turned pale, and he stammered, Yes sir, please don't kill me, you, you saved me before, didn't you? I won't tell anyone. The civilian clung to a glimmer of hope. Perhaps Zack had only taken action against the police and government because of a grudge. Moreover, he had saved himself once. If he was going to kill himself, why did he help him in the first place? He spat out several mouthfuls of blood, and his body convulsed wildly on the ground. Zack crushed his heart from a distance. I only lent a hand to avoid arousing suspicion from the police, Zack said as he looked at the dying civilian. Don't think I came to save you. Walking away without a care at that moment would have been the dumbest move, a few police officers would have immediately seen him as an enemy and called for backup. If Zack had rescued the civilian and the police had let him go, then they would have naturally left each other alone. When the police tried to forcibly take him to the church for questioning, they became his obstacle. Zack turned and left, the flames covering the bodies of the police and the civilian, consuming all traces. At that moment, the dice in his pocket spoke, I don't think it's necessary to be so ruthless, Zack. You can try to use your special abilities to alter their memories. This can also help you become more proficient in mastering the bodies of the higher race that contain divinity and some divine authority. Zack calmly responded in a low voice, I am not a bodhisattva. A few small fish and shrimp dying is just that. I only seek to regain what I have lost. I am not the one to knock down brick walls, nor am I the savior you expect. The dice interjected, you are being a bit extreme. Extreme? Zack sneered, the essence of this alien world has always been a game. You don't really feel sympathy for NPCs, do you, dice? The inner city of Puna's port, the industrial area on the sea. Mars swayed, and above the raging fire were countless tattered red flags. With the uprising of the slave workers, the red flags finally spread to every corner of the steel forest. Most of the arrogant ruling class, who usually oppressed the slaves, had been tortured to death by the slaves in retaliation. The once invincible ruling class faced the overwhelming tide of the slaves like a paper tiger, and soon they were completely crushed. With the final stubborn resistance of the nobles and their guards being eliminated, the slave movement in the industrial area achieved its initial victory. Realizing that with more and more people, there would be problems without management and communication, the knowledgeable slaves began to call out, we need to establish our own government. A new government without oppression, persecution, nobles, or the church. Don't rush, first organize everyone, and then we can unite all our strength. A slave with legal knowledge shouted, we also need a set of laws. The first article, all people are born free. They initially followed the old factory shift schedules, temporarily forming small teams, and then established larger teams, selecting outstanding individuals as leaders. They envisioned that all gains would be distributed according to need or labor, and in the future, everyone would be guaranteed food and clothing, and each person would have their own house. 
All children would have the right to education, and those who made outstanding contributions in any field would no longer be limited by their background. They enthusiastically envisioned an ideal new society, and everyone had a joyful expression. Many years later, a sociologist deeply involved in the slave movement was very interested in the various novel ideas and plans of the slaves. Considering the actual situation, after the threat of the ghost fleet is removed, the government and the church will immediately shift their focus to suppressing the slave movement, and that is indeed what happened, he told his students. Do those rebellious slaves not understand that they will ultimately fail? I don't think they know, a student replied. Otherwise, it would be pointless, as they will lose in the end anyway. That's not true. According to research, most people actually understand that their rebellion is just a flash in the pan. This is a very interesting psychological pattern. Once they realized that death was not far away and accepted this fact, many people's attitudes became more resigned. Everyone is painting their own dreams, and everyone knows that all the ideas cannot be realized. At this point, they no longer need to consider whether these seemingly wonderful ideas and plans are practical, whether they should be implemented, or whether they are truly beneficial to social progress. Everything stems from their heartfelt simple wishes. The rebellious slaves, at the end of their lives, together constructed a beautiful and illusory utopia. However, do not underestimate this utopia. It is a signal that the old society, which has been stable for thousands of years, is beginning to collapse. It is a beacon in the hearts of countless people who strive for ideals. It is the beginning of cultural enlightenment, freedom and equality, and even new ideological movements. But under the direct rule of the gods who have absolute power, all of this was almost impossible. They are the biggest obstacles to social change. Another student excitedly raised his hand, Professor, I know why. It's that. The sky cleared at this moment. The warm sunlight filtered through the thin curtains, casting a blurry light on everyone. As a result, the words of the students and the teacher gradually became unclear. It's already at maximum horsepower, it can't go any faster. Beside the boiler in the locomotive, a slave worker was frantically shoveling coal into the boiler. Several locomotives were full of slave workers, breaking through several obstacles and speeding towards the noble district or administrative district on the mountaintop. Powerful enemies such as silver-tier adventurers and superior races are mostly concentrated in this area. Obviously, they cannot resist with their strength. These people's actions are no different from sending themselves to their deaths. Many of the slaves present were trembling slightly, but not a single one of them requested to retreat or showed their fear in their words. Obviously, there is something more important than life in the hearts of the slaves. As the steam locomotive sped forward, the slaves gradually saw the dense forest in the noble district, and the army waiting at the edge of the forest. The high platform in the distance was crowded with people. The vast majority of them were not nobles, but civilians who had temporarily escaped from the industrial or transitional districts to the noble district after verifying their identities. They were not allowed to enter the noble district, so they were confined to the huge high platform in front of the district, forced to watch several locomotives rushing towards the noble district's train station. The high platform, crowded with tens of thousands of people, was silent, and there were several such high platforms. Many civilians understood that they would witness the fate of these crazy slaves with their own eyes. Looking at the official silver-tier adventurers standing everywhere but not launching an attack, the hearts of the slaves became increasingly uneasy. Some of the slaves seemed to remember something, this seems like a prepared stage, and the civilians are the audience under the stage. What do the enemies want to do to us? Look, isn't that person the bishop of the church? A man in a magnificent bishop's attire stood at the top of a temporary, prominent arch bridge, extremely conspicuous in the crowd. With his hands behind his back, he spoke loudly, Citizens of the Port of Punas, have you seen the locomotives coming towards us? Each locomotive is filled with a group of slaves, a group of people who already bear heavy sins. Tonight, they have committed countless atrocities, have slaughtered many kind and upright nobles, numerous devout followers of the light god, and countless innocent citizens, and now they are attempting to extend their claws towards us, to kill every single person. May the gods be merciful, thousands of years ago they did not choose to completely eliminate them, but gave them the opportunity to live and atone for their sins. But these devils? Not only are they ungrateful, they repay kindness with enmity, killing the benefactors who are willing to accept their atonement. Even the benevolent gods have lost patience. This group of slaves is obviously beyond redemption. This time, the great Lord of Light will guide us and send these devils straight to the deepest depths of hell, annihilating their souls along with them. The bishop's voice grew more and more excited, raising his arms high. Come, send all the enemies to hell. Boom. As the words fell, a deafening roar shook the earth as a high-speed steam locomotive was overturned and exploded in mid-air, scattering the dismembered bodies of slaves and a large amount of blood into the air. 
The other locomotive slaves widened their eyes. In the dense forest, an armored train covered in thick iron and steel plates roared and slowly moved out. On top of one of the carriages, a smoking giant cannon was particularly conspicuous. And there was not just one giant cannon on the train's roof. The pitch black gun barrels began to aim at the remaining locomotives. Everyone, get off the train. The driver immediately pulled the handbrake, and another person forcefully opened the door. Boom! Another locomotive was destroyed by the giant cannon, and the deafening sound reached the ears of all the onlookers. The civilians near the explosion felt like their eardrums were about to burst and subconsciously let out short screams. Ah! The bishop, with an excited expression, shouted loudly, Look, this is the power of the war behemoth guided by the gods. It represents the will of God to execute all sinners. The locomotive was rapidly decelerating to allow the slaves to safely jump off. As soon as they got off, they were met with intense gunfire from the military, with no nearby cover to hide behind. The slaves suffered heavy casualties, and their bodies piled up on the ground. When the third locomotive exploded, the slaves still on board became frantic, getting off the train won't work, staying on the train won't work either. Get ready with your weapons. Let's take down that bishop first. Most people's weapons were tools from the factory and swords snatched from the nobles, with only a very few holding firearms. They broke the windows to create firing holes and shot at the defending army and the bishop on the arch bridge. But all the bullets were blocked by the preset defensive formations. The army's bullets and the giant cannons of the armored train could attack them without any hindrance. We're going to die whether we get off the train or not, so let's speed up and charge through. Speed up. Don't stop even if the boiler overloads. The remaining locomotives began to sprint desperately, the rumbling growing louder and louder showing no intention of stopping even when called out one by one. A silver-ranked adventurer approached the bishop from behind and whispered, My lord bishop, please allow us to use magic to end this farce once and for all. No need, the bishop's face was filled with complete confidence, everything has been calculated just right. When the slaves finally reached the noble district and were about to rush towards the armored train, only one locomotive remained. The bishop first signaled the army to stop shooting, then stood tall and shouted to the silent crowd, Look, let the enemy witness the full force of the steel behemoth's charge. The armored train suddenly began to accelerate. The engineers pulled the levers, controlling the switches, allowing the armored train to change tracks several times, and then directly rammed into the inevitable locomotive. Bang! The locomotive was directly derailed, rolling to one side and violently colliding with the ground. The armored train, on the other hand, barely budged, sliding forward for a considerable distance before coming to a stop. The civilians silently watched the deformed flaming locomotive, seemingly waiting for something. Absolutely perfect. The bishop began to applaud, the soldiers following suit, and the onlookers, as if awakening from a dream, sparsely joined in the applause. The armed soldiers quickly surrounded the fallen locomotive, aiming their guns at it, also seemingly waiting for something. In a moment, the door on the locomotive was forcibly pried open. A slave, bloodied and battered, slowly and laboriously crawled out, reaching out a hand towards the door. The second, the third. Finally, a total of 13 slaves who could still move, helped each other to stand up with difficulty, fearlessly staring at the dark gun muzzles around them. One person tightly held a tattered red flag in his hand. You will be executed on the spot. The bishop walked down the arch bridge, the wrinkles on his face forming a gentle expression, looking particularly charitable. Does anyone among you want to repent for your sins? The merciful Lord has decided to give you another chance. If you repent sincerely, you can become a slave in your next life and spend your life atoning for your sins. Then, you will be able to enter heaven and enjoy the grace of the gods with us. The leading slave thought for a moment and said, There is indeed something to say. Let's say it together. Okay, the bishop nodded gently, I will pray for the Lord's forgiveness for you. All the slaves supported each other. Each of them had multiple fractures and minor injuries, but they still stood tall and firm. They gazed at the silent civilians and soldiers waiting, shouting loudly, brothers and sisters. Tonight, we charge here without fear of pain or sacrifice, only for a common belief. We hope that no one will be a slave, that there will be no more oppression, and that there will be no more distinction between nobles and commoners in society. Everyone should be free and equal. Most of your family's annual expenses are not even as much as a noble's pair of pants. He doesn't have to make the slightest effort for it, while you have to work hard for a whole year. Where does their squandered money come from? It's all exploited from your hard work. Shut up. Shoot immediately. The bishop reacted and cursed loudly, his hypocritical and gentle expression disappearing from his face. There should never have been slaves, nor should there have been any distinction between nobles and commoners. Let us unite and oppose the exploitation and oppression of the government and the church together. Bullets pierced the thin clothing of the slaves. 
They roared and rushed towards the red flag, falling one by one. Even in death, they held onto the flagpole tightly, planting the tattered red flag on the ground. For freedom. The soldiers did not stop shooting until no one could make a sound. The angry bishop snatched a military knife and rushed forward to cut down the red flag. You all saw it. He roared ferociously, this is the fate of the devil who defies the will of the gods and resists the government and the church. The onlookers remained silent. Many people's eyes were fixed on the red flag until the bishop personally set it on fire, along with the bodies of the slaves, turning them into ashes. The remaining sparks drifted into the deep darkness. Following the faint trace left by the elf Miss Hippie, Zack avoided the sight of patrolling police and official adventurers and stopped in front of a ruined wall. He closed his eyes slightly, still alive, good. Judging from the remaining explosion traces, it was an internal explosion of the house, not the firepower of the fleet of destruction. Since the goblin's main body broke through as an upper race, his auditory perception range expanded again. He heard the girl's difficult breathing and a faint plea, great ancestor of the Thorn family, please save us. Zack reached out his hand, without chanting, a colorful black magic array unfolded in his palm, silently covering the area where he and the ruins were located. The shielding magic belonging to shadow magic was indeed useful, although it was related to the mother of the moon. His hand in the air did not retract, but instead bent his fingers, searching in the void. After a while, Zack's hand suddenly clenched, and wood, rubble, and bricks rose up like balloons, floating in the air. Several people who were lying in a mess, with blurred flesh and blood, gradually exposed themselves. Most of the people have lost vital signs, including Hype's blue-haired lowly slave, the civilian schoolgirl and her parents. The only one alive is the blonde Miss Hype. Her upper body was pinned under the blue-haired lowly, almost losing consciousness, only repeating mechanical cries for help. It can be seen that she has been continuously seeking help from the outside world. It seems that before the explosion, this slave sacrificed herself to protect her master. Zack crouched down, pushed aside the tattered lowly corpse, and carefully carried Hype out. He could sense that not only was she seriously injured, but her internal organs were also shaken. If she were not an excellent noble elf, she might have died by now. He began to recite softly, just as he did when he healed Rita, Great Light God, you are the original God, the leader of all gods, the meaning of existence, the guide for all things, I pray to you here, begging for a glimmer of revival, please bestow upon your devout followers a touch of rekindled light. Watching the gentle glow of the sacred magic envelop hype, Zack said with some emotion, I vaguely remember that this spell was designed by me back then. He he, am I praying to the enemy, or am I praying to myself? After being blessed by the higher race, the healing magic visibly accelerated. The wounds on Hype's body quickly healed, and her breathing gradually became steady. After a moment, she slowly opened her eyes, and the serene face of Zack came into view. Whom? She stared at his face in a daze, gradually recalling, Zack, Zack, how come it's you? Hype suddenly noticed that she was almost lying in Zack's arms, and a crimson color quickly rose to her face. Zack politely said, Miss Cinda, I heard your cries for help, so I saved you on the way cries for help. Hype's eyes once again fell into a daze, then she fully reacted, save them, Zack, please save the others. Unfortunately, when I arrived, they were already dead. What did you say? At the right moment, Zack let go of his arms, allowing Hype to regain her balance and stand unimpeded. She surveyed everything around the ruins, and her eyes widened instantly, no, it's not possible. This isn't true. None of this is true. Hype shook her head in a daze, knelt down, and despite the pain of the rubble, she carefully brought the blue-haired Loli's body to Zack. Zack, please, Anna might still be saved. Even the church, which is most proficient in healing magic, cannot bring the dead back to life. Zack said calmly, the moment a person dies, their consciousness is liberated from the prison called the body and merges with this world. Please, save Anna, save them, I'll do anything. Her eyes were empty and lifeless, apparently no longer able to listen to Zack's explanation. Zack reached out his right hand and gently touched Hype's dusty head. Something entered her mind along his arm, then into her heart, gently enveloping her fragile and about to shatter inner self. I feel the heavy grief you have for losing your loved ones. Go ahead and cry it out. Let your emotions completely vent. The light in Hype's eyes gradually returned. She threw herself on the blue-haired Loli's body and cried like a child, Anna, I'm sorry. I've caused you trouble. I'm sorry. I've caused your death. I'm sorry. Zack quietly waited for Hype to vent for a while, until her emotions gradually stabilized, and then asked calmly, Miss Cinda, can you please tell me what happened? I know this may cause you pain again, but it can help me find the murderer. Okay, okay. She took out a blood-stained handkerchief and wiped away the remaining tears from the corner of her eyes, recalling intermittently, I, I promised a civilian classmate, um, the poor child lying over there, to go to her family in the outer city and save her parents. 
We encountered many situations along the way, but we still managed to reach the civilian classmates home safely. I planned to take a short rest and then take them out of the dangerous outer city, but then the window was suddenly broken by someone, and, um, I remember something like a sandbag being thrown in. It was already smoking when it was thrown in. Before I could finish reciting the spell, I heard a loud noise. Anna protected me in the end, she. I watched helplessly as her life rapidly slipped away, until it was beyond saving. Hype covered her face with her hands, sobbing, I shouldn't have brought Anna, and I shouldn't have allowed that child to leave the academy. I shouldn't have tried to be a hero in the first place. Comp was right, useless people like me shouldn't try to save others, or else we'll just die in the gunfire. In the end, I not only failed to save anyone, but also lost my dear Anna. I should really die. I'm the last person who should have survived. Zack sighed, Miss Cinda, your original intention was not wrong. Shortly after you left, the academy was also shelled. Many people have died. Hype remained motionless, Zack, you don't need to comfort me like this. It's not a comfort. Comp, who said you would die in the gunfire, has already died in the gunfire. Zack spread his hands, sometimes, you really can't predict whether tomorrow or an accident will come first. Until the end, it's impossible to know if your choices were wrong. Zack had already roughly guessed, causing chaos with the fleet's shelling and inexplicably throwing bombs into the enclosed space where Hype was, was probably not a coincidence. This was similar to his silencing of Comp during the shelling of the academy. Hype was an indispensable clue in his destiny trajectory. Unfortunately, Zack had previously rolled a 6 on the dice, preventing the enemy from killing Hype. On the contrary, the death of the blue-haired slave meant that the important obstacle to establishing a deep connection with Hype was gone. With a little tenderness, this young lady, who already longed for friendship, would irreversibly rely on him and become a truly useful pawn. Unable to target me, the chosen one, so they started targeting the people around me. Zack thought coldly, if I could kill Fur, that would be fine, but she's not someone to be trifled with, the orc Red Soros is related to the Soros family, and the Soros family won't allow this pawn to die easily the only one left is, the elf Rita. Zack paused briefly. Rita? Just like Hype, both were tools of the elf race to achieve a certain goal in the future. He suddenly squatted down, showing a hint of pain, and covered his head. As if to refute what his inner thoughts were thinking, his head suddenly felt like it was about to explode, filled with intense pain. Damn, I inadvertently touched the reverse scale of humanity. I almost forgot, that mediocre lowly elf's birth mother is very special when it comes to human nature. I've never felt such a strong rejection from my body before. Zack gasped heavily, trembling uncontrollably all over. It was as if an angry voice was booming in his mind, if he used Rita as a necessary sacrifice, suppressed human nature would willingly burn with him, completely destroying everything he had painstakingly built. If everything was used as an excuse for necessary sacrifice, then no one should expect to live. Zack, are you okay? He opened his eyes again and saw Hype's worried emerald eyes. It's okay, I had a minor injury before, and the aftereffects just happened to flare up. Zack gradually calmed his breathing. Didn't I tell you before that your original intention was not wrong? Thank you for your comfort. If you don't want to experience similar pain again, then strive to become stronger. Weakness is the source of misfortune. Zack looked at Hippie's lowered head and spoke as gently as possible. You may have questions about why I came to save you and why I'm willing to talk to you about these things. I see my own shadow in you. Zack's hand reached for Hippie's forehead. After realizing that she did not resist, he gently brushed aside the golden hair on Hippie's face and met her anxious, evasive eyes. I was once very weak. At a moment of life-threatening crisis, the person who should have been protected by me, the most important person in my life, stepped forward and stood in front of me with open arms. She had almost no magical talent, almost no different from an ordinary person, and was completely unable to face powerful opponents. Yet she still stepped forward, simply because I am her son. I almost lost her. The regret of watching helplessly, about to lose the beloved person, is still engraved deep in my heart. Zack appropriately distanced himself, giving Hippie a space to be alone. I can feel that she holds the same importance in your heart. Sorry, would you like to tell me her story? Yes. Although she was born a slave, Anna was the only one willing to understand me. It was always her who helped me through difficulties, encouraged me. Hippie's tears once again welled up and fell on the body of the blue-haired girl, now devoid of warmth. It's all because I was not strong enough and burdened her. I remember she always hoped you could stand on your own, right? Yes, she did. I'm sorry, I couldn't let her see that day. Then live up to her expectations and pull yourself together. Zack said gently, if you can become strong, she would surely be very happy to see it. Hippie said in confusion, but I really am a complete waste of space. 
It's okay, I'm willing to continue teaching you and help you become stronger. Zack knew that Hippie had not yet truly emerged from the grief of losing her friend and couldn't consider too much for the time being. It's okay, Miss Hippie, let's talk about these things later. We can't stay here for too long, we need to hurry back to the academy. Can I take your friend Anna with me? She deserves a unique funeral. Hippie wiped away her tears and reluctantly said, Okay, thank you, Zack, classmate. Zack. At the same time, the armies of the church and the government were advancing like a broken bamboo, killing their way into the industrial district. The church. The church is here. The hiding civilians saw hope and rushed out, including the parents of the little girl who had previously kicked away the slave, Sela, and the candy. But what awaited them was not the protection they had imagined, but the flames and bullets of the guns. They have been contaminated by the evil slaves. They are all potential devils. Purify them all. Whistling bullets pierced through the bodies of the civilians. Their faces, filled with disbelief and fear, were shattered by the bullets. The parents of the little girl protected her under their bodies, but it was in vain. The soldiers of the church rudely pulled apart the bodies of the parents and brutally stabbed the shining bayonet into the little girl's body. The little girl's head tilted to one side and stubbornly looked in the direction where the candy had been kicked away earlier. In the last moments of her life, she saw the hard candy wrapped in colored paper, crushed under the soldier's boot with a crack. She finally closed her eyes. The church had no intention of sparing a single slave, including the civilians who did not participate in the uprising, and slaughtered them all. The slaves vowed to resist to the death. However, due to the absolute gap in strength between the two sides, even if they set up ambushes or hide, even if they are familiar with the complex terrain of the industrial zone, even if excellent leaders choose to avoid the enemy's edge and flexibly use their own advantages, silver-ranked adventurers will still root out those people, either burning them to charcoal or freezing them into ice chips. In the face of the dual oppression of magic and technology, any tactics seem like a joke. The uprising slaves were ultimately completely defeated. In the dark industrial zone, the remaining slaves braved the hail of bullets, striving to avoid the magic attacks of the mages, and launched the final charge towards the only bright exit, which was also the military's position. Everyone was striving to shield others with their bodies, trying to ensure as many people as possible would survive. The long night was about to pass. Dawn was approaching. At this moment, official silver-ranked adventurers and the superior races rushed into the crowd, unleashing superior magic, in order to add a mark to their record. I have already eliminated 3,561 people. How about you? You're a bit slow. I have 170 more than you. The people who faced death bravely continued to charge forward, their bodies piling up, filling the industrial zone's thoroughfares. As the sky began to lighten, only a few scattered individuals held up red flags, giving their all to run towards the light, about to break out of the industrial zone and touch that brightness, for freedom. Their withered arms reached out towards the light, which was so close yet so far away. They were running towards the light, and towards true freedom. The soldiers' bayonets stabbed into the people's bodies or throats one by one, mercilessly knocking them to the ground, hopeless sinners, go to hell and repent. Even the last person, though pinned to the ground, struggled immensely to reach out with their arm, until the light touched their fingertips. Warm, they murmured, seemingly unaware of the intense pain behind them. The slave workers in the industrial zone had basically lived their whole lives under the haze of the dense steel forest. Many of them never left the industrial zone, even in death, never getting to see the vast sky outside, the sunlight unobstructed. Freedom. Perhaps this is the feeling of it. An incredibly warm feeling. Another bayonet pierced through their heart. They finally exhausted their strength, their head drooping weakly. They died. No one mourned for them in the port of Pernus. Yar had already put on her nun's habit and gently placed the baton down. She silently clasped her hands to her chest, still devoutly praying. The lament of destruction has finally ended. Oh, Divine One, in this final movement of the trilogy, it is no longer under my command. It will be brief but brilliant. Pernis Port Cathedral. After a night of busyness, the bishop who led the army to suppress the slave uprising returned to the cathedral and discussed the aftermath with the official silver-ranked adventurers. Have you found out what magic or magical item caused the failure of the slave marks? Your Excellency, not yet. The divination results seem to have been interfered with and the answers obtained from multiple divinations are not similar. As for the items, we also studied the red flags that the slaves held high. After testing, these red flags have no special properties. The bishop took out a handkerchief and wiped the sweat from his wrinkled forehead, and what about the whereabouts of the white-haired woman directly connected to the ghost fleet? Completely no results. Unable to trace any clues. We even attempted a small-scale fuzzy prophecy array, but got nothing except for the explosion caused by magical backlash. 
It seems to be related to the Chosen One, or perhaps enemies at the level of Dark Gods interfering with the divination, such as the Dark God. The bishop absent-mindedly stroked his chin, what's even more strange is why the enemy would simultaneously launch a rebellion of slaves that is bound to fail. I can't think of the connection between this and the ghost fleet's attack. The destruction and casualties caused by the phantom fleet far exceed those of the slave rebellion, and the two are hardly comparable. Your grace, the enemy may not be the same group of people, and the probability of pure coincidence cannot be ruled out. The silver-ranked adventurer analyzed, in any case, the instability of the slave marks has been confirmed. I suggest that your grace report in detail to His Holiness the Pope about the events of last night. The Lord of Light should also have new decrees. Looking through the window at the sky about to welcome the dawn, the bishop's hand suddenly stiffened as he stroked his chin. He asked urgently, how many people have died in the port of Punas, including the number of slave deaths? The silver-ranked adventurer recalled, it's incalculable, but it's probably reached six figures, mainly due to a large number of rebellious slaves being annihilated in the industrial area. Is it possible that the enemy is using blood sacrifice-related magic? Impossible. The entire port of Punas is shrouded in the prohibition laws set by the city lord, so blood sacrifice magic should not be able to proceed smoothly, unless it's outside the city, but obviously most of the deaths tonight occurred within the city. If the strength or status of the related enemy exceeds that of the city lord, can they ignore the prohibition laws he has set? The silver-ranked adventurer was slightly stunned, the gods above cannot intervene, and currently only a few people are known to have reached the level of demigods. It can't be the demon king, can it? The bishop sighed, I also received a message shortly after returning to the church, the demon king personally led the elite of the demon race to launch a major attack on the border. His holiness the pope dispatched a team of heroes and several gold-ranked adventurers to confront them and prevent the demon king from causing too much destruction. But just now, urgent secret information shows that the hero team did not encounter the demon king, only beheading several demon god generals. All signs indicate that the demon king is not among the invading demon army. It cannot be ruled out that it is a diversionary tactic by the Demon King. The silver-ranked adventurer was stunned, Your Grace, are you suggesting? Too many people have died in the port of Punas, and the deaths of a large number of living beings will directly become the energy source for the blood sacrifice magic of the Demon King level. The bishop turned his head and shouted loudly, Gentlemen, please inform the city government and the headquarters immediately to seek help from His Holiness the Pope. Zack, with hype, stopped in his tracks, feeling the dice in his pocket slightly heating up once again. The dice leaned towards neutrality, and a voice without emotional color echoed in his ear. The location where the city lord is hiding has been identified. The super-level blood sacrifice summoning array is ready. The demon king is about to descend. Zack looked towards the still dim blue sky and smiled. The timing is just right, the sun has not yet risen, and the moon has already set. Everything is going as expected. The church and the government have not hesitated to be merciful to the rebellious slaves, and have even slaughtered many civilians. The dice said indifferently. If it were our people or the followers of the dark gods carrying out the slaughter, not only would it not be so smooth, but it would also easily be associated with blood sacrifice magic by the enemy. Zack looked in the direction of the industrial area, and even though it was so far away, he could smell a stronger scent of blood. The church and the government of Punas have become their own gravediggers. There is another very crucial point, the dice added, Punas has been peaceful for nearly a hundred years, and the prohibition laws such as the ban on blood sacrifice set by the city lord are still in effect, so the upper echelons of Punas have very reasonably not paid attention to the relevant aspects when slaughtering slaves. Even if someone finds out now, it's too late. They have already slaughtered enough slaves and civilians. Zack turned to look at Hype, who was motionless behind him, dice, deactivate the accelerated thinking mode. You're sat on the edge of the bed, facing a mirror, slowly restoring her appearance to its original state through the use of insects. White insects crawled all over her body, wriggling their tails. A neutral voice sounded behind her, the final movement of slaying the demigod has begun. Yar trimmed her excess long hair, gazing at her pale, lifeless face without responding. The six-sided die lying on the bed continued, the deaths of tens of thousands have met the activation conditions for the superposition blood sacrifice summoning array. Aren't you going to continue commanding? Die, you take over for me. All right, then you rest well. The die suddenly rolled, swiftly climbed onto Yar's back, knocking off seven or eight insects, and finally burrowed into her ear, embedding itself in her mind. Yar's body suddenly froze, tossing the scissors aside and picking up the conductor's baton from the table. Her entire demeanor changed, her pallid face shrouded in a faint mist, becoming blurred. Immediately, the white insects around all shouted in unison, Die, the boss. Keep quiet for me. Yar, or rather the die, walked to an open space, raising the baton high. 
Undying Dark God, you are the protector of darkness, the eternal twilight, the master of destruction. Here, I offer you the feast of flesh and soul. The flesh and blood grinder has completed its operation, satisfying all the sacrifice conditions. I beseech your summoning, commander of evil creatures, the fallen dark lord, the reign of the demon king. Here stood straight, the baton striking down vertically with a whoosh, leaving a pitch black, ink like vertical trail lingering in the air. She turned the baton horizontally, making a lateral slash. Two black trails formed an inverted cross. The inverted cross engraved in the air slightly trembled, and thick, red, viscous blood continuously overflowed from its edges, dripping down. As the blood touched the ground, it quickly spread out and straightened, gradually forming a crimson initial magic array centered around Yar's body, expanding and overlapping with the continuous influx of blood. Blood overflowed from the inverted cross, until the magic array, layer upon layer, covered the entire secret chamber. The reign of the demon king, Yar, or rather the Dai, shouted loudly once again. The layers of crimson magic array unfolded in succession, ignoring the solid walls, crazily rushing and occupying the entire Pernis port. The wasteland. Cracks appeared in the thick clouds. The light of dusk shone through the gaps, casting a golden waterfall, bathing the vast grassland in a dazzling halo. Eternal twilight. Zack gazed at the winding and twisting crack between the thick clouds, watching the drizzling light column. So, the reason I quickly initiated the slave uprising after surpassing the superior race was to activate the superposition blood sacrifice magic and summon the demon king to slay the city lord? The basketball-sized die trembled restlessly, yes. The city lord of Pernisport must be eliminated, otherwise he will be the biggest obstacle on your path to godhood. Zack calmly said, that's why you all excluded me from the beginning. Because it's unlikely that you would willingly lead a large number of slaves to their deaths without knowing the truth satisfying the conditions for the blood sacrifice activation. So we chose the safer approach. In this dilemma, either choose to save the slaves, but then your goblin king form leading the goblins in retreat would be too conspicuous and unable to satisfy the conditions for the blood sacrifice activation, or sacrifice the slaves. There's no perfect solution. Choose one, and the rest will no longer exist. To ensure that the path to godhood does not deviate, this sacrifice is necessary. Zack understood the die's underlying meaning. Such sacrifices of others would surely continue to occur in the future. In order to become a god and reclaim their rightful position, they would willingly sacrifice everything, even becoming a bloodstained executioner. He couldn't help but smile bitterly and said, I can clearly feel that the divine me is also the real me, not someone else. As for the difference between him and the present me, it is that he is almost purely rational, without any excess emotions. All signs indicate that he is not a reincarnator inexplicably bound to the chariot of revenge, but the true mastermind behind the path to godhood. The dice told him that he only lacked the memory of being a god. Zack subconsciously recalled the words of the Goblin King, only fallen gods are good gods. As the former god of light, it seems that he also did not consider the people of this world as real people, but as ants to be used and sacrificed, even the descendants of the original god of light. Combined with his performance as the divine me, Zack didn't say anything and continued to ask, what about the ghost fleet that destroyed the eastern continent? The dice did not choose to conceal it, as a divine creation, that was one of the contingencies left by the Yu. The Gu God was only temporarily lent to Yar for two reasons, to timely divert the firepower of the church and the army, ensuring the initial success of the large-scale slave uprising, and to ensure a sufficient number of blood sacrifices through bombardment. The dice's tone carried a hint of amusement at the situation, of course, considering the church's relentless slaughter of slaves and civilians, there is no need to worry about the second point. In the confrontation between the gods, only the lives identified as pawns or chosen by the gods have value, and the greatest significance of other lives may be to satisfy the numerical conditions of similar super-blood sacrifice formations. Human life is like grass and weeds. So, that fleet belongs to me. Yes. When you further enhance the concentration of the source of light, it will be completely at your disposal. Zack casually picked up a blade of grass, snapped the stem, and put it in his mouth, as I become stronger, more contingencies will gradually emerge. Is that right? I cannot tell you in advance. The dice turned over, if you know the predetermined trajectory of fate and how the future will unfold, it will cause irreversible and significant damage. Then there is only one result. A definite result. Zack clearly saw that the pattern facing him gradually melted, re-aggregated, and formed a number. But that number was not the crimson dot he had expected. Zack's eyes felt dry and gritty, but he completely forgot to blink. He saw a number on the dice that should not have existed. Zero. Pure black in color, with no impurities or colors in the circle. But in just an instant, that number quickly changed and turned into six, as if nothing had happened. 
A cool breeze brushed Zack's neck, making him wonder if he had seen it wrong. In that moment, the entire wasteland not only lost the concept of time, but also almost all of its color. It was as if he had lost all his strength in disguise, and was left alone and helpless in the terrifying unknown black universe, with only eternal and endless despair. This is. Zack subconsciously spoke, then fell silent again. For a while, there was a long silence between him and the dice, until the dice spoke again in a cold tone, this is a warning. Zack didn't say anything more, chewing on the grass roots as he lay on the ground, gazing at the dim light between heaven and earth. I know that your humanity retains kindness and gentleness, but you must find your own position. The tone of the dice softened appropriately, you have also shown tenderness to this world, but this world has chosen to betray you. It is not worthy of your kindness. Love specific people, not abstract people. Zack said lightly, Dice, I won't say much about the other me, but there is one thing that is my bottom line. I absolutely cannot consider my mother Rita as a necessary sacrifice. The same goes for Hongdo, Fuur, and others. I know you might think that sacrificing so many slaves, it's meaningless to dwell on this. But I won't accept that outcome, even if I eventually succeed in returning to the god's throne. The dice suddenly showed a three. You're just being self-righteous, Zack, it said with a hint of displeasure. It's meaningless to dwell on these if you want to become a god. Gods don't care about ants. Then you can choose to only work with the divine me and exclude me. Zack's eyes became sharp, dice, if Rita is sacrificed, I will stop at nothing against you. You're insane. Insane? If I gradually abandon morality, discard humanity, and lower my limits, then even if I eventually become a god, I won't be myself anymore. He stared at the dice, I'm afraid this is also part of your plan, isn't it? Through repeated necessary sacrifices, make me increasingly numb to similar things, compromise time and time again, helplessly accept the truth, and finally completely fall into becoming a puppet that you can control at will. I'm sure I won't be indifferent to Rita's sacrifice, and you obviously understand that. If I choose to compromise, that will become my true killer move. Then, I will indeed no longer be human or god, but a true puppet controlled by fate. 